I just finished this portrait and uh, it is of uh, one of the Norwegian Jews that was sent to Auschwitz the 26th of November 1942. Uh, they sent uh, 532 Jews to, to Poland to Auschwitz and of uh, these only 34 survived. He is one of them. Uh, he has used his life to tell the story and I have the honor of actually made a big portrait of him. Uh, in 2010 I painted a big portrait of, uh, of uh, uh, Gunnar Sønsterby. He was one of the resistance fighters during the Second World War and I thought it was a good idea to also paint one of the victims especially since he has used his uh, life to tell the story and, and is an, a good example how you can use your life to something constructive in the light of very bad experiences. Uh, so I asked my agent to contact him and he came to my studio and we had a nice chat and we took some art photos and from these I painted this painting. Uh, and it's gonna be unveiled on the 26th of November uh, on Wednesday actually this Wednesday 2014 uh, and I'm kind of looking forward to it because it's quite nice I also feel it's it is quite important because of all the anti-semitism we see popping up uh, from everywhere from the right and from the left and from the militant Islamist and and it never seemed to end. So for me it's also an important issue since I'm both a humanist and anti-nationalist and also an atheist and an anti-theist. But I mean, as I say, if there's... Uh, and also an anti-nationalist. So if there's any... You should use the term... Uh, I think the term race is just nonsense because there are no races on the planet, there's only one race. But uh, if one people should need a state, there's actually the Jewish Jewish people. I mean, I've been trying, trying to be... Uh, everybody has tried to kill them for 2,000 years, so... I guess they need a state, and that is basically why I support support Israel too and I've I have uh, studied the history of the Israel Israel uh, Palestinian conflict since 1948 and when you study this it's obvious who killed the peace it's it's the Arabs and the Palestinians especially Hamas not the Palestinians in general but the Hamas the jihadists and I guess there will never be any peace down there until the jihadists are uh, this way finished off. We have to get rid of the jihadists. Only then there can be peace in the Middle East. Well, that's my opinion. And um, I'm not going to sign this painting. So since I, uh, I'm going to sign it, uh, probably down there. I'm going to play a segment of uh, my hero, Sam Harris, where he talks about uh, the Palestine, Palestine and, and Israel conflict. I also made a huge video, that is probably almost seven hour long, where the first segment is a discussion of, about anti-Semitism between my hero, Christopher Hitchens, and his friend um, uh, Martin Amos talking about uh, anti-Semitism. Then it's uh, I am using the series Aus Aus Auschwitz um, uh, BBC series Aus Auschwitz as a background sound for the rest of the painting process. So I guess this video is going to be in the beginning. And after that, you can see the whole process when I have painted this. Uh, it's really hard talking to no one, but <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, 
I am quite proud. I think it became quite nice. And it kind of gives my painting some meaning to be able to paint people who matter. Yeah. Okay, of course, everybody matters, but who has experienced stuff like this? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades, friends, shalom. Um, we don't have a chair. And I'm, I'm not going to appoint myself as such, but someone has to start. And it's going to be Martin. Uh, Professor Amos will give you a, an, opening, an opening burst about uh, Solbello, on which I'll endeavor to comment and elaborate. And then there might be a bit of cross talk between us, and then it'll be, as it were, your turn. And I'll be in charge of that bit too. And while you're thinking about it, I say now, all boring questions will be disallowed, <laughs> as will all speeches. So while you're getting ready, I've done audiences like you before, believe me. Um, bear that in mind if you would. Um, Professor. Good evening. I hope you can all hear me. Um, it's meant to be about Saul, but we're going to, as Christopher was saying beforehand, he fans out, you know, like a, like a galaxy. And we'll come back to him. Uh, I went to Israel with him, in fact, for a Saul Bellow conference, and um, he, I went with him to the first session, and he said after 10 minutes, I have to listen to any more of this, and that there were things like, you know, the, the encaged cash register, existentialism in early Saul Bellow. <laughs> he said, if I have to listen to another word of this, I, I, I think I'm going to die, he said. So we, we're going to talk about Israel, too, via his book, To Jerusalem and Back, and of course, his lifelong concern and anxiety about, his, about Israel. Um, the phrase anti-Semitism was coined in the 1870s by a German journalist called Wilhelm Ma, whose noble intention it was to get people to stop hating Jews for religious reasons and start hating them for cultural and <laughs> racial reasons. Uh, Saul used to say that I said to him, Norman Cohn in his book War for Genocide about the Protocols of the Elders of Zion said that anti-Semitism was a neurosis and Saul said no it's a psychosis and I hope we'll, we'll talk about that because it's very rife at present I feel here in England. Um, you know a certain kind of bien pensant here is you know, never more gorgeously at his ease, never more exquisitely complacent than when attacking Israel and trying to delegitimize Israel. Um, so I hope we'll talk more about what, what anti-Semitism is. But um, I'm going to cheer you up by talking about philo-Semitism. And the words Semite and Semitism remains problematic, but philo, we all know what that means. Love off. Um, I am a philo semite, and I will give you a little how-to course on what you have to do to create an anti-semite, a uh, philo semite. <laughs> it's, it's no problem creating anti-semites. Um, first, you have him born into a, a boho kind of family, rough and ready family, where. The father, in fact, is mildly anti-Semitic. Um, I remember when I was about 13, one of our, we had many close family friends who were Jewish, uh, Theo Richmond was among them. We were playing Scrabble, my father and me and Theo. And my father didn't actually put down the tiles, but he, he suggested the word yid. 
Um, and at 13, I didn't fully understand what that meant, but I knew I didn't like it. And uh, later on, I had the privilege of being able to say to him, Dad, what's it like being mildly anti-Semitic? <laughs> and he said, well, it's very mild, as you say. <laughs> You know, he said, yeah, you're watching some uh, innovatory new TV program, and then when the credits come up, you find yourself going, ah, there's another one. <laughs> there's another one. Um, although you would have been horrified by, and uh, actively horrified by any actual stuff. That was actually pro-Israel. Um, on the other hand, my mother was a woman of uh, universal equanimity, so much so that when at the age of nine, as a resident of Princeton, New Jersey, I asked a black American friend, Marty, at school, I said, do you want to come back to my house for tea? And he said, I prefer coffee. And I said, yeah, well, it's, it's actually not tea, it's, it's a sort of meal. <laughs> and he said, um, <laughs> with cakes. And, and he said, he said nah, he said, your mother wouldn't like me because I'm black. And I said, with full conviction, my, my mother won't even notice that you're black. <laughs> uh, so that kind of background helps. Then, um, this is perhaps a bit more testing. You've got to supply them with, at the age of 17, with a beautiful Jewish girlfriend. Um, and preferably in the year 1967, <laughs> during the June War, where she is rushing off to give blood for the, for the Jews. Uh, her mother was secretary to Lord Seif. Her grandmother was so, it was very great, very sweet, and I wish I'd talk more to her. So observant that in her pantry, even the instant coffee was kosher. Gold blend instant coffee. Um, so you give her the first love with a beautiful Jewish girl. Then, <coughs> Then, uh, later on, um, he had his oldest and closest friend, Christopher, discover, movingly in the year, I think, 1989, that he was, in fact, Jewish. Um, and that's, I thought, that's why I loved him. It wasn't, it wasn't for his qualities, it was because he was a Jew. Um, I can't make this completely chronological, but um, by that time I was not only completely in love with the novels of Saul Bellow, but um, beginning to be a good friend of his too. The man who emancipated the Jews um, the, in, into the American artistic mainstream. I think that's one of his incidental achievements. And to show perhaps a, a, a deeper kind of interest and sympathy you write your novels, what your novels come from, you finally decide, is from things you, you're worrying about and don't know you're worrying about. Uh, silent anxiety. And I was moved over the years to write a novel about the Holocaust, and more recently a novel about the antis, the, the Holocaust that never happened, which was um, the Stalinist Holocaust, that was all set to go in 1953. The Jewish doctors were going to be hanged on Red Square, and then the Jews, two and a half million of them, I think, were to be to run the gauntlet to um, be a Robbie Jan on the Chinese border, where, according to Solzhenitsyn, barracks were already being built for them. And it didn't happen uh, because Stalin died. It would have happened. Um, then finally, you've got to provide me with a, um, a Jewish wife my wife Isabel Fonseca, and two uh, Jewish daughters, who, they're only quarter Jewish, but by Jewish law, 100%, and they are Jews who will themselves be the mothers of Jews. Um, we have many names for them in our house, um, they're seven and ten, they're called the flowers, the fools, the poems, the rats, um, but I often subvocalize them as the Jews. Um, <laughs> where are the Jews? Shouldn't the Jews be home by now? <laughs> where are those Jews? 
where are these Jews? There's lousy Jews. Um, <laughs> and I, it's of great importance to me, and I can't really explain it, but it makes me feel closer to history in a way that I very much value. Um, now, I'm going to read, before we widen out again, I'm going to read a bit of uh, the, the ending of a Saul Bellow short story called The Old System. And this is it's not about Israel, this is about assimilated Jews in America. And <clears throat> in this story, Dr. Brown is, throughout this longish story, he's very anxious to see his, his sister who's dying in hospital, Tina. Um, and she says, they've had a frudder for many years, and she says she will see him on her deathbed if he gives her $30,000 because she feels she was stiffed on an earlier uh, property deal. But then he goes, he goes, he, he's finally allowed in, and she's, all the documents are there, and he's supposed to give her the money, and, and she sweeps it all away. And the, the ring, her mother's ring, which has been much debate about, is produced. The ring she had taken from Aunt Rose was tied to Tina's wasted finger. She's dying, Tina. With then. Uh, was tied to Tina's wasted finger with dental floss. She held out her hand to the nurse. The nurse cut the thread. Tina said to Isaac, not the money, I don't want it. You take Mama's ring. And Dr. Brown, bitterly moved, tried to grasp what emotions were. What good were they? What were they for? And no one wanted them now. Perhaps the cold eye was better on life, on death. But again, the cold of the eye would be proportional to the degree of heat within. But once humankind had grasped its own idea that it was human, and human through such passions, it began to exploit, to play, to disturb for the sake of exciting disturbance, to make an uproar, a crude circus of feelings. So the Browns wept for Tina's death. Isaac held his mother's ring in his hand. Dr. Brown, too, had tears in his eyes. Oh, these Jews, these Jews their feelings, their hearts. Dr. Brown often wanted nothing more than to stop all this, for what came of it. One after another, you gave over your dying. One by one they went, you went. Childhood, family, friendship, love, love was stifled in the grave, and these tears. When you wept them from the heart, you felt you justified something, understood something. But what did you understand? Again, nothing. It was only an intimation of understanding, a promise that mankind might, eventually through its gift, which might, might again be a divine gift, comprehend why it lived, why life, why death. And again, why these particular forms, these Isaacs and these Tinas? When Dr. Brown closed his eyes, he saw red on black, something like molecular processes, the only true heraldry of being. As later, in the close blank darkness, when the short day ended, he went to the dark kitchen window to have a look at the stars. These things cast outward by a great begetting spasm billions of years ago. Now, it's, it's, I, my views on Israel, my feelings, impressions about Israel are um, just those, feelings and impressions. And for political analysis, we will depend on the hitch. But uh, it does seem to me that, has there ever been a state in history that is so dependent on emotion? Uh, Twelve years after the War of Independence, Yigael Yadin asked when the victory had, where the victory had come from. He said it had come from Israel's youth. It appears as if that youth had absorbed into itself the full measure of Israel's yearning during the thousands of years of exile to return to its soil and to live in liberty and independence. And like a giant spring which had been compressed and held down for a long time to the utmost measure of its compressibility, when suddenly released, it liberated. Um, and just a couple of short lines from, from Saul's book about Jerusalem, which I think sometimes criticized for not noticing the existence of any non-Jewish Israelis, but um, I, I think a, a book that um, now seems very prescient and full of very eloquent anxiety. 
Um, I sometimes think there are two Israels. The real one is territorially insignificant. In fact, one-sixth of one percent of Arab lands. The other, the mental Israel, is immense. A country inestimably important, playing a major role in the world as broad as all history, and perhaps as deep as sleep. <clears throat> what you do know is that there is one fact of Jewish life unchanged by the creation of a Jewish state. You cannot take your right to live for granted. Others can, you cannot. This is not to say that everyone else is living pleasantly and well under a decent regime. No, it means only that the Jews, because they are Jews, have never been able to take the right to live as a natural right. To be sure, many Israelis refuse to admit that this historic uneasiness has not been eliminated. They seem to think of themselves as a fixed power, immovable. Their point has been made. They are a nation among nations and will always remain so. You must tear your mind away from this conviction as you must tear it from civilized appearances in order to reach reality. The search for relief from the uneasiness is what is real in Israel. Nationalism has no comparable reality. To say, as George Steiner says, that Zionism was created by Jewish nationalists who drew their inspiration from Bismarck and followed a Prussian model can't be right. The Jews did not become nationalistic because they drew strength from their worship of anything resembling Germanic Blut und Eisen, but because they alone, amongst the peoples of the earth, had not established a natural right to exist unquestioned in the lands of their birth. This right is still clearly not granted them, not even in the liberal West. At the same time, Jews are called upon, and called upon themselves, to be more just and more moral than others. Um, wind up and pa pass this on to Christopher. Uh, Bernard-Henri Levy wrote a piece in the um, New York Times magazine this last summer saying that when, when these um, twirling spastic rockets from uh, Hamas and Hezbollah land in Israel, of course they're the focus of intense anxiety but that anxiety is also forward-looking in that in 10, 20 years, <laughs> they will be far more sophisticated rockets with different kinds of warheads. Um, and don't you feel sometimes that the crisis that the world is in at the moment is a crisis of mere weaponry or pure weaponry, the weaponization of all grievance? And how long can Israel, born in war and nurtured by siege, as Abba Eban put it. How long can it live this life of, of intense anxiety? And this has been a summer full of portents. And, um, and it was in the, the, the pensive setting of, of Las Vegas in the summer that Christopher and I admitted to a new order of anxiety about the future of Israel. Well, um, I suppose I also should uh, feel I, I owe you a statement of um, my own position on one or two things. I, uh, I'm commented from the exact opposite end, I think, from the one that Martin began with. Uh, for most of my life, I <coughs> thought that the only principle worth upholding, worth defending, worth advocating, witnessing for, was that of socialist internationalism. To which, of course, the Jewish people have been perhaps the major contributors, that anything else was even noble or sectarian. Uh, that uh, Zionism was potentially a, a bourgeois nationalist trap uh, for the ancient Jewish people. That Judaism was to be objected to not just in itself as a religion, but on the even more strong grounds offered by Voltaire. That Judaism has the a terrible tendency to lead to Christianity. <laughs> and if you can't dislike it for that, you don't know what it is to feel uh, hatred and suspicion. Uh, but never able to uh, uh, escape from the fact that when, when, when I was unwilling to say anything under this heading for myself, except that, as I early discovered, some of my worst enemies were Jews, 
uh, that anyone who defamed or threatened the Jewish people was uh, defaming and threatening my mother, and my grandmother, uh, my wife, and my daughter. I therefore felt it wasn't really necessary to speak about this in my, in my own behalf. I still regard Israel not as the answer to the diaspora, or as an alternative to the diaspora, but as a large part of the Jewish diaspora. I was asked a very intelligent question by a lady from the Jewish Chronicle earlier this week, but whether I would feel unease at being Jewish if I came back to England. And I said, well, where she correctly reported that many Jews do feel currently a great enemy. I said, I'm at ease at being Jewish if I came back to England. And I said, well, where she correctly reported that many Jews do feel currently a great enemy. I said, I, I don't ever expect or actually want to feel at ease. I don't think it's in the fate or nature of the Jewish people to feel at ease or at home. I think that we are doomed to exile and doomed to diaspora. I don't want us to become, as it were, complacent. There's a wonderful expression in Victor Klemperer's Diaries of the Third Reich, which I hope everyone here has read or will read or is reading, where he says in conversation with the comrade as the net tightens around them, we are a seismic people. We can always see what's coming. We always know in advance where the, what the tremors are going to be. We register the tremors. It will never change. It will always be insecure and unstable. I think that's right. I don't want it to be different. Don't want a quiet life. Also, don't expect one. What drew me to the Jewish tradition that I liked when I was a Marxist, I still am a Marxist, but I'm no longer a socialist, was, uh, some of you Talmudists will get this, I think, uh, was not just the fantastic contribution of, to modernity of Marx and Freud and Einstein and Kafka and Billy Wilder, um, uh, but the uh, innate tendency to fratricide uh, and disputation and dialectic that was uh, we found um, among it, <coughs> among us, as it were, and the and the feeling always that wherever you were, you would always be in exile. Okay, fine by me. I don't I don't repudiate this. In fact, I welcome it. Uh, I could go on about this a lot. I will. I actually have succeeded. I can't often do this with Martin. In surprising him a few nights ago, I can't even surprise him that's to say on any literary matter. I said that Theodore Herzl was the only person who'd ever written a utopian novel that, as it were, come true. You know about Alp Neuland, very bad novel in many ways, but the only novel ever about a future society that could be said to be the blueprint of an actually existing state. The idea that Israel is and the Jewish project is a written one, is a work in progress subject to revision. The literary project, of course, magnetizes me, fascinates me. Um, believe me, I could go on a lot about this, but I, should, I feel I should say why I think Saul Bellow is a great help in decoding some of it. Um, I think it's, it's principally a literary question. When, when Henry James started to try and define the idea of an English literature written by Americans or in America, in the American scene, the thing that most horrified him he returned to the New York that he thought belonged to him, was the prevalence of Yiddishkeit, as he called it, the, the murder of the English language in the torture rooms uh, of the Jewish coffee houses and clubs and bars. He couldn't believe that the pure well of English had been so defiled by these, these the, the aliens of Israel, as he called them. And for a very long time, this was, this was a regnant feeling, feeling, it was a regnant policy, in the American Academy, I'm sure many of you know, Lionel Schilling was, was at one point refused tenure at Columbia University on the grounds that as a Marxist, a Freudian, and a Jew, and they might as well just have come right out with it, he wouldn't be able to understand the specially sensitive register of English literature. He couldn't, let alone teach it to others. And nobody thought that, that was an embarrassing reason for not giving him the job. So, it's to me incredibly important. I don't think in Bellow's mind it was a conscious revenge. But it can't have been other than latent in his mind that with the publication, especially of Augie March, that the, those whose parents and grandparents spoke Yiddish and came to America as despised immigrants, often illegal, as in the case of the Bellow family, as you know, perhaps, Saul didn't realize he wasn't an American until he went to join the United States Army in 1941. He was told, you're not on the books. Your parents were illegal immigrants from Canada. You have to go back and become a citizen, and then you can apply to join our army. And that's part of the background of Dan Greenman. Um, never being sure of a place, that he suddenly finds that he's, he's witnessed for literature 
and it, in English, written in a supple and marvellous way, that the admirers of Henry James have no alternative but to praise and to respect. Mutatis Mutatis, this goes also, of course, for Norman Mailer, for, for Philip Roth, um, for Joseph Heller, who's often left out of this account, I think, wrongly, and, and others too. But I think it's especially significant contribution of the man, Soldo, who translated the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock into Yiddish. You try it. <laughs> um, who, with Irving Howe and other members of the Descent magazine and Partisan Review Group, discovered the wonderful treasure house of the work of Isaac Bashir, the singer, hitherto really only available to those who could buy the Jewish Daily Forward and read it in, in Yiddish, and to, and to make people aware of what an extraordinary presence there already was of this kind on American soil. I regard that really as his most signal uh, contribution. There were those who said that this wasn't really English, that this was a sort of dialect. In fact, even Martin, in an early piece, um, Bello referred to his occasional lapse into low-life patois, which, when I quote it in my book of essays, is rendered in the worst and yet best misprint that I've ever had inflicted on me by those as low-life patios. <laughs> the sort of place where American literature is considered towards sundown. <laughs> um, but there it is. Nobody, nobody doesn't talk now with some acknowledgement, not just of Kafka, and so, but as it were, of, of Woody Allen. And I guess I, I should add that's what I always liked again about the Jewish tradition. Even reading the, the to me hateful Maimonides, it's remarkable when he says in Guide to the Perplexed, well, is it necessary to believe that the Messiah will come? Yes, it is necessary to believe that the Messiah will come. And then he adds, though he may tarry. <laughs> now, you don't get that shrug in any other monotheism, I'm telling you now. And you can read Woody Allen out of Maimonides if you want to. Everyone knows what I'm talking about, I think. Go ennobled all this uh, in an extraordinary way. <coughs> but it's not politically without problem. Um, it was said of Camus La Peste, but it doesn't mention any Arabs, just as it's been said of um, Bellows Jerusalem. It seems to me that I read Mr. Sanders' Planet before I read to Jerusalem back, and I, I began to recognize and imagine some other of Bellows' writings, a sort of allegory of something very disquieting that was emerging in America in the 60s and 70s, which was a rivalry between uh, Jewish Americans and black Americans especially in New York and in Chicago, elsewhere too, but particularly there. And that the, the, the sense of threat that some Jews were beginning to feel in the school boards and districts of Ocean Hills and Brownsville in Brooklyn and in the south side of Chicago was in a sense replicated through the experience of Teddy Kollek via Ed Koch, if you're following me about this, I can elaborate if you like, in, in a kind of allegory of, um, of black Jewish rivalry which worried Bellow very much, which, of which he was, I think it can be easily said, especially sensitive registered. I thought I saw something possibly menacing um, to both parties occurring here. I thought it needed to be analysed. <coughs> it became, it's even more clarified in, um, because this tendency among Jewish Americans acquired the name of neoconservatism at a very early stage. When I think it was Norman Podhoretz pointed out with his customary grace and tact that American Jews had the, um, this is how he put it, the income pattern of Episcopalians and the voting pattern of Puerto Ricans. <laughs> I think you can tell the sort of tone of voice that's involved. Yeah. It's refined by Bello in, in his book Ravel Street, which Martin has never forgiven me for reviewing as if it was in some sense a non-fiction book, as if it was the, the debt he promised to pay to Alan Bloom of a memoir in novelistic form. But in there, as you, some of you will know, there is a figure very recognizable as Paul Wolfowitz, and there's a school very recognizable as the famous Chicago uh, School on uh, Committee on Social Thought, chaired by Nathan Tarkov, a friend of mine, old friend of Bellows, and Leo Strauss's, and Alan Bloom's, and Paul Wolfowitz's. And in there, it is, just, it is said that the greatest shame of the United States in the recent past is its failure to put an end to the vile regime of Saddam Hussein in 1991. No, no subsequent failure has been as shameful as that, as many of us believe. So that, though one must, I think, at all times, resist the politicization of literary criticism, 
the remarkable thing to me about Saul Bella was the way in which he accepted the challenge of the political critique. I think I've probably said enough on that heading now. <coughs> Excuse me, Mark. Does that, does that remind you, said? Yeah, uh, um, he said once, I don't think he's ever said this in print, but he saw Bella once said, privately he said, without Israel, Jewish manhood would be finished, he said. Um, I don't think he meant Jewish men, he meant Jewish self-respect. Uh, but it was a sort of atavistic way of putting it. Um, he, he was... <clears throat> he felt that this idea that the Jews... We're going to read about that the Jews cannot be put to death, as he put it, um, is institutionalized in the state. And, um, <clears throat> and he was... I think he was... He, he, he was beginning to have cerebral difficulties about the year 2000, quite a long time before he died. And uh, when September the 11th happened, he, he didn't take it in. He didn't really take it in, amazingly, because he was uh, just a month before I'd seen him for several days. Um, and he seemed, you know, drifting in and out a bit, short-term memory a bit. but. Um, totally complimented. And I met a 90-year-old lady in New York who's still coming into the office every day as we speak, uh, yet who couldn't take in that event and didn't really try to take in that event. And it's as if um, he, he, one of his unfinished books was called All Marbles Still Accounted For. But um, when the marbles are perhaps under threat, um, there's a certain size of event that you can't assimilate. And I think he knew that he sensed not only that this was an enormous event, but it was a, an enormous event that would redound somehow on Israel. And during last summer, when, when these, these unpleasant port portents for Israel were emerging, there was a great uh, effervescence of anti-Semitism here. If you remember those um, middle-class whiteies waddling around on the placard saying, we are all head scholar now. Um, well, enjoy it while you can, because Hassan Nasrallah wants to kill you. Um, he, he knew that this perhaps was going to be a defeat for Israel. And I'd like to ask Christopher about this, the rise, the rise of Islamism, which, by the way, um, we know the Muslim Brotherhood, Brotherhood got started in the 1920s in Egypt and had been brewing for a long while before. But um, it crystallized with Saeed Qutub in his um, ridiculous and ridiculously influential book, Milestones, which was conceived and written suspiciously soon after the formation of the State of Israel on his journey to America in 1949. Um, that the rise of Islamism also the, with the Iraq War and other events, the depletion of American power in the Middle East. Um, this, this perhaps is, will be the main consequence of the Iraq War. That the period of Pax Americana, of American domination in the Middle East, and again, I'm not I'm hazy about all this, but which began in 1989 or 1991, depending on when you date the death of the Soviet Union, that this period is coming to an end and the regional players are stepping forward. And perhaps even that uh, American power itself is um, nearer to eclipse or partial eclipse. Um, and this is not good news for Israel. Uh, the, the worst uh, disagreement I had in person with Silvano was about a friend of mine, Edward Said, a co-author of mine. Well, actually, that's, putting, that's rating myself too high. I co-edited a, a book with him. Um, at that point, Edward Said was a, from a Christian family and was an atheist and didn't have a racist uh, nerve in his whole 
a ganglion. Uh, but the, the, it was just a, a, a clash, as it were, between two kinds of nationalism uh, in Palestine. And I would have said at that point that though had been overreacting, uh, hadn't been understanding enough about what the Jabotinsky revisionist form of Zionism had done on the West Bank and in Gaza, wasn't willing to concede uh, enough of that, partly because of, indeed, you're quite right about the manhood question. Very, very many American Jews felt that they could look anyone in the eye after 1967, the reputation of, of Jews as being unmilitary, cowardly, the Luftmensch, uh, as Hansel used to call it, was gone. A side element of hubris there, I thought. I also thought that I had been overreacting to what had happened in Chicago during a brief period of black power in the city's politics with a particularly decorative figure in, in Mayor Harold Washington's uh, administration had publicly accused Jewish doctors of giving the AIDS virus to black babies. I said, well, now look, you know, it's, uh, he, okay, he's a nutcase, he's a sordid idiot and so forth, but you know, don't get... This is, this is not the face of black America. Don't, don't become too pod horrors like about it. Well, look, how am I supposed to talk now? Allegations like this are commonplace now. They're pumped out in, in mosques only a few hundred feet from here. They're taught to children by people who have subsidies from the British state. It's, it's actually impossible, I think, to underestimate the way in which the vilest kinds of anti-Semitism have recrudesced in an Islamist, not a nationalist form, in a religious form. Uh, the only thing I can ever think of to cheer myself up is that these fools have to borrow the, the crummiest sorts of Russian Christian Orthodox fabrication. I refuse to call the Protocols of the Elders of Zion a forgery, as they right. commonly call them. Not a forgery is an attempt to copy a true bill. There's no true bill behind the protocols. It's a flat-out fabrication. Okay, perhaps it's nice that Hamas can only think of putting that on its website. They don't have a tradition of Jew hatred quite of their own, but yes, they do, and it's in their holy book. The one that they say is the last word that God ever spoke. So it's in their actually, charter. It's in their charter. It's impossible to overstate this kind of thing. Now I, now I wish I, as Martin must for many other reasons too, I wish I could have my conversation with, with Bear back again. Wish I could refine it a bit. Uh, wish I could have uh, made my own points a little sharper and and more and more sophisticated. Because this is a this is a very very serious cultural danger. And it's only a fool who thinks that anti-Semitism is a threat to Jews. Anti-Semitism is is a very very toxic threat to everything we can decently call civilization. And. Uh, it, it, it confers upon us when we find it, even a little bit, because it's quite hard to be, mildness is good, I like, I like it, but it's quite, generally quite hard to be a little bit anti And I should just end when you, where, where you started about the psychosis. Of course, Steve Coakley was a psycho. He couldn't stay off the subject of the Jews. Most people who have this pressure can't stay off it. That's the thing. If someone says they don't like West Indians because of their... I don't know what it might be, their music. Or they don't like Indians because of the smell of their cooking. Or they don't like um, Koreans for their kimchi, or whatever it might be. Everyone, every minority and majority in the world has a version of this kind of prejudice. But as Freud pointed out, they all sink their differences when it comes to the Jews. And with the Jews, it's not their cooking, or their sex lives, or any of this. It's, and it's not just vulgar prejudice about skin color or smell or any of this. It's a, it's a theory. It's a paranoid theory that tries to explain quite a lot. It, 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 it's fascinated with gold, with secret documents, with missing codicils in ancient treaties, uh, with the idea of an invisible and secret government. It's a, it's a very, very, very dangerous pseudo-intellectual uh, prejudice indeed. And I think Burr was absolutely right to be seismic about it. And if the cost of that was sometimes exaggerating it, or maybe even conceivably once or twice seeing it when it wasn't there, I now think that's a very small price to pay uh, compared to the risks of being insensitive to it and, its, and the dangers that it poses. And I, that's why I don't apologize for taking such a long time to make this point. Um,
we might just talk a little bit more about what anti-Semitism is. Um, you and I, and it, it is, it's, it belongs with the, the sort of the shithead conspiracy theory and, um, and uh, there's a marvelous quote from Hitler saying that uh, in the Frankfurt Zeitung there was a, um, a ringing uh, exposure of the protocols of the Elders of Zion as being a, a fabrication or a forgery, as he would have said. Uh, this alone proves that it is genuine. Um, you know, uh, where do you begin? Um, it's, it's not quite a neurosis, it's not quite a psychosis. Vasily Grossman in Life and Fate suggests that it's that uh, anti-Semitism is, is like a vast mirror and it's, it's an ocean of insecurities um, that you know, the cruising insecurities in, in the common mind for some reason gravitate towards the Jew as the explanation of and reason for all frustrations um, you know, and as you said, and many other people have said, it's the the central paradox of it is that you hate the Jews and you think they're insects and um, all the usual stuff, but you also suspect they're running your life, and um, they're both you know contemptible and all powerful. But nobody thinks that uh, West Indians are trying to take over Wall Street, for example. I say nothing. I, I don't I hope no one. Think something you joke at the expense of Jamaicans and say that. It's just not alleged. People who hate them don't say they're trying to take over uh, the international financial system. I think the thing about my grandmother, whose origins were in what is now Rochevov, who was then in Breslau, uh, had a very simple explanation. She says, oh, Come on, darling, they're just jealous. Um, well, go ahead, of course, can be as jealous as they like, but it's actually it's the protean nature of it that gets me. If, if they can't get the Jews for being behind international finance capital, it'll be because they're behind international communism. It's got to be one or the other, but they're often both. Um, and uh, as the, you know, the Crusaders, long before they got anywhere near Palestine, had burned out every ghetto when they came across and laid the Jews for the Black Plague and poisoning the wells and so forth. Any, anything you like. Uh, the depressing thought about this being that there's something ineradicable, ineradicable about it. My view, as a determined atheist, is that there's something else that's often not mentioned out of politeness, which is the following. There have been, there have been several false prophets, including several Jewish false messiahs, as you know, but there, there are two very well-known false prophets um, in the shape of Jesus and Muhammad, who have a tremendous number of sympathizers around the place one way or another. The only two things, the only thing these two false prophets and demagogues have in common is this. They first introduced themselves to the local Jewish population, saying they were going to vindicate their properties. And after the Jews had a square look at both of them, they said no. Now, they took the minority's view. The Messiah still tarries. There isn't a Christian or a Muslim in the world, or in the history of the world, who wouldn't have given, in theory, everything they had for a little face time with Jesus of Nazareth, or with the Prophet Muhammad. And the only people who did meet these two imposters saw through them right away. You think this is going to be forgiven? You're wrong. <laughs> but take pride in it. The Jewish people's achievements have almost all taken place since the time of Jewish emancipation from religion. Since the dual emancipation from the ghetto imposed on them by the Semites, and since their own emancipation into secularism, the world of Einstein, Freud, Marx, Kafka, and the rest of them. The first people, the people who laid the curse of monotheism on the human race in the first place were the first ones to repudiate it, and all of their glories have taken place in that secular diaspora. Well, that's what I think. <laughs> um, and, and there's no health outside that. There's no redemption. The following prophecies, looking for holy places or holy sites, and so on. No, no, no. That's a waste of Jewishness, a complete waste of Jewishness to try that. And it will involve you uh, in committing injustices against others, and we are rightly forbidden, rightly forbidden to do that. It, it probably can't be, I'll throw it over in a minute, or you will hit you. It, 
probably can't be eradicated because um, we know the phenomenon of anti-Semitism without Jews. Uh, there are places with no Jews at all where anti-Semitism thrives. So it, it does seem to be, like several other regrettable human traits, just a part of being human and uh, a despicable part, but a part. So, well, you know, at that point, I think it's possible. Bewitched as you are, um, <laughs> that insufferable complacency of these two uh, young English golden boys, uh, <laughs> quasi-Semitic uh, plebs. Um, I can't actually see anybody properly, and I don't know if there's a roving mic or not. I'm just going to trust you. Why doesn't someone ask an amusing or intelligent question? <laughs> Is, is there a mic? Is there something that's... Ma'am? Yeah. Just before we take the first question, Mr. Hitchens, if I could just ask Peter Levy to say a few words. He should have done it at the beginning. We overlooked him. So... Well, you, wanted to, you wanted to step on my... Well, no, thank you for... Hi, um, I've got, first of all, I'd just like to say it's really, really wonderful to see you both here and feel really honoured that you're here. Thank you. This is, I mean, this isn't 100% a question about Judaism at all, but um, in your wonderful book, Experience, um, you say that the mother of your first daughter was manic depressive. And I just wonder whether, um, because that's also genetic, Partly, and I wonder whether you um, have interest in it or in in manic depression. Um, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a Woody Allen question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it's um, it's it's an absolutely tragic condition, but um, and and funny enough, one of its symptoms is anti-Semitism. Um, uh, it is. Um, Another of its symptoms is, is ordering grand piano um, and Rolls Royces. And I, I had a, a friend whose husband was mad depressive, and she went to the hospital and uh, went to the doctor and he said, What's he doing now? She said, Rolls Royces. And he said, Well, well it'll be grand pianos next. And, and she drove home and there was a grand piano being weak. She came about. Uh, I think it's a. Uh, it's. Um, yes, of course, it's, it, it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's very humiliating when you start following a, a kind of schedule of uh, ridiculous behavior, um, reinforcing the view that, that insanity is, is, it's not as if you're going to do anything, you're going to be doing these specific things. And, um, you know, Nothing seems to be more important than, than not doing what other people do, and not being part of an ideology, not being part of a crowd. Um, this seems you know, more and more urgent to me, not using the, the kind of language that everyone else is using, you no know, brainer and went pear shaped. And don't do that. You reveal your low cultural level so starkly when you use these phrases that are. That are skimming around these a already aging novelties that you know, some people, their whole vocabulary consists of seen it, done it, had a banana. Um, that's a real humiliation. Yeah. You've got to s stress the, the, the power of the individual and of course that's what mad depression like many other things completely strips you of. In one of Martin's father's novels there's a, a, a very arresting and haunting description of someone whose mind is becoming unraveled and an unfailing predictive sign of that, and I've seen it myself in many cases, is, is the feeling of anti-Jewish persecution. Or the feeling that Jews are pervasive in everywhere. It's, it's, and any, anyone who's professionally involved in this phenomenon will tell you the same. It's a, 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 another universal concern of the man impressive is electricity. They're always leaning into the light bulb to get some message beamed down from them from another world. But it's extraordinary that in this pentagram, Mick Jagger is another element in this. 
Um, you always think he's trying to be you, or you're trying to be him. Jews, electricity, Mick Jagger, um, you know, what could be more humiliating? It's like a company, I mean, the <laughs> right way. Uh, but, but the fact that the, the Jews are, are wired in even to this well-mapped and miserably predictable uh, psychosis is, I think, a, you know, almost a poet poeticism, but also, again, showing us that it is it is uh, universal and eternal, this, this terrible recourse in the human mind. Do I see another hand? In the background. There we are. Hello. You said that uh, anti-Semitism is an obsession with people who feel it. Um, but uh, it's also an obsession with, fear of it and analysis of it is also an obsession with Jews. Um, do you think that Jews should try and avoid uh, identifying themselves through these negative means? And if so, how? I'm not sure I understand the grammar of the question, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, I, I, I do you understand the meaning of it? What, what, I mean, what, what, what negative identifications are you... Are you having bear in mind? Are you uh, identifying as Jews through feeling uh, fearful of anti-Semitism? Well, that doesn't make it. That doesn't, I, I can just tell you for myself. When my mother wanted to pass, um, which is her perfect right to do, as many many Jewish people have, um, especially in England, where it's relatively easy, uh, she didn't want her uh, firstborn son to be given any bother for being the son of a Jewish woman. And in fact, she wanted me to be the English gentleman. You'd be the judge of how well that worked out. <laughs> um, and and that's, that's perfectly okay. But my, my view is, my, my conclusion from finding out what happened to her and what she wanted and, and what she got is that um, in no tone of voice, if the question was asked to me, are you Jewish, would I, would I say no? And I can't imagine what uh, would make me change my mind about that. It's not a matter of going around affirming it, or, or wearing a Star of David or anything this sort of around my neck. Just, I, I would never say no if I was asked. I don't think that's too much to ask. I think for a quite By the way, quite can you think of anyone, any other minority in the world that has this question in this mind? It's making the point that Saul Bellow was making, or Martin was going to show passing from Saul. Polish people don't have this problem. English people, by definition, don't have this problem. Uh, Slovaks don't have this problem. Jews do. Why the hell is that? But they should keep, keep a low profile and not earn any, any, any money and not make any contribution to the arts. Or the... Stay away from nuclear physics, about all. Yeah. <laughs> and psychiatry. <laughs> It's, it's actually said, and this is an extraordinary thought, that <clears throat> the great uh, efflorescence of irrationality around the early decades of the last century was a reaction to the weirdness of science. Um, you know, Hitler and Lenin and Stalin would never use the word reason without putting some insulting adjective in front of it, like cowardly or miserable or abject. Now, because uh, Jewish science had shown, had shown the essential weirdness of many things about the human condition. Einstein had shown the weirdness of space, Freud the weirdness of, of, of human psychology, and the, that caused a revolt against reason. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sorry, uh, this reminded me of something. I used to be friendly with Jacobo Timmerman, who some of you were have I hope that I maybe read his book about being the editor of La Opinion, the best paper in Buenos Aires when the fascist dictatorship took over Argentina in the uh, 70s and he was um, disappeared, as they used to say, by the Desaparecido. And when he gave it an account, it's a wonderful book if you haven't read it, Prisoner Without a Name, Cell Without a Number. He gave an account of the way in which he was tortured, not just the methods, but I mean the, 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 the questioning. And they, his 
fascist uh, George has said, you know, we know what it is to be a Jew. Uh, Say a Timmerman, you who came to be in Argentine. He said, you've ruined our entire lives. He said, your, your Einstein has ruined Christian cosmology and replaced it with chaos and speculation. We used to know, you know how the heavens worked and how we spoiled all that. Your Dr. Freud has ruined our family values and our certainties about uh, the, the decencies of uh, the organic uh, Christian family. And your Dr. Marx has made uh, Christian economics impossible. Uh, this is between blows of the cattle prod. You know, they're, getting, they're getting the point. <laughs> they're getting there. Uh, in their primitive way. It was actually quite an insightful thing for them to say. As it is for, for, for Christians and Muslims to never forgive the fact that uh, Jewish people were the first to see through their false claims of prophecy. Be proud of this. I would. I am. Comrade, bring it on. <laughs> Martin, I wondered if you could share with us the most amusing, insightful moment that you shared with... Can you give it some welly, sir? Okay. I wondered, Martin, if you could share with us the most amusing and insightful moment that you shared with Saul Bellow, please. Uh, well, there would be at the expense of the hitch. Uh. <laughs> and I, I had to say, bring it on, didn't I? <laughs> well, I, 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 I will do this briefly and, and tenderly, but um, I took Christopher to meet Saul in Vermont, Saul and his wife Jazz, um, and we had a very nice drive from Cape Cod to Vermont. Buddy movie. Buddy movie, radio on. Um, and then we got there, and I said on the way, I said, no sinister balls, okay? Which is our code for, you know, the politicizing. Yeah, of, of making everything suddenly very steely and political. And he said, I am. And um, then went into a four hour uh, uh, oh, blue oh. streak of parachute about about Israel and, uh, and it was it was I mean I, I can't understand why they didn't hit it off immediately because they're both both Jews both ex trots um, both rebels above all but it was one of those anti-matter meets matter um, and then as we were sitting over the ruins of the of the evening I'm sorry uh, and, and Hitch had been defending Edward Sine, and, and, and he said, to whom admittedly Saul called a terrorist. Um, it was by no means, um, you know, one-sided. And then, uh, but not, nonetheless, uh, uh, sight Paul over the, over the end of the dinner. And, and Christopher said, well, I'm sorry if I went on a bit, but um, Edward Said is a friend of mine, and, um, and if I hadn't defended him, I would have felt bad. And then there was a silence, and Saul said, how do you feel now? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never had a chance before to, so just settle down, have you got a drink and everything? This may take me some time. <laughs> uh, I'll make it first. You should read Martin's account of this in, in his wonderful memoir experience, which I hope is piled high outside the hall, as well as at fine bookstores everywhere. It's the, it's the most Rashomon experience of my life. As I read his account of an event, I realize it's exactly true, and exactly true as he recalls it, too. And I couldn't fault it, except for one tiny thing, which was that... Wrong cigarette? Um, when he said, look, don't oppress him with politics, I said, don't worry, I, mean, I won't do that. But I knew he was a very political man, who always had been. He used to be one of the editors of New Politics, used to be very involved in the Trotskyist movement and so on. We had a few handholds. When we arrived, you've forgotten this, well, I thought I did you credit. He said to us, um, he was reminiscing about the time he was hired by Time magazine as a book critic, as a young, young man. 
He thought, I've got a job. They're paying me to review books. He arrived at Time magazine. He was told, have you, um, on his first day at work, have you had your interview with Whitaker Chambers? He was told, have you, um, on his first day at work, have you had your interview with Whitaker Chambers yet? Then the boss of Time said, didn't know we needed a meeting with Mr. Chambers. Yes, you do. You'll take place at three o'clock this afternoon. Went into the office. Toad-like figure of Chambers sitting behind the desk. Mr. Bellow, take a seat. Tell me what was your course of study at the university. Bellow said, I studied English literature. Chambers said, very good. The queen of subjects. Give me your view, if you would, Mr. Bellow, of William Wordsworth as a poet. Bellow said, I uh, don't dissent from the prevailing view he was a romantic poet. Chambers said, there is no place for you in this organization. <laughs> you must be out of the office by close of business this afternoon. Told the story which you can read in a, a fictional version in... Um, Victim, uh, right. Mr. Rudiger, you know, does this to go. And he told us this story brilliantly, and we were sitting there, and he said he, he'd had, and I realized I had simultaneously had the same two thoughts. He wondered, what if he kept the job? He might have been remembered as the book critic for Time Magazine. <laughs> A horrifying thought. <laughs> and then the second question also occurred to me. I was determined to do my best to mark. What should I have said? And I said, I'd already got there. And I said, well, you should have said William Wordsworth was a former revolutionary Republican poet who saw the error of his ways and became a conservative and a monarchist. That would have kept you. <laughs> and Bo said, you know what? That's, that's obviously right. That's what he was hoping I would say. So I thought I'd done a bit of credit for yeah, Mark at this point. I just, but, but, as Chekhov says, when there's a fucking great revolver on the mantelpiece in the first act, it'll be fired by act three. <laughs> and the, and the oak in this, the house of this consummately literate man, and all his books are, where we were sitting on the low-life patios, uh, or outside having a drink, was only one thing to read on view, and it was Commentary Magazine. And the cover story read, Edward Said, Professor of Terror. And I knew we were probably going to have to go through something. <laughs> But what was I to do? If I didn't defend my pal when Martin was there, how was Martin going to know I wouldn't defend him when he wasn't? <laughs> and, uh, to picture, if you will. It's just to, to wind it up, I rang the next day and I said, I'm you know, so, so sorry it didn't work out. And um, Christopher went on and, and, and sort of said, oh, don't worry. So he, he was never anything but totally sweet to me. And then he said, he said, I get that all the time. And I said, that's what the H said. <laughs> um, so so that's why he gets it all the time. So we've been through a lot of severe Talmudic and Trotskyist and old sectarian arguments. He liked that kind of thing. It was one of the, it, I also think he made tremendous use of it in his fiction in a very undogmatic way. He, all of that was always available to and accessible to him. The arguments that on tiny points that have to take place wherever there's more than one Jew speaking. Well, um, I'm interested. To, a really brief question: Should um, Jews criticise Israel if they really think it's taken a wrong path, or do you think they should shut up and close ranks, safe in the knowledge that there'll always be someone else who'll do it? <laughs> no, I think they should. Maybe. Look, there's, um, that's it? Yeah. You don't want to step on any of your lines. <laughs> there, is, there is a very old, um, as you know, a Jewish anti-Zionist tradition. I mean, and the, used, the only anti-Zionists used to be Jews. The, the Muslim world didn't know there was an argument going on between Herzl and others. The Christian world barely cared, and many Christians thought, well, if they insist on going to Palestine, we certainly wish they would go somewhere. Madagascar would be fine, Uganda, uh, and so on. There was a, there was a feeling, why, that's why Arthur Balfour was um, the great enemy of Jewish immigration to Britain was the king of Zionists, and so on and so on. But there was an old Jewish critique that said, this is not going to come to any good. You only replace the question of anti-Semitism if you move it to Palestine. And you may do an injustice to the existing inhabitants there. And it's messianic, which can't lead to anything but grief. 
And I have a great sympathy for the founders of that argument, back to Abraham Leon in, in Brussels and many, many others. I think that they were quite prescient. It only replaces, it hasn't made Jews safer. It hasn't made them more popular. Um, it isn't the alternative to diaspora, because if every Jew in the world was to move to Palestine, the state would have to be at least twice the size it currently is. And I can imagine quite a lot of argument about that. Uh, really quite a lot of argument. And it wouldn't just be from people who don't like Jews. Some people would have to move out. So, and as I say, I think it's, uh, it's part of the diaspora, not, a, not a, an answer to or an alternative to it. So, uh, that's the first overarching uh, point. The second is that I don't think one can take part in the argument about Israeli policy less vigorously than Israelis do. And there's absolutely nothing unpublishable on this point in the Israeli press, which is one of the things that makes the Israeli press and the Knesset debates a pleasure to read. They, it's a central and recurring point in Saul's book that, that the Jews hold themselves to a higher standard. They have been, they, they have been reminded of that and they constantly remind themselves of that. And, um, <laughs> Reading, reading Martin Gilbert's history of Israel, which I recently did, there is there is definitely a drift away from the moral the moral standard that Israel set itself around 1977 with the switch historic switch from Labour to Likud, and then you do immediately get um, Sharon calling for censorship um, with that shift. With, Begging and so on, um, and you know, Saul says that Israel should have been a sanctuary. That was the idea, and not um, the Holocaust Museum equipped with an air force, which is what it's often in danger of, of becoming. It seems. Um, <coughs> so it, you know, any whisper of. of uh, muffling those voices is is pernicious in, in the context of Israel. The, the Jews have to be able to speak out. Of course, they do. And um, Christopher, and um, you said earlier that something. I'll stand up. You said earlier that something was a tremendous waste of Jewishness, and uh, it sounded like a challenge. So I just want to ask you, what is Jewishness for? Well, I think, I, I, you know, I, I want to argue against myself. This is a beautiful question. I mean, I want to argue against myself in a way in that I don't think these things are really in the genes, or can be, but there's something in the, in the history and in the culture, and the tradition, if you want, that is very uh, reverent for learning, which means almost by definition, uh, very insistent on skeptical inquiry, free inquiry and very aware that there's no such thing as natural justice. That as Bertie Worcester puts it, we're not put on this earth for pleasure or that. And if you like, some of that is innate. If it isn't innate, it's obviously not genetically innate, it's, it's incultured. And I, I'm very suspicious of anything that contradicts or dislikes that. And I certainly think that any, any Jewish voice that's either uniform politically or confessionally or messianically is, is to that extent a negation of what is valuable and wonderful and terrible about the collective experience in all countries and at almost all times. I, yeah. That's, that would be it's a waste of Judaism to be like that. Uh, what the Jews are for is for seriousness. Um, it's a country without small talk, uh, Israel. Um, and it was a black day, I thought, for that country when uh, El Al was banned from, by the Knesset from landing or taking off on the Sabbath. And that's not serious. That's not Jewish. <laughs> no, you can't, we have boys to do that. Mm. Yeah. Poor, you can't yeah. have to do that. Uh, so why do I use that? It's easy. Uh, the, the fact that Jews are the first ones to find out that God is a fool, and that if you milk the cow uh, with, uh, w with the bucket under it, uh, that's no good. 
because that's a violation. But if you leave the bucket under the car and someone else who isn't Jewish comes along and just decides to milk, that's kosher milk. <laughs> you think God doesn't notice? He's an idiot. Well, I could have told you that to begin with. Uh, other religions don't have this kind of, um, if you like, brilliant hypocrisy. <laughs> what is the story? Irving Howe used to tell this story, I remember very well. So it's about, I think it's about the town of Helm, the Shtetl of Fools, um, where there's a guy on the, on the ramparts of this ramshackle shtetl, and he just stands there gazing out across the swine strewn plains of the, of the Goyen uh, from dawn till dusk with a fixed expression on his face. And, so what are, you, what are you doing? What, what, what's your job? He said, well, they pay me to do it. Uh, I'm supposed to keep an eye out for the Messiah's arrival. I just ring this bell if, he, if I see him coming. And he, I said, choosing his words with care, says, well, how's it going? I just put it. Steady work. <laughs> <laughs> There's a great Israeli rock group, I forgot its name now, it had a big hit a few years ago. At the time of the missile, I actually say, the Messiah's not coming, he's not even going to call. <laughs> And of course, religious Jews oppose the, the state of Israel. Well, of course, I did mention in the anti-Zionist critique that you, you would have to repress a great deal of Judaism. I mean, I, I should be the first to say that now. If you uh, repress the anti-Zionist uh, critique, because I, I sometimes go to meet the Natura Carta uh, types and others who, you know, um, once you've got over their view that the Earth is 450, no, 4,300 years old, uh, and so, they are very good Talmudic arguments about all kinds of things. And they, they really believe it's a blasphemy to have a secular Israeli state. Nothing like that can be allowed. It's condemned uh, until, the, until the Messiah comes. And there are quite a number of such sects, and there always were. So you, you'd have to still the arguments within Talmudic Judaism in order to say Jews mustn't criticize in front of the Goyim. And saying you mustn't criticize in front of the Goyim is to replicate the cringe in the first place that says you're shuffling around the shtetl hoping not to attract attention. That you're a luft match. Uh, so I think, you know, where all these questions answer themselves. Each... Sorry. I want to ask Christopher Hitchens. Oh. Well, ladies first, I... I want to ask Christopher Hitchens whether he thinks he's become more Jewish by living in America and how he would characterize the difference between British Jews and American Jews. I think, um, did, anyone, did anyone hear the question? Uh, well, the answer, oddly enough, is in a way yes. I mean, if I, I think if I'd been brought up in the United States, I would not have lived as long as I did wondering why my grandmother looked like a gypsy, which is what I thought she did. I would have recognized her more swiftly as a Philip Roth character than Dodo, uh, Mrs. Levin, than, than, uh, than I did in England, where these things are much more reticently dealt with. Yes, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very forward thing, including in my, not just in my favorite city of New York, but my hometown of Washington, D.C. It's a, it, the, the question of who is and who is and who is not Jewish and what the implications of that are is an everyday, very major frontal discussion. My impression was when I lived here, I haven't done it for a long time, that that's not so much the case. And I don't know which I prefer, by the way. I think I prefer the American. Yeah, there has been just... Do I see any difference between American Jews and British Jews? Yes, uh, but there's, there's a difference between American Jews and almost every other kind of Jew, which is this. Um, that they're, they're, did you see, any of you, the recent discovery of the letters of Anne Frank's father? Yes, you did see that. Extraordinary. And the ways in which everyone to whom he wrote from Amsterdam, trying to get out, uh, was... Could, Everyone in America, including Jewish friends and distant relatives, always raising the bar. If you can provide a few more character references, if you can deposit a bit more in a bank in New York, if you can show that you're not a communist, or always catch on. There's a, there is, in, in among American Jews, a terrible shame about that period, which is identified as something you also know with 
Rabbi Stephen Wise and many people of that, of that period, the, the, the realization that they, they could have done a great deal and they didn't. And the absolute determination to, if you like, cancel that miserable thought. And they can't because it keeps on coming back. And the idea that we'd have had to wait this long to find in New Jersey the letters begging from Anne Frank's father is proof enough of that. It's extraordinary. Yes, that's what makes Simone Rettinger's feel a special responsibility. No question about it. I don't think that anyone in Britain feels quite that way about the Nazi period. First, because Britain did take quite a lot of Jewish refugees, even though it often interned them as enemy aliens when they got here. And of course, tried to turn people away from Palestine. And so it's, it, isn't, it isn't as horrible. The memory is of disgust. Also, we have a more shameful history in that we banished them for four centuries in the Middle Ages. Um, there's no equivalent period in American history. Yeah. Perhaps one more. Uh, there was a, a gentleman standing right in front of the. Uh, George Steiner commented that every Jew should sleep should <clears throat> sleep with a full suitcase by the front door and be able to speak a number of languages. It presumably, hopefully, won't come to that. Well, I think every person should probably have the suitcase at least mentally packed. Mm. And to be polyglot, there's no, there's no shame in that. <coughs> The problem is, where are you going to go with this suitcase? <laughs> For example, people say to me, well, why are you critical of Zionism? What if, you know, the fascists took over the United States? You know, what if, it, what if there was a big movement of, what if it all happened? It never has uh, been a big movement in my opinion. But what if it did? I say, well, I would consider it my duty not to abandon my post and re resist, by all means, any challenge of that kind to the American Constitution. I would be ashamed of saying, well, I have another appointment in Hebron while the, while the United States goes under the fascism. I, mean, that, I would think that was disgraceful in the first place. In the second place, if I move to Hebron and a nuclear-armed United States is taken over by an anti-Semitic movement, I'm not going to have moved far enough, am I? So if you, my, my doubts about Zionism are so to speak existential in that way. And, and the, but they also involve the question of principle. Would it, would it be right to say, well, you guys live under fascism, I'm going off to the Holy Land. I can't think of a more uh, wasteful attitude to one's situations. Philip Roth's uh, novel, um, The Plot Against America, um, imagined this, um, the, the rise of the fascist administration in America and the marginalization of the Jews as a prelude to sterner measures. But um, as Guy James ended his review of that book, he said that uh, as Roth must have felt halfway through the book, that uh, the trouble with the, with the plot against America is that America is against the plot. Uh, the traditions just aren't there. No, no, it's quite noticeable that there are two very prominent Americans now um, who both derived from Charles Lindbergh's America First movement and both from opposite directions converge as strong opponents of the intervention in Iraq, for example, in American policy in the region, and Pat Buchanan and Gore Vidal. Both explicitly say that Charles Lindbergh is their political role model. Political role model and hero. A role model is a word I would never use in any other context, I promise you. But it sometimes has to be used. Pat, Pat Buchanan says he's brought up to worship as, as a hero, and Gorbidal says he was the hero not just of himself but of the family in which he was brought up, and they were both men Gore was old enough to actually be a member of America first. Lindberghism is is one of the great practical jokes on the American anti war movement. People go and hear these guys thinking they're anti imperialist speakers, and they don't realize what they're listening to is America first isolationists whose movement was founded by someone who was very indulgent to anti-Semitism and who took a, a medal from Goering and accused the Jews of being the authors of the Second World War. So I, 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 I find that this, this thread, uh, what I described earlier is that the protean character of anti-Semitism, the different 
shape-shifting forms it takes is always worth paying attention to. And like La Peste, like, uh, to make another reference to Camus, the, the, it may go dormant for a very long time. It may go right back into the sewers for a very long time. But one day it will set its... Mm -hmm. yeah. for a few more minutes. We've got a special announcement to make and Peter Levy, chairman of the JC and our sponsor, would like to personally thank uh, Martin and Christopher and make this uh, special announcement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, since I'm speaking now, can I, uh, on behalf of everybody and on behalf of the Jewish Chronicle, thank uh, uh, you, Professor Amos, and you, Christopher Hitchens, for a most uh, interesting enjoyable and uh, interesting insight into uh, Judaism and uh, Jewish, the Jewish world. I think that we've been privileged this evening for uh, listening to this dialogue and uh, very much appreciate your being here. Thank you very much indeed. The Jewish Chronicle has been involved and uh, sponsored and been associated with Jewish Book Week for a number of years, as you know, and has been the media sponsor for the last 13 years. And we've always uh, enjoyed uh, that. This is one of the consistently most successful Jewish cultural events in the calendar uh, for London and always has a tremendous response and a tremendous audience, and we're delighted to be associated with it. This evening, um, we are announcing in conjunction with Jewish Book Week and the Jewish Book Council uh, the launch of the Chaim Bermant Journalist Prize. Many of you will remember Chaim Bermant as a, an author and a journalist and a columnist of the Jewish Chronicle for, I don't know, 40 years or so, uh, whose witty insights into uh, the community and as a chronicler uh, of the day uh, were not to be missed, and anybody who associated themselves with the Jewish Chronicle uh, read Chaim Bermant, and we're delighted this evening that his widow Judy Bermant is with us. This prize uh, we're initiating in conjunction with the Jewish Book Week um, has two parts, uh, one for uh, any uh, journalist, uh, and secondly for uh, young aspiring journalists. Um, this. Uh, prize uh, will be uh, looked into by a panel of judges, uh, one of whom will be the uh, editor of the Jewish Chronicle, David Rohn, Jonathan Friedland is another, and there are others who will be participating in this. Um, the first submissions will be required by the end of October this year, and all information and details and terms and conditions uh, can be found either on the Jewish Chronicle website or on the Jewish Book Council website, or communicating directly with them. I think it's um, taken us a long time, Judy, to get to this point, but I think that in memory of Chaim Bermant, this is an appropriate thing to do, and we very much look forward to the interesting responses which we hope to get from it, and hope that it will be uh, worthwhile and beneficial towards Jew journalism generally, and particularly Jewish journalism. I'd like to say that uh, the Jewish Chronicle has always appreciated very much and enjoyed its association with Book Week and we look forward to many further years together and to the success of Jewish Book Week continuing as it, as it clearly seems to be this evening. Thank you very much. Martin and Christopher kindly agreed to uh, sign their books and they will be signing their books in the um, um, book fair over there. Thank you.
This is the site of the largest mass murder in the history of the world. Auschwitz. 1,100,000 people died here. More than the total British and American losses in the whole of the Second World War. This is the story of the evolution of Auschwitz and the mentality of the perpetrators. It's a history based in part on documents and plans only discovered since the opening of archives in Eastern Europe and informed by interviews with people who were there, including former members of the SS. And if you ask yourself if this is really necessary, you say to yourself, yes, of course, we've been told that these are our enemies and there is a war on. At Auschwitz, the Nazis were eventually to create buildings which would have looked like this. Places which symbolize their crime. Factories of death. There were the people screaming, all the people, you know, they didn't know what to do, crying, until the, the, the gas took effect. If I close my eyes, the only thing I see is standing up. Women with children in, in their hands there. But the journey to the killing factories of Auschwitz was to be long and crooked. Only several years into the war did Nazi decision-makers implement their infamous final solution, the extermination of the Jews. It was not at Auschwitz, but elsewhere in Eastern Europe, during one of the most brutal military campaigns of modern times, that the Nazis would first murder innocent civilians in huge numbers. The order said they're to be shot. And for me, that was binding. The surprising truth is that Auschwitz was not initially built for the mass murder of the Jews, but for an entirely different purpose. This is the story of the birth of the camp and the origins of the Nazi policy of extermination and of the people who made it happen. In 1940, Captain Rudolf Hurst of the SS journeyed through Poland to take up the job of commandant of a new Nazi concentration camp. Hurst was traveling to a town in the midst of territory snatched by Hitler during his invasion the previous year. A place the Poles had called Oświęcim, and the Germans now called Auschwitz. Here, Hearst would create this concentration camp, the very first Auschwitz, which was later known as the Stammlager, or Auschwitz I. But when Hearst first arrived in April 1940, few of these buildings existed. This infamous concentration camp began life as a collection of dilapidated former Polish army barracks set around a huge horse-breaking yard. The task wasn't easy. In the shortest possible time, I had to create a camp for 10,000 prisoners using the existing complex of buildings, which were well constructed but were completely run down and swarming with vermin. 
And this first Auschwitz was built not to hold Polish Jews, who were to be confined elsewhere in ghettos, but chiefly Polish political prisoners, anyone the Nazis considered a threat to their occupation. True opponents of the state had to be securely locked up. Only the SS were capable of protecting the national socialist state from all internal danger. All other organizations lacked the necessary toughness. The Nazi occupation of Poland was to be brutal. They wanted to make the Poles a nation of slaves, and it was to help them achieve this aim that the Nazis first built places like Auschwitz, modeled on concentration camps they'd already established in Germany. Hearst, who had worked in concentration camps since 1934, knew that his task was to create a place that would strike terror into the Poles. But the gas chambers for which Auschwitz was to become infamous were not yet conceived. Hearst even adopted the cynical motto of Dachau concentration camp in Germany, Arbeit macht frei, work makes you free, and emblazoned it on the new gates of Auschwitz. The Polish prisoners now arriving at the new camp were subject to appalling treatment from the SS. Over half the 23,000 Poles first sent to Auschwitz were dead within 20 months. Jerzy Bielecki was imprisoned in Auschwitz because the Nazis suspected he was in the Polish resistance. Once there, the SS sentenced him to hanging torture, a punishment favored in other concentration camps as well, where the prisoner was made to carry his full body weight on arms pulled back into an unnatural position. He wanted to hang me on the hook. He said, stand up on your toes. Finally, he hooked me. And then he kicked the stool away without any warning. I just felt Jesus, Mary, oh my God, the terrible pain. My shoulders were breaking out from the joints. Both arms were breaking out from the joints. I'd been moaning and he just said, shut up you dog, you deserve it. You have to suffer. Appallingly violent as life was at Auschwitz, the camp itself was not yet a major priority in the Nazi scheme of things. So much so that in those early days, Hearst was forced to go scrounging for basic supplies. Since I could expect no help from the inspectorate of concentration camps, I had to make do as best I could and help myself. I had to drive as far as 60 miles to Zakopane and Rabka just to get some kettles. I didn't even know where I could get a hundred meters of barbed wire. So I just had to pilfer the badly needed barbed wire. After a day of pilfering, Hurst returned home to a house on the edge of the concentration camp. Here he lived as he thought a Nazi conqueror should and treated the prisoners as his serfs. Every week and a half or so, a junior officer from the guard company would come and take me to his house and I would cut Hurst's hair. He wouldn't say a word to me, and I wouldn't say a word to him, because I was afraid. When you ever tempted to stick the scissors in his neck? It could have happened. I had a razor in my hand and I could have grabbed him and slit his throat. It could have happened. But I'm a living, thinking being. Do you know what would have happened? My whole family would have been destroyed. Half the camp would have been destroyed. And in his place, someone else would have come. While Hearst lived in comfort, the prisoners struggled to survive. Deprived of adequate sustenance, they evolved their own code of conduct. And one of the worst crimes an inmate could commit was to take another's food. 
What was done to get rid of such people? They were liquidated. The prisoners killed them at night. He put a blanket over his face and kept it there until he stopped breathing. No one would ask questions. In the morning, the block elder would report, so many dead, fair enough. Okay. And you didn't feel anything? This was normal? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was completely normal, except for a kind of flash, subconscious perhaps. God, and still things such as this are happening, and still things such as this. But these things couldn't be helped. In other words, don't think about it. It's been and gone. Now think about where to go to work, to survive the following day. Just to survive the following day. Watch your bread so that no one steals it so that you get to eat some breakfast. Go to work and try to find a lighter job. This is what you were preoccupied with. And this was a constant vigilance. Be vigilant. You have to survive. Presiding over the horror of prison life at Auschwitz in 1940 were Hurs and around 300 members of the SS. They held comradeship evenings for themselves and their families to foster a sense of solidarity. But as Hearst reveals, it was a charade. Palich, the roll call leader, was the most cunning and slippery creature I had ever got to know and experience during my long and diverse service in various concentration camps. He literally walked over bodies to satisfy his hunger for power. Fritsch, the first camp officer, was short-witted yet stubborn and always quarrelsome, even though he was trying to present himself as a good comrade and also talked a lot about comradeship when he was off duty. His behavior was, in reality, anything but comradely. Hirsch's memoirs reveal him to be a hard-hearted, petty-minded man always wanting to shift responsibility for his mistakes onto others. And in his own admission, Auschwitz was, from the first, a concentration camp where great brutality was practiced. Despite this, during 1940, the camp he ran was almost a backwater in Nazi-occupied Poland. All that was about to change. The crucial reason for the transformation of Auschwitz was simple. Its location. The area around the camp was rich in natural resources. This part of Poland possessed a plentiful supply of fresh water, lime, and most importantly of all for what was to come, coal. Within 20 miles of Auschwitz lay a network of mines with access to some of the richest coal seams in Europe. Towards the end of 1940, these were just the resources that scientists at IG Farben, the giant German industrial conglomerate, were looking for. They'd been experimenting for years in how to make synthetic rubber and fuel, essential raw materials for the German war effort. Water, lime and coal were the most important ingredients they needed. Now they found that Auschwitz was just the right place to site their new factory in the east. Himmler, commander of the SS, now visited Auschwitz for the very first time. He had heard the news that IG Farben, with its huge financial resources, was interested in coming to the end.
16 Mannschaftsunterkünfte geplant. Himmler was accompanied on his tour of inspection by Hearst, the regional Nazi leader, the Gauleiter, and other senior members of the SS. Und die Häftlinge werden fachlich geschult. Himmler told them that he wanted Auschwitz tripled in capacity from 10,000 to 30,000 prisoners. The camp would be a backwater no longer, but the biggest concentration camp in the Nazi state. Wenn ich mir hier eine Anmerkung erlauben darf, bitte. But as Hearst witnessed, the local Nazi leader had problems with Reichsführer Himmler's plans. The Gauleiter raised objections, and the county president tried to put a stop to the plan by pointing to the unresolved drainage issue. But the Reichsführer would have none of it. Holen Sie sich die betreffenden Fachleute und Ihr Problem löst sich von selbst. Meine Herren, das Lager wird ausgebaut. Meine Gründe dazu sind wichtiger als Ihre Ablehnungsversuche. Unsurprisingly, Himmler got his way. A whole series of plans was drawn up over the succeeding months and years, detailing the grandeur, almost megalomania, of the new Nazi vision for Auschwitz. Hidden for decades, the detailed drawings surfaced only shortly before the death of the original German architect. The Nazi dream was that the money IG Farben was bringing to the area would fund the creation of a new town of Auschwitz, a model German settlement in the east. Ethnic Germans would now live here, with those who currently lived in the town thrown out of their homes and deported. Plans were made for a gigantic Nazi party headquarters and a host of other new buildings. And nearby, down the Solo River, the concentration camp itself was to be transformed. Prisoners would work as slave labor at the IG Farben factory nearby. The SS would sell IG Farben raw materials and a huge new Kommandantur, a central administrative building, would be built. A special apartment was even to be constructed for Himmler himself. Auschwitz was to be his home away from home. Plans were drawn up for suitable furniture for the Heisführer, from his sofa to his occasional table, from his armchair to the hangings on the wall. Himmler's vision for the new Auschwitz was certainly grandiose. But it was the epic plans that Adolf Hitler was working on at the same time, which would transform Auschwitz in ways that dwarfed anything Himmler had contemplated. Hitler intended not just to reorganize a concentration camp and a town, but to reshape entire countries. But during the spring of 1941, Hitler worked on plans to invade the Soviet Union. This decision would in turn act as the catalyst for radical change in the function of Auschwitz. Before the end of 1941, Hitler expected German troops to be parading through Moscow's Red Square. The Nazis hated the Soviet Union. It was the home of communism, an ideology they both feared and despised. The Nazis believed that it ought not to be hard to defeat Stalin and his Red Army. They were, in civilization terms, not as far on as the West. You just have to imagine the following. France, a civilized nation with flushing toilets. Russia, predominantly toilet behind the house. In Berlin in the spring of 1941, this view that the Soviet Union was peopled with inferior human beings pervaded Nazi strategic thinking. Nazi economic planners worked out how the German army could be fed once the invasion was launched. Thought it legitimate to plan mass starvation. 
sollten wir uns über eines im Klaren sein. Die Überschüsse Russlands... Every word spoken here is taken from Nazi memoranda and minutes of economic committees held just before the war against the Soviet Union began. Das heißt, wenn wir irgendetwas aus Russland herausholen wollen, muss der Konsum entsprechend herabgedrückt werden. Armut und Hunger erträgt der russische Mensch schon seit Jahrhunderten. Sein Magen ist dehnbar, daher kein falsches Mitleid. Uns machen wir uns nichts vor. Zig Millionen Menschen werden verhungern, wenn von uns das für uns Notwendige herausgeholt wird. Wir haben keine andere Wahl. Der Krieg ist nur weiterzuführen, wenn wir ab nächstem Jahr die gesamte Wehrmacht aus Russland ernähren können. So ist es. So even before the war started, the Nazis envisaged the extermination of large sections of the Soviet population. Sie würden die Durchhaltemöglichkeit Deutschlands im Krieg unterbinden. This was to be a war of annihilation. Darüber muss absolute Klarheit herrschen. In the weeks after their invasion of the Soviet Union, the Germans took three million Soviet prisoners. Within nine months, two million of them were dead. Many starved to death in German captivity. Any Soviet political officers or commissars found amongst the Red Army prisoners on the front line were to be shot. But some who slipped through were sent to concentration camps, which is how Auschwitz first became involved in the war in the East. On this spot in July 1941, Soviet prisoners were forced to work in gravel pits. From behind a nearby fence, a Polish inmate of Auschwitz, Jerzy Bielecki, watched what happened to them. Two prisoner overseers beat them mercilessly, kicked them, clubbed them, they would fall to the ground. It was a macabre scene. I'd never in my life seen anything like it. Neither did I later on, even though I remained at the camp for a long time after. I saw an SS man, a junior officer, walking around the gravel pit with a pistol in his hand. It was sadism. You dogs, you damned communists, you pieces of shit, horrible words like these. And from time to time, he would direct the pistol downwards and shoot. It wasn't just the Soviet prisoners of war who were to suffer as the Nazis moved east. It was the Soviet Jews as well. The Nazis, hardened anti-Semites, believed that the combination of Slavs, Jews and communism was particularly dangerous. There were connections between Jews and Bolsheviks. There was sufficient evidence for the fact that there were connections between the two. The Nazis spouted any number of similar prejudices about the Jews, even claiming there was an international Jewish conspiracy against them, and that the Jews had somehow lost Germany the First World War. Their delusions knew no bounds. Das sind jene Ostjudentypen, die besonders nach dem Weltkriege die Großstädte Mittel- und Westeuropas überschwemmten, wo sie als Parasiten ihre Gastvölker zersetzten und tausendjährige Kulturen zu vernichten drohten, wo sie auch auftauchten brachten sie Verbrechen, Korruption und Chaos mit sich. From the moment the Germans first invaded the Soviet Union, Nazi special units operating throughout the countryside and towns had shot many male Jews, including communists, civic leaders, and even those just of military age. They'd also encouraged locals to rise up against the Jews, as is happening here in this rare footage from the Ukraine in July 1941. After a series of meetings between Hitler and Himmler in the summer of 1941, there was an escalation in the persecution of the Soviet Jews.
New units were committed to special duties in the East, among them the 1st SS Infantry Brigade. In a typical action, they approached the town of Ostrog in the western part of the Ukraine on August the 4th, 1941, where over 10,000 Jews from the surrounding area had been gathered together. Among them were 11-year-old Vasil Waldman and his family. They were now at risk. The Nazi killing squads in the east had now begun to target Jewish women and children as well as men. We knew something would be done to us here. When we saw people hit and driven along here with spades, even small children realized why people were carrying the spades. One of the members of the 1st SS Infantry Brigade at the time was Hans Friedrich. He claims not to recall exactly which actions he took part in that summer, but he does admit to participating in killings like the one in Ostrom. They were so utterly shocked and frightening. You could do with them what you wanted. Kids were crying, the sick were crying, the elderly were praying to God, not on their knees, but seated or lying down. It was very tough to go through it all, hearing all this wailing and crying. Then they had everyone get up and said, go. And as soon as people started moving, they selected people for execution. The selected Ukrainian Jews were taken out to this spot and a pit was dug. In scenes which were repeated right across the areas of the Soviet Union occupied by the Nazis, men, women and children were ordered to strip and prepare to die. Try to imagine there is a ditch with people on one side and behind them soldiers. That was us and we were shooting. And those who were hit fell down into the ditch. Could you tell me what you were thinking and feeling when you were shooting? Nothing. I only thought, aim carefully, so that you hit properly. That was my thought. This was your only thought. During all that time, you had no feelings for the people, the Jewish civilians that you shot. No. And why not? Because my hatred towards the Jews is too great. And I admit my thinking on this point is unjust. I admit this. Uh, but what I experienced from my earliest youth, when I was living on a farm, what the Jews were doing to us, well, that will never change. That is my unshakable conviction. As he grew up in the 1930s in an atmosphere of vicious anti-Semitism, Hans Friedrich came to believe that local Jewish traders had cheated him and his family. What in God's name did the people you shot have to do with those people who supposedly treated you badly at home? They simply belonged to the same group. What else? What else did they have to do with it? Nothing. But to us, they were Jews. Though I was a small boy at the time, I understood what Nazis were. I had no idea before 
But afterwards, I was thinking all the time, what makes these people so cruel? What makes them beasts? The killings went on into the evening. Vasil Waldman and his mother managed to escape and hide in a nearby village. But the SS killed his father, grandfather, and two uncles. That's how it was, the first execution, the most horrible one. It wasn't the last one. There were three more large executions after that, with 2,000 to 3,000 people shot at every one of them. More people were executed afterwards in smaller scale ones, and this is how the Jewish community of Ostrog was annihilated. At the same time as the mass shootings of Jews in the Soviet Union, there was also an escalation in the killing of Auschwitz prisoners. Yeah. yeah. For the first time, inmates of Auschwitz were to be killed by gassing, but not in the way for which the camp was eventually to become notorious. Hurst received news that doctors from the so-called adult euthanasia program would visit the camp. They were looking for those prisoners who could no longer work. Members of the Nazis' adult euthanasia program had up to now been targeting the mentally and physically disabled, many of whom lived in asylums like this. They were a section of the population long demonized by Nazi propaganda. Das deutsche Volk kennt das ganze Ausmaß dieses Elends wohl kaum. Es kennt nicht den drückenden Geist jener Häuser, in denen tausende lallende Schwachsinnige künstlich ernährt und gepflegt werden müssen, die tiefer stehen als jedes Tier. Dürfen wir kommende Geschlechter weiter mit solchem Erbe belasten? In 1939, Hitler had authorized a scheme by which severely disabled children could be murdered. Then, once the war began, this killing was extended to disabled adults as well. The selection was straightforward. A doctor would examine a report on the patient, and then if he thought they were suitable candidates for the scheme, he would mark the form with a red cross. Two other doctors separately marked identical forms, and a majority vote decided the patient's fate. The doctors met neither each other nor the patient before reaching their verdict. Those selected to die were taken to special institutions inside Germany, like this one, the Sonnenstein Clinic near Dresden. There were six centers like this spread throughout Germany, and in them, a new method of killing had been devised using a subterfuge that would eventually be adopted at Auschwitz. The disabled were told they were going to have a shower. They were taken into a room from which hung pipes and shower heads. But the pipes were not connected to water. They led out through the walls to bottles of carbon monoxide gas. Once the room was sealed, the carbon monoxide was turned on and the patients murdered. Around 70,000 disabled people had been killed in this way by the summer of 1941. Himmler wanted the adult euthanasia scheme to be extended to concentration camps, which is why a special unit came to Auschwitz that summer. During an evening roll call, we were told that all the sick among us could go away for treatment, that they could leave to be cured, and that they were to sign up. Of course, it was said that they would be going for treatment, and in the camp, some people believed it. So the first Auschwitz prisoners to be gassed were not killed in the camp, but transported to gas chambers in Germany. And they were selected not because they were Jews, but because they could no longer work. There were 575 people and they walked like some kind of funeral procession because some walked, others were carried on stretchers 
a kind of melancholy march, and the inmates standing nearby were saying farewell to their relatives and friends. All of them were worn out prisoners. There were no healthy people among them. Male nurses carried some on stretchers. It was terribly macabre. It was a procession of spectres. Two weeks after the sick were taken from Auschwitz, Heinrich Himmler visited the Soviet Union. A visit that was to be of great significance in the development of the Nazis' extermination program. The discovery in the 1990s of Himmler's appointment diary for this crucial period allows his precise movements to be tracked. He drove to the outskirts of Minsk, and on the morning of Friday, August the 15th, 1941, he watched an execution of Jews and alleged partisans. The site must have been similar to this execution, filmed around the same time on the sand dunes of Liepaja in Latvia. After the shooting, SS General Erich von den Bach Zelewski told Himmler there was a problem with the SS killers. Reichsführer, das waren nur 100. Fragen Sie damit. Sehen Sie in die Augen der Männer dieses Kommandos. Solche Männer sind fertig für ihr ganzes Leben. Was züchten wir uns dafür Gefolgsmänner heran? Entweder Nervenkranke oder Rohlinge. Bach Zelewski knew that all over the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, the Nazis and their collaborators were murdering women and children at close range and in cold blood. Himmler realized he had to find a better way of killing. Better for the murderers, not their victims. Which is why SS Lieutenant Dr. Albert Widmann of the Technical Institute of the Criminal Police traveled into Eastern Europe. Widmann and his colleagues had been involved in the experiments which had led to the use of bottled carbon monoxide to kill the disabled. But he knew that it would be expensive and difficult to send canisters of carbon monoxide all the way to the new killing locations far from Germany. So he had to find a new way forward. Which is why he drove into the Soviet Union, followed by a truck carrying boxes of high explosive. Widmann reported to Artur Neber, commander of one of the killing squads, at his headquarters in the Lenin House in Minsk. Sie haben doch hoffentlich genügend Sprengstoff dabei. Sie hatten 250 Kilogramm angefordert. Ich habe 400 Kilogramm mitgebracht. Für alle Fälle. Sehr gut. The bunker had totally collapsed. There was total silence. Body parts were scattered on the ground and hanging in the trees. And the next day we collected the body parts and threw them back into the bunker. Those parts that were too high in the trees were just left there. After this horror, Widmann and his SS colleagues tried another method of mass murder. This one suggested by what had happened to Arthur Neighbor of the SS earlier on in the year. Neighbor had driven home drunk from a party in Berlin and passed out in his garage with the car engine still running. As a result, the carbon monoxide from the exhaust gases had nearly killed him. His colleagues now conducted experiments in the Soviet Union, like this one. 
This film is believed to show patients from a Soviet hospital being locked in a room which was connected to the exhaust pipes of a car and a lorry. The Nazis had now developed a cheaper method of killing people with carbon monoxide than that previously used in the adult euthanasia scheme. Around the same time as these gassing experiments were being conducted in the East, the authorities at Auschwitz were innovating new ways of murder as well. While Huss was away from the camp, his deputy Karl Fritsch had a radical idea, one of the most significant in the history of Auschwitz. With the SS in the camp still relying on shooting to kill Soviet prisoners unable to work, Maybe, he thought, another method of killing lay right in front of him. In Auschwitz, clothes infected with lice and other insects were disinfected with crystallized prussic acid, mass-produced under the trade name Zyplon B. Once released from their sealed container, Zyklon B crystals dissolved in the air to create a lethal gas. Fritsch chose Block 11 in Auschwitz to conduct his first experiment with Zyklon B. This was the most feared location in the camp, a prison within a prison. The place where the SS sent inmates to be punished, interrogated, tortured, even executed. In Block 11 were standing cells where prisoners would be crammed together, scarcely even able to breathe. And starvation cells, where inmates would be locked up, deprived of food, and left until they died. Everyone in Auschwitz knew of the reputation of Block 11. I personally was afraid of walking past Block 11. Personally, I was afraid. Although it was closed off, I was really scared to make past there. Whether it was the avenue where I was walking there or what, I was afraid. Block 11 meant death. On a day in late August or early September 1941, Fritsch ordered that the basement of Block 11 be prepared for the use of Zyklon B. Doors and windows were sealed. The whole block locked down. Our attention was drawn. Many of my colleagues saw this by SS men running around with gas masks. The windows of the bunker had been covered up with sand. And in the bunker, the cells of the bunker, in the south, Soviet prisoners of war were assembled. And it turned out the following day that the SS, actually it was Palich in particular who attracted attention because he was running around like crazy. It turned out that the gas hadn't worked properly and that many of the prisoners, the people, were still alive. So they increased the dosage, added more crystals and finished the job. The prisoners dragged them all away on carts, known as roll wagons. They took them to the crematorium because the crematorium was already being used. You could see smoke from the chimneys. So it was an open secret. How does a person feel? One becomes indifferent in the midst of all that. Today it's your turn. Tomorrow it'll be mine. Once Hearst came back to the camp, he learned about the experiment. I 
Uh-huh. When I returned, Fritz reported to me about how he had used the gas. He used it again to kill the next transport of Russian prisoners of war. As Hurst returned home to his wife and four children in his house on the edge of the camp, he felt pleased. I must admit that this gassing had a calming effect on me. I was always horrified of executions by firing squads. Now I was relieved to think that we would be spared all these bloodbaths. Hurst was wrong. He was about to oversee an even greater bloodbath. By building a camp here, on this patch of swampy ground a mile and a half away from the town of Auschwitz, at a place the Poles called Brezhinka, and the Germans, Birkenau. In the autumn of 1941, Auschwitz concentration camp in southwest Poland was still a place where the vast majority of inmates were Polish political prisoners. But all that was about to change. Over the next few months, the Commandant Rudolf Hurst began to transform the camp. <laughs> And as new arrivals entered Auschwitz, Hurst and his colleagues experimented with new ways of killing in buildings like this. I could see everything that was going on as though it were laid out in the palm of my hand. Then a sesame climbed onto the flat roof of the building, put on a gas mask, opened a hatch and dropped the powder in. This is the story of how the Nazis ventured into entirely new territory in the history of mass murder as they developed their so-called final solution, the extermination of the Jews. Via a combination of orders from the top and initiatives from below, they set in motion a policy of wholesale destruction. concentration camp in October 1941, a radical initiative was being implemented. The newly appointed Auschwitz construction chief Karl Bischoff and SS architect Fritz Ertl were working on plans for a completely new camp. To be situated a little more than a mile and a half northwest of the existing one, on the site of a village the Germans called Birkenau. Ich glaube, ich habe eine Idee. This new camp was to be the size of a small town, capable of holding 100,000 people. Research conducted in the 1990s, based on the original German construction plans, reveals that from the first moment of its conception, this camp was designed to house prisoners in appalling conditions. The Nazis had built suffering into the very plans. In a 
concentration camp in Germany, this was the total space three inmates had to live in. Here at the new camp in Auschwitz, the original plan was to cram nine prisoners into the same space, 550 in every barrack. There was no running water, no proper flooring, and jamming so many people together in each hut meant that this was the perfect breeding ground for disease. But when the final calculations were made, it was clear that even cramming the new prisoners together so tightly wasn't enough for the needs of the Nazis. Drei Mann pro Koje machen 558 Mann pro Barrack. Bei 174 Unterkunftsbaracken kommen wir auf 97.000. Genau. Jetzt stellen Sie sich vor, wir packen vier Mann. Statt. So Bischof decided to force even more prisoners into each barrack. The documents reveal that he made a handwritten change. The figure 550 for each barrack was crossed out and replaced with 744. The SS were designing barracks not so much to house people as to destroy them. Surprisingly, the new camp they were designing at Auschwitz wasn't initially intended to take Jews at all. But people like these, Soviet prisoners of war, the Nazis considered them subhuman. During the war, around three million of them died in German captivity of starvation, disease, and physical abuse. In the autumn of 1941, 10,000 Soviet prisoners of war arrived to begin construction of the new camp, Auschwitz-Birkenau. It was October. It was already snowing. I remember that it was snowing. They were unloaded at the railway ramp at the Kud station. They were exhausted. It was difficult for them even to move. It is hard to imagine a human being in rags dirty, starved, sick. It was simply a caricature of a human being. Only a few hundred of the 10,000 Soviet prisoners of war survived until the following spring. One of those who did was Pavel Stjenkin. We knew our place, a grave. I'm alive now, and in a minute, I'm finished. This was a constant feeling. They could kill you any minute, and you would not know why. The way the Germans, the SS and the overseers amongst the prisoners tormented the POWs, they didn't even beat us as hard. I don't know why, but if a prisoner overseer didn't kill seven or ten a day, he probably couldn't sleep. That's how we interpreted it. People were dying from starvation, from diseases, and from beatings. You'd go to bed and you were still alive. By morning, you were dead. Death, death, death. Death at night, death in the morning, death in the afternoon. Death. We lived with death. How could a human feel? The man in charge of all this suffering, Rudolf Huss, Commandant of Auschwitz, held routine meetings at 9 o'clock every Tuesday or Friday morning to discuss the running of the camp with his senior officers. From the study of Nazi documents recently discovered in Moscow, it's clear that in the autumn of 1941, Hearst and his colleagues were focusing on Birkenau's future role as an immense prisoner of war camp 
not as a place to murder Jews. It would take several months and many twists and turns before they would wrestle with the task of turning Auschwitz-Birkenau into a place where Jews were gassed in giant killing factories. Das geht so nicht. Ich werde umgehend die Reichsführung informieren. Obersturmführer, Sie setzen mir schon mal das auf. Um 12 Uhr dann... The catalysts for this dramatic change in the function of Auschwitz are to be found in the actions of Nazis elsewhere. Like here in Hamburg, one of Germany's major ports. Hamburg's most prominent local Nazi was about to use the bombing of the city by the RAF to escalate the persecution of the Jews still further. The bombing in September 1941 left hundreds homeless, but Karl Kaufmann, the Gauleiter or regional leader of Hamburg, saw this as an opportunity to show his initiative. So he dictated a letter to Adolf Hitler. Ich bitte daher um die Genehmigung, die Juden des Gaus Hamburg nach dem Osten evakuieren zu lassen, um zu ermöglichen, dass wenigstens zu einem gewissen Teil den Bombengeschädigten wieder eine Wohnung zugewiesen werden kann. Requests like this one from Kaufmann coincided with Hitler's own prejudices and desires. He wanted to remove the Jews for years. Like many on the nationalist right, he believed in the delusion that the Jews had lost Germany the First World War, and that there was an international conspiracy of Jews against them. From the moment the Nazis came to power, Hitler had ensured that the Jews of Germany were persecuted. They quickly became the scapegoats for all of Germany's ills. In the autumn of 1941, Hitler agreed to the requests of Kaufmann and other senior Nazis to deport the German Jews. At the end of October, the Jews of Hamburg heard the news they'd been dreading. We received a registered letter 24 hours prior to report to a building near the railway station to bring one suitcase and you would be resettled in the east. That's all it said. In scenes that were eventually to be repeated right across Germany, the German Jews packed their belongings and prepared to leave in full view of their non-Jewish neighbors. It was either an ugly word or they looked away. It made us angry, but more than that, it made us terribly afraid. Uh, we wished we could hit back, but we knew we couldn't. In the morning, we were taken to trains, regular trains, and uh, the trains were sealed from the outside, and it was a train right into nowhere. And we didn't know what to expect. None of these German Jews were sent straight from Hamburg to Auschwitz. Instead, their first destination was the Lodz Ghetto in Poland. The Nazis had created ghettos all over Poland to imprison the Polish Jews. They hated these Jews even more than the Jews from the West. To the Nazis, they were from the Slavic East, and so doubly dangerous. This was the shocking new environment into which the Hamburg Jews were now placed, as they arrived in Lodz on the morning of the 26th of October, 1941. There were 1150 people with the Jewish ghetto police walking us into the ghetto and it was a two hour walk. We saw people within the ghetto, they looked ragged, they looked tired, 
they look drawn and they pay this no attention. We saw an area that resembled a slum, except none of us had ever seen a slum. But we assumed this was it. And we couldn't understand why they looked the way they did. Not decently dressed. We didn't know what kind of a place this was. It just didn't make any sense at all. Normal to German Jews that look at the Polish Jews from the top down. Because we've been definitely a much lower category than them. And all of a sudden, it's hit them that they come, they come to the same level or maybe lower. Because they cannot live with the, in the conditions we did. With the arrival of the German Jews, the Lodz ghetto became more overcrowded than ever. And the local Nazi authorities sought ways of reducing the ghetto population. Which is why, in the autumn of 1941, Walter Burmeister of the SS drove his boss, Herbert Lange, across Poland. Burmeister later recalled what Lange had told him about the purpose of the trip. Um das von vornherein klarzustellen, es besteht absolute Schweigenpflicht. Ich habe Befehl, in Kölnhof ein Sonderkommando aufzustellen. Dazu werden dort noch andere Mitarbeiter aus Posen und von der Stabustelle Litzmannstadt eintreffen. Es steht uns eine harte, aber wichtige Aufgabe bevor. Herbert Langer had until recently been employed in the Nazis Adult Euthanasia Program, murdering the disabled. Lange drove to a small village called Helmdal. Here, over the next few weeks, he and his men would prepare a special installation. Its chief purpose, to create space in the Lord's ghetto by killing the Jews the Nazis thought unproductive. By November 1941, Helmdal was not the only such centre under construction. At Belzec's in the east of Poland, a small camp was being built so the Nazis could kill selected Jews from the nearby Lublin area. But the killing was about to escalate still further after dramatic events more than 7,000 miles away. On December the 7th, 1941, the Japanese bombed American battleships at Pearl Harbor. As a result, Germany, allies of the Japanese, declared war on the United States. And in a speech he gave days later, Hitler made it clear who he blamed for the intensification of the war. We are sitting in the camp in the Ruder State, and it delegated the youth in the Palestine of the Common Arten, who back off at once to one strike that we had done at Russian and his children being a lay person. In private, Hitler was now calling for the Jews to be exterminated. And one of the leading Nazis who heard him speak of mass murder lived here in Krakow in Poland. On December the 16th, 1941, just days after meeting with Hitler, he spoke to a carefully selected group of senior army officers, SS and local Nazi party administrators. His name was Hans Frank, and he was the Nazi ruler of Eastern Poland. At the time, his words were not supposed to be made public, but a copy of his speech survived the war. Ich werde daher den Juden gegenüber grundsätzlich nur von der Erwartung ausgehen, dass sie verschwinden. Sie müssen weg. Aber was soll mit den Juden geschehen? Glauben Sie, man wird sie im Ostland in Siedlungsdörfern unterbringen? Man hat uns in Berlin gesagt, Liquidiert sie selber. Diese Juden können wir nicht erschießen. Werden aber doch Eingriffe vornehmen müssen, die irgendwie zu einem Vernichtungserfolg führen. In January 1942, the first selections were made for Jews to be deported from the Lobs Ghetto. 
We did not want to leave, or most people in the ghetto did not want to leave, because you figured the misery you knew would be better than the misery you didn't know. The selected Jews were taken here to Herbert Langer's new improvised extermination facility at Helmina. Jews from the immediate area had been the first to die here a few weeks before. The Nazis blew up the large house which was the center of the killing operations in order to hide evidence of their crime. This is one of the few photos that remain of the house itself. But evidence gathered after the war allows a picture to be constructed of what the Nazis did here. The Jews from Lodz were told to undress. They were then pushed down a corridor in the basement of the house, up a ramp and into a small windowless chamber. Doors were then slammed behind them. They'd been locked in the back of a van. These vans had been invented two years earlier to kill mentally ill people by cramming them in the sealed rear cargo area and then gassing them with carbon monoxide. Now Lange and other Nazis used their own initiative to adapt this killing method to murder Jews. They made gas vans central to the new killing operations here at Helmer. There's a lot of screaming. How terribly they screamed. It was impossible to bear. We could hear the screams, but we couldn't see the people. They were loaded in and murdered there. It was hell. That's why we called these mans hell mans. Hell mans. When I saw it going, I'd say, the hell's going. The vans carrying the bodies of the Jews who had been gassed were driven two miles through remote country roads to a nearby forest and buried in a clearing. Many of the Germans who worked here at Helmno believed what they were doing was perfectly legal. As the post-court testimony of Kurt Mobius, one of the SS guards, reveals. <laughs> dass die Befehle zur Vernichtung der Juden von Hitler und Himmler kamen. Und wir waren als Polizeibeamte so gedrillt, dass wir alle Befehle der Staatsführung als rechtmäßig ansahen. Damals glaubte ich, dass die Juden nicht unschuldig, sondern schuldig waren. Das hat uns die Propaganda doch immer wieder eingebläut, dass alle Juden Verbrecher und Untermenschen sind. Und dass sie schuld waren an Deutschlands Niedergang nach dem Ersten Weltkrieg. Motivated by such anti-Semitic delusions, the Germans created here at Helmner the first systematic process for the mass gassing of the Jews. But up to now, local Nazi killing operations like this didn't seem to be part of a fully developed strategy. That was to be resolved on the 20th of January 1942 at an infamous meeting on the banks of the Wannsee, on the outskirts of Berlin. The meeting was called to coordinate the extermination of the Jews, the Nazis' so-called final solution. Sturmanführer Lange hat auf diesem Gebiet umfangreiche praktische Erfahrungen sammeln können. It was made plain to all the various government and Nazi officials that attended that the SS was firmly in control of the process. Chaired by Reinhard Heydrich of the SS, with Adolf Eichmann taking the minutes, a crucial statement of principle was declared advancing. All of the Jews under Nazi control were to die. Many of them worked to death. Im Zuge der Entlösung der Judenfrage ist zunächst einmal geplant, dass die Juden im Osten zum Arbeitsansatz kommen. Ein Großteil wird dabei schon durch natürliche Verminderung ausfallen. Der verbleibende Restbestand wird entsprechend behandelt werden müssen.
In ghettos like Lodz, the Nazis were pursuing the policy, as Heidrich put it, of eliminating a proportion of Jews through work and then dealing with the rest appropriately. The food was not enough to sustain life. There was no milk, there was no meat, there was no food, there was nothing. The local Jews wanted to trade against a pair of shoes or anything else that we had. My mother traded a silk blouse for some butter and bread. In the ghetto, everything was paid for. You had to have somebody's shoulders to stand on or protection, which meant connections. And that's how life, how business was conducted. You do me a favor, I do you a favor. You really couldn't trust anybody, because if I would tell a co-worker something, she would use it for her advantage. You had to be very careful. There was a lot of backstabbing and you can understand why. It was a matter of life and death. But that was given life. This is what, what life had done to human beings. Whether they were the same before the war, I doubt it very much. One of the most disturbing aspects of how the Nazis ran the ghettos is the way they forced the Jewish leadership to make many life and death decisions, like how the inadequate supply of food and jobs should be distributed. Unlike the vast majority of Jewish ghetto leaders, the chairman of the Council of Elders in Lodz, Mordechai Heim Runkowski, exploited his position of power. I had heard rumors, and I knew that he had a vile temper. If he got angry, he would take his cane and hit you. On occasion, Runkowski used the deportations to remove those who opposed him, and he abused his authority in other ways. I was alone in the office and he would pull up a chair and we had a couple of conversations. He talked, I would listen and he molested me. I kept moving away and he kept moving closer and it was a, it was a frightening relationship. It was... A, Lunkowski did, did took a lot of advantage of, of the of the young women, uh, 15, 16, 18, 20, and quite good looking girls. We all been in the dining room, let's say there, or he just come took a hand around her and just walk out with her. And it, I saw that. Not anybody told me that, but I saw that. Runkowski sexually abused Lucille Eichel Green for several months. Only after the office where she worked was closed did she escape his attentions. I felt disgusted and I felt angry. But if I would have run away, he would have had me deported. I mean, that was very clear. The ghetto left a permanent mark. It showed humanity at its best and at its worst. It made me what I am today. We all sustained damage 
um, during those years. Eventually, when the ghetto was liquidated, Romkowski and his family suffered the same fate as 200,000 other Lodz ghetto Jews. They were murdered by the Nazis. In early 1942, Auschwitz, unlike Kamnau and the Lodz ghetto, was only playing a minor part in the Nazis' final solution. Since September 1941, Hearst and his colleagues had been experimenting with the use of Zyklon B, prussic acid, to kill Soviet prisoners of war and the sick in the crematorium of the camp, just yards from his office. Next to the ovens of the crematorium was the mortuary. The SS used it as an improvised gas chamber. A small number of Jews from the local area selected as unfit to work had also been killed here beginning in the autumn of 1941. But it was soon clear to Hearst and his SS colleagues that this was not an ideal location to commit mass murder as Polish political prisoner Józef Paczynski witnessed. I went into the attic of that building. I stood on a crate or something. I lifted a roof tile and I could see everything that was going on right there in front of me. And they were very polite with those people. Very polite. Undress, pack your things here, this here, that there. A man of the man climbed onto the flat roof of the building. He put on a gas mask, opened a hatch, and dropped the powder in. When he did this, in spite of the fact that these walls were very thick, you could hear a great scream from within, despite the thick walls. This took place at lunchtime, in the daytime. In order to stifle the screaming, they had two motorcycles standing on the pavement near the crematorium. Engines revved up as far as they could go to stifle the scream. To cover up the yelling, they had these engines going, but they failed. They gave it a try, but it didn't work. The screaming lasted for 15 or 20 minutes. It became weaker and weaker, then went quiet. These horrors were only the beginning. During the spring of 1942, Jews from outside Poland were deported to Auschwitz for the very first time. They came from one of the Nazis' closest allies. And the story of how these Jews came to be on trains to Auschwitz is one of the most shocking and surprising in the history of the Nazis' final solution. People on these trains were from Slovakia, many from the capital, Bratislava. Slovakia was a new country, created only in 1939, and the majority of the Slovaks were now fiercely nationalistic.
priest. And the Prime Minister, Wojciech Tuka, was also deeply religious. They had implemented a series of anti-Semitic measures, chiefly born of religious and cultural intolerance. And at the forefront of tormenting the Jewish population were the nationalist Flinker Guard. A Jew would never go to work. None of them worked. They only wanted to have an easy life. Our people were happy to receive their stores. We called it Aryanizing them. And that's how they became rich. Before the war, Slovakia had a thriving Jewish community of around 90,000. Now they were under direct threat. When the Nazis asked for forced laborers, the Slovakian authorities offered up 20,000 Jews and their families. But early in 1942, conflict arose between the Germans and the Slovaks. The Nazis, lacking the necessary extermination capacity, at first didn't want to accept anyone who couldn't work. In early 1942, a meeting was arranged at the Foreign Ministry in Bratislava to try and resolve the dispute. SS Captain Dieter Wieslitzeni arrived to meet with Prime Minister Tuka and a Slovakian official, Dr. Kosen. After the war, both Wieslitzeni and Kosen gave evidence of what was discussed here. Herr Dr. Kosen hat mit Ihnen unseren um Vorschlag gesprochen. Das Angebot der 20.000 jüdischen Arbeiter. Könnte es sein, Herr Ministerpräsident, dass hier neben dem christlichen Mitgefühl auch materielle Beweggründe eine Rolle spielen? Wir bekommen die Arbeitskräfte und sie müssen sich dann um den Unterhalt der Familien kümmern. Aber soweit ich es beurteilen kann, fehlen uns die Unterbringungsmöglichkeiten für arbeitsunfähige Juden. Es würden uns hier Kosten entstehen, die durch keine zu erwartende Arbeitsleistung gedeckt werden. Was Kosten betreffen, können wir bestimmt zu einer Einigung kommen. Heißt das, dass Sie die Kosten tragen würden? Lass mich mal wieder sehen. Reden Sie erst einmal mit Oberschimmer Peter Eichmann. Back in Berlin, a deal was brokered. As this document proves, the Slovakian foreign ministry agreed to pay the Nazis 500 Reichsmark for each Jew deported. The Slovaks thus offered to pay the Nazis to take their Jews away. For most of the Slovakian Jews, their journey began with imprisonment at a holding camp like this one outside Bratislava. Once in these camps, the Slovakian Jews were under the total control of the Flinka guards. Some of those soldiers were really stupid. For example, they deliberately crept there, so we had to clean up that with our hands. They called us Jewish whores, they kicked us, they behaved really badly. They also told us we would teach you Jews how to work. But poor women, we used to work. And later, when the Jews were coming to the camps, we used to take their belongings and clothes. The deputy commander came and said to us to go and choose from the clothes. I took some clothes. Others did as well. And then I took three pairs of shoes. Everyone took what he could. 
I wrapped it all with a rope and brought it back home. We, the guards, were doing quite well. Within months of the start of the deportations, Mikhail Kabach became aware of the likely fate of the Slovakian Jews. How could you personally participate in the deportation knowing those people were certainly going to die? What could I have done? I was thinking both ways. I thought, it will be peace and quiet here. You deserved it. But on the other hand, there were innocent people among them as well. I was thinking both ways. The deportation of Jewish families from Slovakia began in April 1942 and lasted for the next seven months. Altogether, around 60,000 Jews were handed over to the Germans. Fifty miles away at his house just outside Auschwitz concentration camp, where he lived with his wife and four children. Good old the plans from the new camp at Birkenau had changed. Soviet prisoners of war were to be sent as forced laborers elsewhere. Hers now knew that Jews were central to the future of Auschwitz. And it was here in a remote corner of the site at Birkenau two miles away from the main camp, that Hurs and other members of the SS had found a location for new makeshift gas chambers. In this field stood a Polish cottage, which would come to be known as the Little Red House, or Bunker One. Hurs and his SS comrades saw this as a step forward in the killing process at Auschwitz. Two separate gas chambers were quickly improvised, by breaking up the windows and door and creating two new entrances. Unlike in the crematorium in the main camp, people could be murdered here in relative secrecy. In this shabby cottage, tens of thousands of people would be murdered. The manner of killing remained the same. Jews would be told they were to take a shower, they would be locked in the room, and Zyklon B thrown in through a hatch in the wall. Within weeks, the Nazis had converted another nearby cottage, the Little White House, in just the same way. Slovakian Jews arrived at the railway stop two miles from the gas chambers on the 29th of April, 1942 and faced selection by the SS. This was to be the first of hundreds of SS selections. When they opened the train carriages and forced us out, they shouted at us immediately. They were screaming in German. They were SS men who were dealing with us. We had to stand in line. Men had to step up first, then women with children, and then old people. I looked at my father here, and I saw a sad look on his face. This is my last memory of him. The Slovakian Jews selected to die were taken up past the newly built buildings of Birkenau and towards the isolated gas chambers of the Little Red House and the Little White House. When we were returning from work, we saw people being brought over. They waited there the whole day. They sat there, they still had food from home, and SS men were around them with dogs. 
They didn't know what was going to happen to them. After the war, while he awaited trial, Rudolf Hurst wrote about the process of murder in the converted cottages in the spring of 1942. It was most important that the whole business of arriving and undressing should take place in an atmosphere of the greatest possible calm. Small children usually cried because of the strangeness of being undressed in this way, but when their mothers or members of the Jewish Sonder Commando comforted them, they became calm and entered the gas chambers playing or joking with one another and carrying their toys. Hundreds of men and women in the full bloom of life walked all unsuspecting to their death in the gas chambers under the blossom-laden fruit trees of the orchard. This picture of death in the midst of life remains with me to this day. I looked upon them as enemies of our people. The reasons behind the extermination program seem to me right. After the gassing, Hearst and the SS made other Jewish prisoners load the bodies onto trucks and wheel them down a makeshift railway line towards giant pits. Otto Pressburger was one of the prisoners forced to dispose of the bodies. We were digging holes. And in the beginning, we really didn't know what they were for. It was only when the holes were deep enough that we started to throw the bodies into them. This was appalling. New bodies were lying here every morning, and we had to bury them. When summer came, everything started to rot. This was terrible. The majority of the people working here were from my home city of Trunava. I knew all of them, and every day there were less and less of them. They must still be buried around here somewhere. My brother and my father are buried here as well, you know. By the summer of 1942, Hurst and his colleagues at Auschwitz had discovered how to murder thousands. But their improvised methods of killing could not keep pace with the demands of their masters, who, in pursuit of the Nazis' final solution, dreamt of eliminating many millions. During the next few months, Hearst and his colleagues overcame all obstacles and created buildings which would have looked like this, where murder could be committed on a massive scale. And as they did so, the Nazis also began to scour the whole of Europe for ever more people to bring here and kill.
the Nazis for the first time began to comb the countries of Western Europe in pursuit of their final solution, the extermination of the Jews. Even taking Jews from as far afield as the Channel Islands. By higher order, even those family members dependent on you shall be evacuated. And we never saw her again or heard anything about what had happened to her for 50 years. I mean, it's incredible. When I knew that, that she died in Auschwitz, I mean, we were, we were hot, you know, just so upset and horrified. But as the Nazis at Auschwitz and the other camps in occupied Poland were to discover, it was one thing to conceive of mass killing on an epic scale, quite another to be able to carry it out. And how they solved this murderous problem tells us much about their mentality. In 1942, through a horrific process of trial and error, these Nazis created something entirely new in history. Killing factories capable of murdering millions. The first Jews sent from Western Europe to Auschwitz were from France. French authorities themselves. On the 2nd of July 1942, an important meeting was held between the SS and senior figures from the French police to discuss the mass deportations. The minutes taken by an SS official reveal that initially the French proposed cooperating with the Nazis only to a limited extent. La France, euh... Par contre, des arrestations de juifs par la police française dans les pays gênant. Si le gouvernement français est opposé à ces arrestations, il est certain qu'il n'aurait pas la sympathie de Führer. The French authorities knew that if they didn't cooperate, they faced the anger of the Germans. But they didn't want to hand over French Jews. So this was their solution. Puis-je vous faire une proposition Nous sommes prêts à arrêter autant de juifs que vous voudrez dans toute la France, y compris dans la zone occupée, mais seulement des juifs de nationalité étrangère. Bon, ce serait au moins un premier pas. The French authorities, having decided to hand over foreign Jews, organized the first roundup for the early morning of the 16th of July, 1942. In the 20th arrondissement of Paris, French police paid a visit to the Mullers, originally from Poland. Le 
matin, on a été réveillé très très In the morning, we were very violently woken by knocks on the door. And I saw my mother on her knees on the ground, with her arms around the legs of two police. Elle suppliait. She was begging them to leave us. De, de, de nous laisser. She was begging them. She was screaming and crying. Elle pleurait. Et and I saw the policemen, well, the inspectors, who were pushing her back with their feet, saying, hurry up. Hurry up. Don't make us waste our time. Taken away by the French police that morning were Annette Muller, her youngest brother Michel, and her mother. I remember we were a bit frightened because it was so early in the morning. They told us to take three days worth of food. I seem to remember they said for three days, but that didn't worry me. It wasn't so much that I trusted my country's police, but rather that I completely trusted my mother. They were taken to a camp much like this one, filled with foreigners, many of whom had previously fled to France in an attempt to escape Nazi persecution. I wasn't really that worried. All I was thinking about was going back for the start of term. I was wondering what's going to happen, but I was sure we'd be back for the first day of school. That was my main concern. Yeah. In the early days of the deportations, the Nazis' immediate request was just for Jewish adults, who would then be worked to death. So Adolf Eichmann of the SS, who was organizing the deportations, did not initially give permission for the children to be sent east with their parents. So in early August 1942, at the camp at bourne la hollande the French police broke up the families. Les policiers Police beat the women back while we children were holding onto their clothing. They sprayed us with water. And there were some very small children there. I remember people crying. Then, all of a sudden, when the vehicle with the mounted machine gun arrived, there was a silence, a terrible silence. My mother was in the first row of the women. Et avec ses yeux, elle nous saluait. And she signaled to us with her eyes. Michelle was crying. We were watching her. And that's the last image I have of my mother. Because then they took the women away and we children were left alone. Over the next few weeks, the children who had been taken from their parents were yeah, in this segment I have to do a voiceover because uh, uh, I came into some copyright issues with uh, UMX or something, some sound stuff in this video. It's actually a shame because it kind of ruins it a little bit. Uh, but anyway, as you can see, I am working with uh, the background in this painting. And I do what I usually do. I go for directions and uh, and just um, adding. You can see what I'm doing now. You can see, yeah, there I put in the light, and then I probably will go um, horizontal after that. Usually I do to create some kind of a. Yeah, you see, I create some some other direction to create some texture in the in the light and that is a way to do it because if you only drag it down it kind of becomes a very um, plastic and uh, I figure despite that you would believe that since the frame there in the background is actually going down you would actually just drag it down and many people do you see there I did it but then I probably go the other way again to even out that um, thing uh, 
it is basically a way of building a sculpture. I sort of drag it down there and I probably, I haven't seen this segment in a long time, but I probably will now go the other way again, as you see here, to shake it up and give it more texture. And that is so important to understand these things that you don't, you don't just paint what you see, you have to paint the substance and the texture of what you see. Um, this is a thing that takes a few years to understand, but when you understand it, you will understand it very good. And um, yeah, uh, there again, I first I just paint it, then I drag it down and go for the go for the um, directions and uh, I just keep on doing that over and over and over and over again until it just becomes exactly what I want it to become yeah it's uh, some process I'm so glad I actually was able to paint this painting he died basically a year after this and he was so pleased with this painting you can see that in the, the event where he talks about uh, Auschwitz and his stay there how was to come back to Norway and his life after Auschwitz and he left a legacy and he left a lot of grandchildren and children and now this painting is to be seen at the Norwegian Holocaust Center and I really uh, love the thought that I was able to give him this painting. And uh, it was a really a good day of my career. Probably the best until now, anyway. It's, it's also one of my absolute best paintings to date. And uh, But I will try to top it during my lifetime. And uh, I hope you stick with me. and watch my videos and i hope to see you in the next video um, i also recommend to go you to go to into description and see the original uh, videos of Auschwitz, the Auschwitz uh, series six episodes it's really brilliant and uh, it puts us into perspective so with this, now uh, back to the original file, I guess, from about now. Okay. Testify to the scenes on arrival here at the ramp. Still fewer who were members of the SS. But shortly after the French children arrived, SS Private Oscar Groning began work at Auschwitz. It was not long before I was assigned to supervise the luggage collection of an incoming transport. When this was over, it was just like a fairground. There was lots of rubbish left. And amongst this rubbish were ill people, those unable to walk. And the way these people were treated really horrified me. For example, a child who was lying there naked was simply pulled by the legs and chucked into a lorry to be driven away. And when it screamed like a sick chicken, then they bashed it against the edge of the lorry, so it shut up. The children from France were transported just under two miles from the ramp up to the camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau and on to one of two cottages in the far corner of the complex. Here the Nazis had improvised gas chambers. The children were locked in a room that would have looked like this and crystals of the poisonous insecticide Zyklon B thrown in through a hatch high in the wall. 
More than 4,000 children were sent without their parents from France to Auschwitz. Every single one of them died. And in the autumn of 1942, Oskar Groning believed that this appalling crime was justifiable. We were convinced by our worldview that we had been betrayed by the entire world and that there was a great conspiracy of the Jews against us. But surely when it comes to children, you must have realized that they couldn't possibly have done anything to you. The children, they're not the enemy at the moment. The enemy is the blood inside them. The enemy is the growing up to be a Jew that could become dangerous. And because of that, the children were included as well. While Oskar Kroning certainly subscribed at the time to the Nazi delusion of a world Jewish conspiracy, he did not take part directly in the killing. Nor did he want to remain at Auschwitz. Documents confirm he later applied for a transfer to the front, which was refused. So he carried on working at the main camp two miles southeast of Auschwitz-Birkenau. His job here was to sort out and count the money stolen from the arriving transport of Jews and to organize its transfer to Berlin. While the main motivation for the final solution was ideological, the Nazis were also well aware that they could benefit financially from the crime. During 1942, around 200,000 Jews were sent to Auschwitz from all over Europe, from France, Holland, Belgium, Yugoslavia, Poland, the Czech lands, Slovakia, Austria and Germany. About 70% of them were murdered immediately upon arrival. Before they had been taken away, they had been told by the Nazis to leave behind their money and belongings for safekeeping. In my job as administrator of these foreign currencies, I saw practically all the currencies of the world. Believe it or not, I saw them from the Italian Lira, to Spanish pesetas, to Hungarian and Mexican currencies, from dollars to the English pound. And perhaps Oscar Groning dealt with English pounds because of what happened here in the Channel Islands. 900 miles from Auschwitz geographically, but by any other measure, light years away. The Channel Islands were famous before the war as a gentle and friendly holiday destination. The Potts family from Kent travelled to the Channel Islands in 1939. With them was their nanny, Teresa Steiner, who had sought safety in Britain from growing anti-Semitism in her homeland, Austria. We uh, got to love her, really, because we, we saw a lot of her. I mean, she was with us all the time, really, and um, especially in the Channel Islands, it was like having two mothers, really. In spring 1940, when the Potts family decided to return to England, the Channel Islands authorities followed Home Office guidelines and refused to let Teresa go with them. As an Austrian, they classed her as an enemy alien. Although my mother pleaded with them, they came the next day and took her away. And in fact, we never saw her again. I think there were anti-Semitic people there. There, were, there was, should I tell you something about this man who's, who actually said to my mother, if you must trail Jewesses about after you, what do you expect? So she told me, which is pretty disgusting. With the Berliner Inseln, Guernsey and Jersey, have Deutsche Truppen zum ersten Mal englischen Boden betreten. This meant that Teresa was trapped in the Channel Islands when the Germans invaded in the summer of 1940. German propaganda made much of the cooperative attitude of many of the Channel Islanders, including the famed British Bobbies. Three of them? Great. That's all men. And it was the police on Guernsey that organized the registration of Jews on the island, 
at the Germans' behest. A total of four Jews registered on Guernsey, 12 on the neighboring island of Jersey. One of the Jews who registered on Guernsey in the autumn of 1940 was Theresa Steiner. Like the others, her card was marked with a red J. Eighteen months afterwards, in April 1942, three foreign Jews on Guernsey, Augusta Spitz, Marianne Grünfeld and Theresa herself, were summoned to the central police station on the island. By higher order, Theresa's appointment was with Sergeant Ernest Pellin. You'll have to appear on the 21st April 1942 at 1900 at the Weybridge at St. Peter Port. You have to take with you this order, together with papers proving your identity. You should fit yourself with warm clothes and provisions, but your luggage must not be heavier than you can carry. I have still got a picture in my mind of us taking her down to the White Rock. Two of us went down with her, and I think we must have taken the suitcase on a bike. We don't get to know this one does. And um, uh, we stood there saying goodbye and seeing her go through the, this gateway in the valley and waving as she went, and that was it. It was all a mystery where had she gone? And we sort of hoped that she would come back, but eventually she didn't. It was all outside our experience, really, wasn't it? And things like that didn't happen in England. Neither the authorities in Guernsey nor in France knew that the Jews they handed over were to be murdered. But they did know all too well how much the Nazis hated the Jews. After a few weeks in France, the three women deported from Guernsey were arrested during the roundups of July 1942 and transported to Auschwitz. All three of them died there. that the three deportees from Guernsey arrived at Auschwitz. Heinrich Himmler, one of the leading figures behind the Nazis' program of mass murder, visited the camp. By now there were about 30,000 prisoners in Auschwitz, most of them either Jews or Polish political prisoners. Himmler inspected the huge expansion of the camp complex. The main camp, the extension at Birkenau, and the building of the giant synthetic rubber factory at nearby Monowitz. He even witnessed the murder of Jews in one of the gas chambers of Auschwitz, a portion of his itinerary omitted from the photographic record of his visit. Himmler was pleased with what he'd seen so much so that he immediately promoted the commandant of the camp. Rudolf Huss, the man who oversaw all this horror, was made SS Lieutenant Colonel. Mein Obersturmbeinführer. Huss had created a comfortable life for himself and his family at Auschwitz. They all lived together in a house on the edge of the main camp. But life for prisoners here on the other side of the wire, inside the main camp, was a struggle against starvation, disease, and appalling physical abuse. A battle Kazimierz Piechowski fought every day. I was very healthy, very strong. And this helped me in the camp because even if someone was young, if he was a mummy's boy, he had no chance. You had to be hard. You had to have a strong will to say to yourself, I must survive. 
And in order to ensure his survival, in the summer of 1942, Kazimierz Piechowski attempted one of the most daring escapes in the history of Auschwitz. On Saturday the 20th of June, Piechowski and three other Polish political prisoners walked out of the gate of the main camp towards their normal place of work a few hundred meters away. Unnoticed, they managed to break into a storeroom where the SS kept their uniform supplies, guns and ammunition. They quickly dressed themselves as SS. They planned not to use the guns they took to shoot any Germans, knowing that the retribution which would then be taken on the rest of the inmates in the camp would be horrific. Instead, if they were stopped at the final checkpoint on the outside perimeter, they planned to kill themselves. Because one of the prisoners also worked in the SS garage, which was closed because it was a weekend, they also managed to steal a car. They were taking a massive risk, one on which their very lives depended. The problem was whether they would let us through without a pass, without documents, without anything. Or we believed, yes, they would. We still have 80 meters to go, but Gnek has already reduced the engine to 70 meters because the barrier is down. We had 50 meters to go. The barrier is still down. And then we have literally 15 meters to the barrier. I switched off and I'm thinking, it's time to kill ourselves, just as we'd agree. And at that moment I got a thump on my back. The music is hissing in my ear. Kaji, do something. I came to my senses. That's right. They're counting on me. Oni na mnie liczą. You could say it was euphoria. We were all pleased. We were young, free, armed. We realized that it wouldn't be easy to get us back into that hell, into Auschwitz. Weeks after Piechowski's successful escape, Hurst, like other commandants, received notice of the extreme displeasure of the SS inspector of concentration camps. Security had to be improved, especially given what was to come. That's a very big problem. For in the summer of 1942, Himmler issued a secret order of great significance for Polish Jews, many of whom were imprisoned here in the Warsaw Ghetto. On the 19th of July, Himmler decreed that all Polish Jews in the huge surrounding area the Nazis called the General Government should be resettled, by which he meant murdered, by the end of 1942. This amounted to some two million people, hundreds of thousands in the Warsaw Ghetto alone. Himmler did not use Auschwitz to murder so many people so quickly, but turned to more recent creations, places which, unlike Auschwitz, were pure factories of death. What would become the most deadly of them all was situated here, 60 miles northeast of Warsaw. About 900,000 people were killed at Treblinka. It was second only to Auschwitz as the most murderous place in the Nazi state. All that's left today is a clearing in a forest.
This secret place was destroyed by the Nazis before the war was over. But thanks to evidence from eyewitnesses, it's possible to reconstruct the plan of the camp. It was a place very different from Auschwitz-Birkenau. Treblinka was, by comparison, tiny. 400 meters by 600. Treblinka was small because it only had one purpose. Murder. 99% of Jews were dead within two hours of arriving at the camp. Poisoned by exhaust fumes in Treblinka's gas chambers. I'll never forget what I saw, not till my dying day. Those little children, those people, what did they ever do to anyone? What did they ever do? It was a terrible thing. During the early weeks of the camp's operation, there was utter chaos. The gas chambers broke down. Arriving trains were kept waiting for days, and hundreds of bodies lay around unburied. The decomposing human corpses caused such a stench. It was just terrible. You couldn't go out into the yard. No way could you open a window or go outside. The situation at Treblinka was spiraling out of control. Which is why at the end of August 1942, senior SS officers travelled towards the camp. We know who they were and what was said because of the later testimony of SS Sergeant Josef Oberhauser, who witnessed it all. The officers were Christian Wirth, who had been appointed inspector of the death camps and his superior SS Major General Odilo Globochnik. For the Commandant of Treblinka, Dr. Ilfried Ebel, your yeah. visit brought disturbing news. Oberstromführer, der SS und Polizeiführer ist hier. Wie bitte? SS und Polizeiführer Goloschnik in Begleitung von Polizeihauptmann Wirt. Wirt auch? Kommen Sie sofort. Brigadeführer? The Nazi leadership had embarked upon their program of mass killing with minimal preparation. As they saw it, they could solve any problems that were created as they went along. And the bloody chaos of Dr. Abel's Treblinka had become a problem. Oberstromführer, Sie sind mit sofortiger Wirkung Ihres Postens enthoben. Bis Ihr Nachfolger seinen Posten antritt, werde ich mich persönlich darum kümmern, dass hier Ordnung in den Laden kommt. Aber... Dr. Eber? Ja? Wenn Sie nicht ein österreichischer Arztmann wären, würde ich Sie sofort einsperren lassen und vor ein SS- und Polizeigericht bringen lassen. As Major General Globochnik saw it, Abel's crime was not that he had committed mass murder, but that he had not pursued the killings with efficiency and in secret. At Auschwitz, Hurst faced the same difficulty that had confronted Dr. Abel at Treblinka, disposing of thousands upon thousands of bodies. At first, he had them buried in this large field. But in the heat of the summer, they putrefied. So special units of Jewish prisoners were ordered to exhume them. We had to take the bodies out and burn them. A big fire was made here with wood and petrol. And we were throwing them right into it. There were always two of us throwing the bodies in. One holding the legs and one on the arms. The smell and the stench was terrible. The bodies were not only bloody but rotten as well. We were given some rags to put over our faces.
The SS men were constantly drinking vodka or cognac or something else from their bottles. They couldn't cope with it either. It was terrible. It was terrible. One can never forget it. It should not have happened. I'm here now to make sure that history will not forget what happened here. That people were killed here. That they were burned and killed here. They were killed worse than animals. Worse. In order to make Auschwitz a more efficient killing factory, Hearst had sought advice from the SS expert in body disposal. In September 1942, Hearst made a special journey to a remote area of Poland near the small village of Helmdorf. We know the purpose of his visit and what was said from Hearst's own memoirs and from other testimony. Hearst wanted to meet SS Colonel Paul Blobel and examine firsthand his new field cremation units. Und Herr Sturmführer, Sie machen die Skizze, wie besprochen. Wir haben zunächst versucht, die Leichen mit Thermitbomben zu beseitigen. Aber das ist uns nur sehr unvollständig gelungen und hat außerdem einen Waldbrand verursacht. Ein Waldbrand? Ja. Diese Anlage funktioniert dagegen sehr gut, wenn man auf dem Rost abwechselnd Leichen und Holz übereinander schichtet. Interessant. Ja. Angefeuert wird mit Benzinrückständen. It was this willingness to overcome the practical difficulties of mass murder that helped the Nazis pursue Himmler's dream to murder millions of Polish Jews by the end of 1942. In the wake of Himmler's order of the 19th of July, roundups were held in hundreds of towns and villages. But the deportations in Poland did not always go the way the Nazis wanted. The Jews of Przemysl in the summer of 1942 heard a rumor that it was shortly to be their turn to be deported. The ghetto had been sealed on the 15th of July. Now, less than two weeks later, the SS wanted to transport the Jews to their deaths. At the German army headquarters in Przemysl, Lieutenant Albert Battle heard the news of the impending deportations. Before the war, Battle, who was trained as a lawyer, had been in trouble with Nazi party officials because he had been decent and polite towards Jews. Now he was furious about the planned SS operation against the Jews of Przemysl. On the 26th of July, Battle gathered trucks together and drove up to the ghetto to take away the Jews who worked for the army. He had the support of his superiors in the German army to resist the deportation. They were anxious not to lose their source of Jewish forced labor. <laughs> Once Battle arrived, he harangued the guards on duty. 
he threatened to force entry by requesting that a platoon of soldiers be sent. I'm on it. It was obvious to the guards on duty outside the ghetto. Mattel wasn't going to give up lightly. My love. We well, had to have guards to do that. To get trucks into the ghetto and get out the Jews. It wasn't, it wasn't a thing, you know, than the average German would do. Everybody thought that this is a heroic thing to do. He was a very nice human being. He was a lawyer, well, you know, between, between lawyers, they're good lawyers and bad lawyers. Battle even sheltered many of the Jews in the basement of the army headquarters. Shortly after hiding the Jews, he was transferred from his post. A secret investigation into the incident by the SS reached Himmler, who noted that Battle should be arrested after the war and expelled from the Nazi party. In 1981, nearly 30 years after his death, Battle was awarded the title Righteous Among the Nations at Yad Vashem here in Israel. A tree planted in his honor grows in Yad Vashem's Garden of the Righteous, a reminder that not every German, when called upon, participated in the Nazis' final solution. But for every Lieutenant Albert Battle, there were countless more willing perpetrators. And one of the most enthusiastic worked here at Treblinka. By the end of 1942, the new commandant Franz Stangl had overseen the transformation of the camp. The Nazis' journey at Treblinka to perfect a large-scale method of killing had finally been completed. Gone was the chaos of Dr. Ebel's rule. Now Stangl ran a death camp whose true purpose was even hidden from unsuspecting new arrivals. There were flowers planted on the ground. And of course, people couldn't imagine where they were. They painted the huts and put up all sorts of signs as if it was a real railway station. I remember that once one of them said these words, I'll never forget these words, I said it in German, come quickly because the water is getting cold. That's how far they went. The manner in which it worked is macabre and it was a horrible thing to see. At the core of the camp, Steinl helped create a huge new gas chamber complex disguised as shower rooms, with the capacity to kill over 3,000 people at one time. Until recently, no one knew exactly how many people were murdered during 1942 in death camps like Treblinka. But a few years ago, the text of an intercepted German cable was discovered which reveals that between them, the camps of Treblinka, Sobibor, Belzec, and Maidnek had murdered 1,274,166 people during 1942. The intercept contains a number of typing errors, but in order to reach this total, the number killed at Treblinka has to be 713,555. Treblinka was thus the largest killing center in the Nazi state but not for long.
because planners at Auschwitz had been working hard to change the function of new crematoria which were to be built at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Die Dreiteilung des Leichenkellers 3 ist ja schon länger vorgesehen. Ja, wirklich neu ist eigentlich nur der Verzicht auf die Leichenrutsche, die hier geplant war. Zwischen Leichenkeller 1 und 2. Over several months, the plans were altered. What had been conceived as basement mortuaries were converted. First, a chute designed to allow bodies to be slid down into the basement was suddenly removed from the plans. Next, extra steps were added at the side of the building. A strange addition, since the original function of the basement was to hold the dead, not the living. Then the doors into one of the large underground mortuaries were altered. First, to open outwards and then reformed as one single door, reinforced and made gas tight and with a peephole added. This basement mortuary was now to become a gas chamber. Auschwitz was one of the last camps with large capacity killing factories. But when they opened in the spring of 1943, they would mark the beginning of that phase of the camp's operation that would make the place infamous in history. A moment of transition symbolized by the arrival of a new member of the Auschwitz medical staff. A man who had just been injured fighting on the Eastern Front and who had won the Iron Cross for bravery. Und zwei, und den verwundeten Abzeichen an His name was to become notorious. Wie war noch gleich der Name? Mengele. Dr. Josef Mengele. Freut mich, Dr. Mengele. Auf gute Zusammenarbeit. Auschwitz was about to enter the most crucial phase of its existence. One that would eventually make it the site of the largest mass murder in the world. Zwischen Leichenkeller 1 und 2. In March 1943, new gas chambers and crematoria opened, increasing dramatically the killing potential of the camp. Enormous wealth stolen from the arriving Jews flooded through Auschwitz. And contrary to the direct orders of the Nazi leadership, individual members of the SS took great personal advantage. They were taking home lots of gold and other valuables. Nobody counted it. It was a bonanza for them. This is the surprising and shocking story of life and death at Auschwitz. During what for the Nazis at the camp was the start of the boom years of how corruption pervaded all aspects of the extermination process and why for many of the SS, life was good. The special situation at Auschwitz led to friendships of which I'm still saying today, I like to look back on with joy.
Auschwitz's main camp was on the banks of the Sola River in southern Poland. And it was here that the Commandant SS Lieutenant Colonel Rudolf Huss worked hand in hand with businessmen to grow a giant industrial complex. The Wirtschaftsverwaltung's Hauptamtvereinbart sollten sie uns umgehende Lageplan des jetzigen Lagers zu senden. Ultimately, about 60 million Reichsmark, 125 million pounds in today's money, would be generated here for the Nazi state. For there was not one Auschwitz camp, but many. Eventually, there were 45 subcamps dotted around the region, most providing slave labor for armaments factories and other industrial concerns. And at the center of this web of slave labor and industry, of Auschwitz-Birkenau. The vast Auschwitz complex was now a self-contained universe. A place to live. A place to work. A place to die. At the heart of Birkenau were the gas chambers all of which were later destroyed by the Nazis. Selections were made from arriving transports of Jews. Those thought fit enough were taken away to be worked to death. The remainder, the old, the weak, the children, were murdered immediately in buildings like these. that they were starting to understand that something was funny going on there but nobody could do anything with the process had to go you know they had everything was done from the German point of view they were all precise they were the people screaming the, the Germans screaming schnell schnell The Jews were forced to undress in a room that would have looked like this, and then forced further down the building until they would take a shower. Could you imagine what, what was done with the children and the, their families, the thing? They, they didn't know what to do, scratching the walls, crying until the, the, the gas take effect. When everything stopped, you know, and they opened, opened the doors, and I see these people I saw a few minutes, half an hour later, before that they were going in, I see them all standing up, some black and blue from the gas, no place where to go, dead. A few hundred yards from the gas chambers was the area of the camp known as Canada, because Canada was thought to be a land of untold riches. This is where the belongings snatched from the arriving transports were sorted before being repacked and sent back to Germany. For the inmates, working in Canada was one of the few sought-after jobs in the camp. Working in Canada saved my life because they had food, we got water, and that was the best working unit for life for us because we were not beaten. The majority of inmates who worked in Canada were women. They could grow their hair and were able to snatch extra food from the belongings as they sorted them. Against the explicit rules of the SS, Friendly relationships could develop in Canada between the German guards and the women prisoners. Helena Zitronova, 
a Slovakian Jew who'd been sent to Auschwitz in 1942, became the object of attention of one of the SS who worked in Canada. When he came into the barracks where I was working, he passed me by and threw me a note that actually I destroyed it right there and then. But I did see the word love. I fell in love with you. I thought I'd rather be dead than involved with an SS man. For a long time afterwards, there was just hatred. I couldn't even look at him. But over time, Helena's feelings changed. Especially with the arrival of one particular train at Auschwitz Birkenau. Helena's sister was on board, along with her daughter and baby son. After they arrived at Birkenau, Helena learned that they were being taken to the gas chamber. Her SS admirer, Franz Wunsch, ran to see if he could help. So he said to me, tell me quickly what your sister's name is before I'm too late. So I said, you won't be able to. She came with two little children. He replied, children, that's different. Children can't live here. So he ran to the crematorium and found my sister. Wunsch could not save the children, but he rescued Helena's sister, claiming that she was a member of his work detail in Canada. Here he did something great. There were moments when I forgot that I was a Jew and that he was not a Jew. And honestly, in the end, I loved him. But it could not be realistic. Both Helena and her sister survived Auschwitz. And although nothing came of her relationship with Wunsch, she did give evidence on his behalf at his war crimes trial many years later. There were other temptations for the SS in Canada. Every piece had to be searched, underwear, everything. And we found lots of diamonds, gold, coins, uh, money, dollars, foreign currency from all over Europe. Workers in Canada were meant to put any valuables they found in a locked box in the centre of the barracks. But their SS guards often managed to interfere with this procedure. They were taking home lots of gold and other valuables because they were stealing, nobody counted it. And it went on all the time, but I was working in Canada. And if a lot of stuff is piled up together, then you can easily stash away something for your personal gain. Stealing things for yourself was absolutely common practice in Auschwitz. In 1943, Oskar Kroning was a 22-year-old corporal in the SS. He'd been employed in a bank before the war, and so was put to work in Auschwitz, managing the foreign money stolen from the incoming transports. Every few months, he'd pack up the currency and take it to Berlin. Supervision was so lax that he had the chance to steal some of it for himself, using it to buy goods on the thriving black market in Auschwitz. One day, Kroning decided he'd like to buy his own handgun. So I said, 
my dear friend, I need a pistol with ammunition. And he said, well, how much do you want to spend? I don't know. What does it cost? Well, you, as the Dollar King, should pay in dollars. So I'd say it'll cost you thirty dollars. And then he came back with the pistol and got his thirty dollars. The ready availability of foreign currencies and valuables to Pilfer was just one of the reasons that Auschwitz was a surprisingly attractive posting for many members of the SS. Auschwitz was not just a profitable place to be for them. It was also a good deal more comfortable than fighting with their comrades against the Red Army on the Eastern Front. The main camp of Auschwitz was like a small town with its gossiping and chatting. There was a grocery where you could buy bones to make broth. There was a canteen, there was a cinema, there was a theatre with regular performances. There was a sports club of which I was a member. It was all fun and entertainment, just like a small town. Alcohol played a big role there. Every day we were allocated a ration of alcohol, which sometimes we'd all collect to have a really big drinking bout. Far from being driven to psychological torment by the knowledge that they were participating in the mass murder of men, women and children, the majority of SS working at Auschwitz seem to have carried out their jobs with few qualms. Post. With death and starvation around them, they gorged themselves on food and drink, much of it stolen from the arriving transports. They drank everything there. It was like some kind of gangster's feast. They drank, they sang, they patted each other. There was an assortment of alcohol on the table. A whole variety of French cognacs. And we served them food. It all looked so disgusting, this feast, that when the prisoner overseer, Pashka, saw one of them vomiting, he said, with contempt, these pigs sure know how to vomit. It was only the prisoners who were to be starved to death. Being at the camp was a slow execution through starvation, beatings and hard labor. The SS, however, lacked for nothing. And when we look at this feast, they had everything. Throughout Auschwitz, military discipline was actually very loose. Also, the lack of discipline meant that we went to bed completely pissed. And we had our pistols in their holsters, hanging off the bed frame, and when somebody was too lazy to turn off the light, we just shot it out. And nobody said anything about the bullet holes in the walls. Getting wildly drunk was only one symptom of a widespread attitude among the SS. That the circumstances of Auschwitz allowed them to behave however they liked. Even on occasion commit sexual assault. The women most at risk worked in the sorting area of Canada. That's fine. That's what the SS officers called us. We looked good. We looked as though we were from the normal world, not like the others. Once there was a very good-looking woman. She wasn't thin, she, she had a full body. An SS man came in. He raped her. There was no God in Auschwitz. There were such horrible conditions that God decided not to go there.
It wasn't just men who exploited the situation they found themselves in. Women did as well. Irma Kreiser was one of 170 female SS staff at Auschwitz. She was just 20 years old in 1943, and her combination of beauty and cruelty was to make her notorious. But there was nothing in her background before she came to the camp to give any hint of the monster that she was to become. She didn't go to school. She was a farmer's daughter. I thought she was a small, silly country bumpkin. She became someone just because she was wearing a uniform and had a whip in her hand. Irma Kreiser was one of the SS who supervised the women's camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau. By the end of 1943, in the southern part of the camp complex, there were 30,000 women housed in 62 barracks in some of the worst conditions in the whole of Auschwitz. There was little running water, and disease was rampant. For Irma Greiser, the women's camp became a sadistic playground. She shot one woman dead who was standing in front of me. Her brains landed on my shoulder. The next day, after the selections, Irma came to see me. I refused to talk to her. She asked, are you angry with me? I replied, you nearly killed me yesterday. She answered, one down, it doesn't matter. After the war, Irma Kreise was tried for war crimes and sentenced to death. She was executed two months after her 22nd birthday. Two months after her 22nd birthday. But it was a member of the SS who worked on this site, where Crematorium 2 in Birkenau once stood, who became most infamous for exploiting the opportunities Auschwitz had to offer. Dr. Josef Mengele arrived at Auschwitz in May 1943. There had been medical experiments conducted at the camp before his arrival. At least two German doctors had been examining new methods of sterilizing men and women at Auschwitz since 1942. And in the process, hundreds had already suffered. But Mengele began a variety of new experiments, each related to his own obsessions. He saw Auschwitz as a human laboratory, one which allowed him to pursue any idea he had no matter how bestial or inhumane. He experimented on children, particularly on twins. This footage shows some of the children he selected, filmed by the Soviets immediately after the liberation of the camp. It is thought that Mengele used these children to research the power of genetic inheritance an area of interest to many Nazi scientists. Children were installed in special barracks for Mengele's exclusive use. Every day Mengele came, and every day he brought them toys, sweets, chocolates and new clothes. The children called Mengele the good uncle, but his treatment of them was entirely cynical because he wanted them to cooperate when he came to pick them for his experiments.
most of the twins died. For the comparative examination from the viewpoint of anatomy and pathology, the twins had to die at the same time. So it was that they met their death at the hands of Dr. Mengele. This phenomenon was unique in world medical history. Twin brothers died together and it was possible to perform autopsies on both. Where, under normal circumstances, can one find twin brothers who die at the same place and at the same time? You cannot ask why. There was no why in Auschwitz. Only was. somebody you're very strong how did you become very strong and I said I have no choice I overcame or I would have perished Mengele experimented not just twins but also on dwarves and prisoners with a form of gangrene of the face known as noma which was common in Birkenau because of the privations in which inmates were held He worked closely with an anthropological institute in Berlin, sending them human body parts, especially eyeballs. The parcels were stamped urgent war materials. Dr. Mengele was a member of Heinrich Himmler's SS. And like Mengele, Every member of the SS was told to pride themselves on their hardness and lack of pity. But during 1943, Himmler realized that he must try harder to prevent the SS from being, as he saw it, corrupted by the extermination of the Jews. In a speech he gave at Poznan on the 4th of October 1943, Himmler spelled out just how he wanted the SS to feel about the murders. Ich will auch ein ganz schweres Kapitel. Will ich hier vor Ihnen in aller Offenheit nennen. Es soll zwischen uns ausgesprochen sein. Und trotzdem werden wir nicht in der Öffentlichkeit nie darüber reden. Ich meine die Judenevakuierung, die Ausrottung des jüdischen Volkes. Und dies durchgehalten zu haben und dabei, abgesehen von menschlichen Ausnahmeschwächen, anständig geblieben zu sein, hat uns hart gemacht und ist ein niemals genanntes und niemals zu nennendes hohes Blatt. Die Reichtümer, die sie hatten, haben wir ihnen abgenommen und ich habe einen strikten Befehl gegeben, den Oberkommenführer Pohl durchgeführt hat. Wir haben diese Reichtümer restlos dem Reich, dem Staat abgeführt. Wir haben uns nichts davon genommen. But it was all lies. Because in a place like Auschwitz, Commandant Rudolf Hess was presiding over an institution that was riddled with corruption. So much so that in the autumn of 1943, another SS officer, Lieutenant Konrad Morgan, arrived to look into the running of the camp. There was to be no investigation, of course, into the fact that every week thousands of innocent people were being murdered in the gas chambers. In Himmler's eyes, that was a sacred duty. Instead, Morgan's investigation was to be centered on theft, on ensuring that the money and goods stolen from the incoming transports ended up in the coffers of the state, not the lockers of individual members of the SS. Morgan was shocked by what he found. Examination of the lockers yielded a fortune in gold, rings, pearls and money in all kinds of currencies. The conduct of the SS staff was beyond any of the standards that you'd expect from soldiers. They gave the impression of being degenerate and brutal parasites. 
Ich war gerade auf einer Dienstreise nach Berlin. Ich lief I was on a business trip to Berlin to deliver English pounds and American dollars. Uh, in that time. And just at that time they raided the quarters of the NCOs and other ranks. Um, and when I returned, my locker was sealed. Koenig knew that two of his comrades had already been arrested because contraband had been found in their possession. One of them later hanged himself in his cell. Knowing his own locker contained stolen goods, Koenig came up with an ingenious way out of his predicament. The Gestapo had sealed the front of his locker, so Koenig simply took off the back. I went to the Gestapo and said, Look, what nonsense are you up to? I can't get into my locker. Oh, we're sorry. Listen, I've just returned from a trip and I need it. Well, we've got to check it first. So they came, took the three seals off, opened the locker, found nothing, patted me on the shoulder and said, It's okay, carry on. But looking back, aren't you sorry that you made your own life more comfortable? while millions actually died. Absolutely not. Everybody is looking out for themselves. So many people died in the war, not only Jews. So many things happened. So many were shot. So many snuffed it. People burnt to death. So many were burnt. If I thought about all of that, I wouldn't be able to live one minute longer. This attitude that it was acceptable to profit personally from the Jews wasn't just common at Auschwitz. It became entrenched throughout the area of the killings. This footage of Jews being robbed in Eastern Europe shows how easy it was for the Nazis and their collaborators to pocket money and jewelry for themselves. And it was the corruption of individual Nazis which enabled Jews to fight back in the autumn of 1943. A major act of resistance occurred in the east of Poland at a Nazi death camp called Sobibor, where the SS were just as corrupt as they were at Auschwitz. They did steal, despite everything. They really, I mean, they had a good time. They, went, they, they didn't go to Russia, where the cameras were killed in the, in the Russia, in the Russian front, on the Stalingrad. They killed innocent babies. That's a good life from them. They, they lived like kings. Sobibor was a tiny camp, hidden in a forest. This is an impression of what it looked like. Several hundred Jews were given a temporary stay of execution and forced to work here, most sorting the belongings of those who had been murdered in the gas chambers of the camp. A group of them realized they might be able to take advantage of the Germans' greed and lure them to nearby workshops. There's a beautiful leather coat in the sorting area. Would you like to marry to uh, to take a look at it? Because they were very greedy. They picked up gold, they picked up cloth, and they sent it later home. When the uh, tailor made an appointment with his officer to come three o'clock, you could be sure. He was take work exactly there. So we were able to plan approximately when, when you divide the time of the killing, you could see that every few minutes, every 50 minutes, a German was killed. Yeah, Me and Lerna went to the cobbler shop and we hid behind some clothes. I had an axe, and he had an axe too. He пришел немец and мерить сапоги, что ему сделали, это шили. A German came in to try on some boots that the prisoners had made for him. Садили. Ну и напротив там где я. They sat him down opposite my hiding place. Я значит отодвинул. At that moment, I stepped out and hit him. 
moment. I didn't know that you should do it with the flat side of the axe. I hit it with a blade. We pulled him away and put some clothes over him. Almost immediately, another German came in. He walked up to the corpse, kicked him and said, What is this? What is this mess over here? What's going on? At that moment, I hit him with the axe, and Lerner hit him as well. Then we took his weapons. I took one pistol, Lerner took the other one, and we ran away. The inmates rushed to the wire fences that surrounded the camp all the time under fire from Ukrainian guards in the watchtowers. They pushed the fences down and ran straight towards the forest, crossing a minefield. I was told the last one to run. I fall down about two or three times. Each time I thought I'm hit, but I did get up. Nothing happened to me in a little into the forest, 100 meter, 50 meter, and finally. Forest. 300 of the 600 Jews in Sobibor managed to escape that day. In the end, about 50 of them evaded capture and survived the war. Many of them former Red Army soldiers who had been imprisoned in the camp. Only those who flocked together could survive. The only thing that saved me and my friends that we were like brothers to each other. In the wake of the Sobibor revolt, Himmler ordered the closure of a number of camps in Poland and the murder by shooting of over 40,000 people. But the Nazis' final solution was not progressing as Hitler and Himmler would have wished. Earlier in 1943, Jews in Warsaw had fought back when the Nazis finally tried to clear the ghetto. The Jewish resistance lasted nearly a month, forcing the Nazis to fight block by block to regain control. Elsewhere, the Nazis faced problems. With the war going badly for the Germans, several of their allies now refused to deport their Jews. But the Nazis faced the most concerted resistance to their anti-Jewish measures in occupied Denmark. The Germans had first occupied Denmark in 1940, but it was only now in August 1943, after Danish resistance had increased, that they imposed full military rule. Now German brutality was practiced in the open and the Danish Jews were hugely at risk. In September 1943, Hitler's representative in Denmark, Dr. Werner Best of the SS, a man whose hands were already bloodied by the persecution of Jews in France and Poland, met with the German diplomat Georg Ferdinand Duckfuss, a known sympathizer of the Danes. According to their later testimony, Best first informed him that 8,000 Danish Jews would shortly be rounded up. Ja, das Datum steht jetzt fest. Die Aktion wird in der Nacht vom 1. zum 2. Oktober stattfinden. Und Sie sehen keine Möglichkeit noch einzugreifen? Nein. Die SIPO hat schon ihre Befehle. It was at this point that Best acted seemingly out of character. Wenn ich doch nur eine Brücke über die Ostsee bauen könnte um den Juden den Weg nach Schweden zu ermöglichen. Seien Sie versichert, Dr. Best. Die Brücke wird gebaut. Auf Wiedersehen. Best's heavy hint about a bridge for the Danish Jews to neutral Sweden was clearly understood by Dukvitz. He immediately warned Danish politicians, who in turn warned the Jews. 
As a result, on Wednesday the 29th of September 1943, in the Central Synagogue in Copenhagen, Rabbi Melchior made a surprise announcement. During the service of that morning, my father stopped the service and uh, repeated the message that he had received. Don't be at home on Friday night. On Friday the 1st of October, when German security police visited the homes of Danish Jews, they found that the vast majority had fled. Most had travelled to Danish ports, where they sought a crossing to Sweden. And at every stage of their escape, the Jews were helped by their fellow Danes, even by members of the Danish police, even by members of the Danish police. I would go out and find one of the fishermen that I knew and tell him how many I had. And we would have to bake and borrow enough money to pay the fishermen as much as we could to get everybody on board. Once in neutral Sweden, the Danish Jews were given food and shelter. Altogether, 95% of Danish Jews were saved in a rescue action that is without parallel in the history of the Nazis' final solution. The Danes considered the Jewish population as a part of the Danish population and they could not understand why these people should have a separate treatment. And I think it was very much a question of fairness and justice. I would even say more that than love. But while the motive of the Danes who helped the Jews was clear, it's less easy to understand why Werner Best acted as he did. One possible explanation is that he wanted the Jews to escape to save him the trouble of deporting them himself. Best sent a report to Berlin on October the 5th. He said, As the objective goal of the Jewish action in Denmark was the de-Judification of the country, and not a successful headhunt, it must be concluded that the Jewish action has reached its goal. Even committed Nazis like Best were lacing their ideological hatred with pragmatism. And in 1943, here within Auschwitz's main camp, there was the most extraordinary example of that same thinking. Ah uh, yes, and so, in 1943, I and many others were living in Block 24A. The Block Elder came in and said, we're moving out because there's going to be a brothel here. We all started laughing. But it wasn't a joke. It was bizarre, but true. Block 24, just beside the main gate of Auschwitz, was to become a brothel. And the decision to make it happen had come from the very top of the SS. Heinrich Himmler had been considering for some time how to provide incentives to prisoners within the concentration camp system. He'd written to Otto Paul of the SS Economic Division. I consider it necessary to provide, in the most liberal way, hard-working prisoners with women in brothels. These instructions were passed on to commandants like Hurs in a directive from Paul in 1943. The idea wasn't for every prisoner to use the brothel, certainly not the Jews. But for vouchers for the brothel to be issued only to those prisoners whom the Nazis considered of special value. Klingt wie das FFF-System, das die IG vorgeschlagen hat. Prisoners like Richard Datzko, a member of the Auschwitz Fire Brigade. If I wanted to get a voucher, I had to sort things out with an SS man. And they only gave vouchers to healthy prisoners. They wouldn't give them to prisoners who were on their last legs. 
prisoners who worked as cooks for the SS, as hairdressers for the SS, the special prisoners got those vouchers. I got two vouchers. Little is known about the women who were forced to work in the brothel. This whole subject is one many prefer not to talk about. But it's believed they were selected from non-Jewish prisoners already in the camp. They were given these rooms on the first floor of Block 24, where prisoners who had the necessary vouchers visited them. I wanted to cuddle up to her as much as I could, because it was three and a half years since I'd been arrested. Three and a half years without a woman. In the brutalized atmosphere of Auschwitz, prisoners like Richard Dutzko had little sympathy for the women who worked in the brothel. The girls were treated very well. They had good food, they went for walks. They just had to carry out the work that was required of them. The brothel lasted until January 1945 and the suffering endured by the women who worked in these rooms is one of the least acknowledged aspects of the history of Auschwitz. Shortly after supervising the opening of the brothel, Hurst learned that he was to be removed as Commandant of Auschwitz. He didn't want to leave. He and his family had manufactured a comfortable life for themselves. The SS investigation had uncovered clear evidence of corruption at the camp. But Hurst wasn't disgraced. He was promoted to a desk job in concentration camp administration back in Berlin. He left on his own. Rather than move to Berlin, his family preferred to stay on after he'd gone in the Commandant's house on the edge of Auschwitz's main camp. <coughs> but Hurst was not finished with Auschwitz yet. Just two months after he left, the warehouse in Auschwitz where much of the evidence about corruption at the camp was being stored mysteriously caught fire. Huss would return to the camp in 1944, where he would oversee the dramatic months that made Auschwitz into the biggest killing center the world has ever seen. SS who worked on this site, where Crematorium 2 in Birkenau once stood, who became most infamous for exploiting the opportunities Auschwitz had to offer. Dr. Josef Mengele arrived at Auschwitz in May 1943. There had been medical experiments conducted at the camp before his arrival. At least two German doctors had been examining new methods of sterilizing men and women at Auschwitz since 1942. And in the process, hundreds had already suffered. But Mengele began a variety of new experiments, each related to his own obsessions. He saw Auschwitz as a human laboratory, one which allowed him to pursue any idea he had, no matter how bestial or inhumane. He experimented on children, particularly on twins. This footage shows some of the children he selected, 
filmed by the Soviets immediately after the liberation of the camp. It is thought that Mengele used these children to research the power of genetic inheritance, an area of interest to many Nazi scientists. Children were installed in special barracks for Mengele's exclusive use. Every day Mengele came, and every day he brought them toys, sweets, chocolates, and new clothes. Shati. The children called Mengele the good uncle, but his treatment of them was entirely cynical, because he wanted them to cooperate when he came to pick them for his experiments. Mengele came in every morning after a roll call to count us. He wanted to know every morning how many guinea pigs he had. Three times a week, both of my arms would be tied to restrict the blood flow, and they took a lot of blood from my left arm on occasion. Enough blood until we fainted. At the same time that they were taking blood, they would give me a minimum of five injections into my right arm. After one of those injections, I became extremely ill, and Dr. Mengele came in next morning with four other doctors. He looked at my fever chart, and he said, laughing sarcastically, he said, too bad, she is so young, she has only two weeks to live. I would fade in and out of consciousness, and in a semi-conscious state of mind, I would keep telling myself, I must survive, I must survive. They were waiting for me to die. Would I have died? My twin sister Miriam would have been rushed immediately to Mengele's lab, killed with an injection to the heart, and the Mengele would have done the comparative autopsies. That is the way most of the twins died. For the comparative examination from the viewpoint of anatomy and pathology, the twins had to die at the same time. So it was that they met their death at the hands of Dr. Mengele. This phenomenon was unique in world medical history. Twin brothers died together, and it was possible to perform autopsies on both. Where, under normal circumstances, can one find twin brothers who die at the same place and at the same time? You cannot ask why. There was no why in Auschwitz. Only was. I was asked by somebody, you're very strong. How did you become very strong? And I said, I have no choice. I overcame or I would have perished. Mengele experimented not just twins, but also on dwarves and prisoners with a form of gangrene of the face known as Noma, which was common in Birkenau because of the privations in which inmates were held. He worked closely with an anthropological institute in Berlin sending them human body parts, especially eyeballs. The parcels were stamped urgent war materials. Dr. Mengele was a member of Heinrich Himmler's SS. And like Mengele, every member of the SS was told to pride themselves on their hardness and lack of pity. 
But during 1943, Himmler realized that he must try harder to prevent the SS from being, as he saw it, corrupted by the extermination of the Jews. In a speech he gave at Poznan on the 4th of October 1943, Himmler spelled out just how he wanted the SS to feel about the murders. Ich will auch ein ganz schweres Kapitel. Will ich hier vor Ihnen in aller Offenheit nennen. Es soll zwischen uns ausgesprochen sein, und trotzdem werden wir nicht in der Öffentlichkeit nie darüber reden. Ich meine die Judenevakuierung, die Ausrottung des jüdischen Volkes. Und dies durchgehalten zu haben und dabei abgesehen von menschlichen Ausnahmeschwächen anständig geblieben zu sein, hat uns hart gemacht und ist ein niemals genanntes und niemals zu nennendes hohes Blatt. Die Reichtümer, die sie hatten, haben wir ihnen abgenommen und ich habe einen strikten Befehl gegeben, den Oberkommenführer Pohl durchgeführt hat. Wir haben diese Reichtümer restlos dem Reich, dem Staat abgeführt. Wir haben uns nichts davon genommen. But it was all lies. Because in a place like Auschwitz, Commandant Rudolf Hess was presiding over an institution that was riddled with corruption. So much so that in the autumn of 1943, another SS officer, Lieutenant Konrad Morgan, arrived to look into the running of the camp. There was to be no investigation, of course, into the fact that every week thousands of innocent people were being murdered in the gas chambers. In Himmler's eyes, that was a sacred duty. Instead, Morgan's investigation was to be centered on theft, on ensuring that the money and goods stolen from the incoming transports ended up in the coffers of the state, not the lockers of individual members of the SS. Morgan was shocked by what he found. Examination of the lockers yielded a fortune in gold, rings, pearls and money in all kinds of currencies. The conduct of the SS staff was beyond any of the standards that you'd expect from soldiers. They gave the impression of being degenerate and brutal parasites. I was on a business trip to Berlin to deliver English pounds and American dollars. And just at that time they raided the quarters of the NCOs and other ranks. And when I returned, my locker was sealed. Kroning knew that two of his comrades had already been arrested because contraband had been found in their possession. One of them later hanged himself in his cell. Knowing his own locker contained stolen goods, Kroning came up with an ingenious way out of his predicament. The Gestapo had sealed the front of his locker, so Kroning simply took off the back. I went to the Gestapo and said, look, what nonsense are you up to? I can't get into my locker. Oh, we're sorry. Listen, I've just returned from a trip and I need it. Well, we've got to check it first. So they came, took the three seals off, opened the locker, found nothing, patted me on the shoulder and said, it's okay, carry on. But looking back, aren't you sorry that you made your own life more comfortable while millions actually died? Absolutely not. Everybody is looking out for themselves. So many people died in the war, not only Jews. So many things happened. So many were shot. So many snuffed it. People burnt to death. So many were burnt. If I thought about all of that, I wouldn't be able to live one minute longer. This attitude that it was acceptable to profit personally from the Jews wasn't just common at Auschwitz. It became entrenched throughout the area of the killings. This footage of Jews being robbed in Eastern Europe 
shows how easy it was for the Nazis and their collaborators to pocket money and jewellery for themselves. And it was the corruption of individual Nazis which enabled Jews to fight back in the autumn of 1943. A major act of resistance occurred in the east of Poland at a Nazi death camp called Sobibor, where the SS were just as corrupt as they were at Auschwitz. They did steal, despite everything. Completely. And they had a good time. They, went, they, they didn't go to the Russia where the cameras were killed in the, in the Russia, in the Russian front, on the Stalingrad. They killed innocent babies. That's a good life for them. They, they lived like kings. Sobibor was a tiny camp, hidden in a forest. This is an impression of what it looked like. Several hundred Jews were given a temporary stay of execution and forced to work here, most sorting the belongings of those who had been murdered in the gas chambers of the camp. A group of them realized they might be able to take advantage of the Germans' greed and lure them to nearby workshops. There's a beautiful leather coat in the sorting area. Would you like to marry to uh, to take a look at it? Because they were very greedy. They picked up gold, they picked up clothing, they sent it later home. When the uh, tailor made an appointment with his officer to come three o'clock, you could be sure. He was take what exactly there. So we were able to plan approximately when you divide the time of the killing, you could see that every few minutes, every 50 minutes, a German was killed. Yeah, Me and Lerner went to the cobbler shop and we hid behind some clothes. I had an axe, and he had an axe too. He пришел немец and мерить сапоги, что ему сделали, это шили. A German came in to try on some boots that the prisoners had made for him. Садили. Ну напротив там где я. They sat him down opposite my hiding place. Я значит отодвинул. At that moment, I stepped out and hit him. I didn't know that you should do it with the flat side of the axe. I hit him with a blade. We pulled him away and put some clothes over him. Almost immediately, Another German came in. He walked up to the corpse, kicked him, and said, What is this? What is this mess over here? What's going on? At that moment, I hit him with the axe, and Lerner hit him as well. Then we took his weapons. I took one pistol, Lerner took the other one, and we ran away. The inmates rushed to the wire fences that surrounded the camp, all the time under fire from Ukrainian guards in the watchtowers. They pushed the fences down and ran straight towards the forest, crossing a minefield. I was probably the last one to run. I fall down about two, three times. Each time I thought I'm hit. But I did get up, nothing happened to me. And I did run to the forest, 100 meter, 50 meter, and finally the forest. 300 of the 600 Jews in Sobibor managed to escape that day. In the end, about 50 of them evaded capture and survived the war. Many of them former Red Army soldiers who had been imprisoned in the camp. Only those who flocked together could survive. 
нас спасло только то, что me my человек друг за другом, like как, как братья. In the wake of the Sobibor revolt, Himmler ordered the closure of a number of camps in Poland and the murder by shooting of over 40,000 people. But the Nazis' final solution was not progressing as Hitler and Himmler would have wished. Earlier in 1943, Jews in Warsaw had fought back when the Nazis finally tried to clear the ghetto. Jewish resistance lasted nearly a month, forcing the Nazis to fight block by block to regain control. And elsewhere, the Nazis faced problems. With the war going badly for the Germans, several of their allies now refused to deport their Jews. But the Nazis faced the most concerted resistance to their anti-Jewish measures in occupied Denmark. The Germans had first occupied Denmark in 1940, but it was only now in August 1943, after Danish resistance had increased, that they imposed full military rule. Now German brutality was practiced in the open, and the Danish Jews were hugely at risk. In September 1943, Hitler's representative in Denmark, Dr. Werner Best of the SS, a man whose hands were already bloodied by the persecution of Jews in France and Poland, met with the German diplomat Georg Ferdinand Duckwitz, a known sympathizer of the Danes. According to their later testimony, Best first informed him that 8,000 Danish Jews would shortly be rounded up. Ja, das Datum steht jetzt fest. Die Aktion wird in der Nacht vom 1. zum 2. Oktober stattfinden. Und Sie sehen keine Möglichkeit, noch einzugreifen? Nein. Die SIPO hat schon ihre Befehle. It was at this point that Best acted seemingly out of character. Wenn ich doch nur eine Brücke über die Ostsee bauen könnte, um den Juden den Weg nach Schweden zu ermöglichen. Seien Sie versichert, Dr. Best. Die Brücke wird gebaut. Auf Wiedersehen. Best's heavy hint about a bridge for the Danish Jews to neutral Sweden was clearly understood by Dukvits. He immediately warned Danish politicians, who in turn warned the Jews. As a result, on Wednesday the 29th of September 1943 in the Central Synagogue in Copenhagen, Rabbi Melchior made a surprise announcement. During the service of that morning, my father stopped the service and uh, repeated the message that he had received. Don't be at home on Friday night. On Friday the 1st of October, when German security police visited the homes of Danish Jews, they found that the vast majority had fled. Most had traveled to Danish ports, where they sought a crossing to Sweden. And at every stage of their escape, the Jews were helped by their fellow Danes, even by members of the Danish police. I would go out. By 1944, 550,000 people had already been murdered here at Auschwitz. But now, during just a few weeks in spring and early summer, that figure was to increase by over 300,000. Four years after it first opened, a period of frenzied killing was to begin at Auschwitz, unlike anything the camp had yet seen. But the history of Auschwitz in 1944 is not just one of murder. There is also intrigue. For this was also the year that the Nazis sent unlikely messengers to neutral territory to try to sow seeds of confusion among the Allies. Versteht ihr, worum es sich handelt, Genossen? Den Deutschen brennt der Boden unter den Füßen. 
Sie fühlen das Namen der Katastrophe. Sie wollen verhandeln. And as the Allies learned more about Auschwitz, the pressure on them grew. What were they going to do about it? We wanted them to, to put bombs on the camp. Hundreds and hundreds of planes coming, and we are looking from up and no bombs. This is the story of Auschwitz, the Nazis, and the Allies in 1944. One of death, deceit, and mystery. The vast majority of those who were murdered at Auschwitz in 1944 came from one place, Hungary. In March 1944, German troops entered Budapest. For the Nazis, Hungary was a rich country, ripe for plunder. And though already allied to the Nazis, the Hungarians had been unreliable partners as far as Hitler was concerned. Not least in their refusal to deport the 760,000 Hungarian Jews. Shortly after they were established in Budapest, the SS called a Hungarian named Joel Brandt, one of the most politically active members of the Jewish community, in for a meeting. On the 25th of April 1944, he went to see SS Lieutenant Colonel Adolf Eichmann. We know what was said from Brandt's subsequent interrogation by British intelligence, as well as his post-war testimony. Eichmann, infamous for organizing the mass murder of the Jews, was about to make a surprising proposal to Brandt. Ich habe Sie kommen lassen, weil ich Ihnen ein Geschäft vorschlagen möchte. Ich kann Ihnen eine Million Juden verkaufen. Was wollen Sie? Erzeugungsfähige Männer, gebärfähige Frauen, Kinder, Reise. Wir nehmen es kurz. Herr Obersturmbannführer, Sie verlangen von mir zu entscheiden, wer am Leben bleiben soll und wer nicht. Das kann ich nicht. Ich will keinen einzigen Menschen meines Volkes verlieren. Herr Brandt, ich kann Ihnen nicht alle Juden Europas verkaufen. Aber eine Million Juden kann ich laufen lassen. Wir sind an Waren interessiert, nicht an Geld. Fahren Sie ins Ausland? Stellen Sie Kontakt zu Ihrer internationalen Führung und zu den Alliierten her und bringen Sie mir eine konkrete Offerte mit zurück. We tried to understand what was going on. It was possible that the Germans were just bluffing us. But we couldn't understand why. But events elsewhere cast doubt on the Nazis' genuine desire to sell the Hungarian Jews, because this man, SS Lieutenant Colonel Rudolf Huss, was returning to Auschwitz. Huss had been removed as the original commandant of Auschwitz the previous November, promoted to a job in Berlin. But now he'd been ordered to return to the camp to oversee the murder of the Hungarian Jews. At Auschwitz's main camp, Hurs, a committed Nazi, held planning meetings with his senior staff. Wir werden uns auf Transportzahlen vorbereiten müssen. Auschwitz became the greatest human extermination center of all time. The reasons behind the extermination program seem to me to be right. There's nothing new in anti-Semitism. It's always existed all over the world. It's only coming to the limelight where the Jews have pushed themselves forward too much in their quest for power. Fueled partly by these prejudices, Hearst prepared for the arrival of the Hungarian Jews at Auschwitz-Birkenau, two miles away from Auschwitz's main camp. He oversaw the completion of a railway line, allowing new arrivals to be brought directly into Birkenau.
Birkenau, part concentration camp, part extermination center, had been the site of mass murder at Auschwitz since 1942. Here, not just Jews, but Polish political prisoners and others the Nazis thought a threat to their rule were imprisoned. Crucial to the operation of Birkenau were four crematoria with gas chambers attached, where those selected to die were murdered and burnt. To, czego nie można pokazać, a szczególnie Brzezince, bo to się tam działo. What can't be shown, especially in Birkenau, is above all the stench of burning bodies. Ten swąd palący się ciał. To szło spread a long way, kilometers from the camp. It wasn't just that the fire burnt for one day went out and that was it. It burnt for months on end. Whether it rained or not, whether it snowed or not, the fire burned all the time. Hurst and his SS colleagues now anticipated that so many people were about to be murdered here, the crematoria ovens simply would not cope. So huge cremation pits were prepared. And one prominent visitor to Auschwitz during May 1944 was none other than Adolf Eichmann. Hurst knew him well. Eichmann was completely obsessed with his mission and also convinced that this extermination action was necessary in order to preserve the German people in the future from the destructive intentions of the Jews. Eichmann's visit, I remember. His whole appearance. All the SS people had the same expression. They were always furious looking to show how important they were, to show they were important people. Yet at the same time as organizing the deportation of the Hungarian Jews, Eichmann allowed Brandt to leave Hungary on the 17th of May 1944. His task, to see if the Allies would exchange 10,000 trucks for one million Jews. There was considerable urgency to Brandt's mission, because in Hungary the deportations were already underway. A task now performed with the essential cooperation of the Hungarian authorities. In the small town of Sharvar, close to the border with Austria, Alice Lok Kahana, her elder sister Edith, and the rest of their family prepared to leave. The scene of, of going out of Egypt came to my mind. When we saw the cattle trains, I told my sister, it's a mistake. They, they have cattle trains here. They don't mean we should go in cattle trains. in the cattle train. They're closing the door on us and they're leaving a bucket for sanitary use and a bucket for water. And I told Edith I will never use the sanitary use bucket in front of these people, no matter what happens to me. And the two of us went to the corner of the cattle train. Joel Brandt arrived at Istanbul in neutral Turkey on the 19th of May. He met representatives of various groups with links to the Jewish leadership in Palestine at the Pera Palace Hotel. Versteht ihr, worum es sich handelt, Genossen? Den Deutschen brennt der Boden unter den Füßen. Sie fühlen das Namen der Katastrophe. Sie wollen verhandeln. Ich verstehe nicht, warum kein einziger von der Exekutive in Jerusalem hier ist. Es handelt sich um Tage, um Stunden. Eichmann wartet nicht. Täglich werden 12.000 in die Waggons geschleppt. Wir müssen sofort nach Jerusalem telegrafieren und darauf bestehen, dass ein Mann kommt, dessen Name in der Welt bekannt ist. Ken Weizmann oder Moshe Schertok. 
Joel, an solchen Sachen können wir nicht telegrafisch erledigen. Wir sind nicht sicher, dass unsere Telegramme kommen zu der Zeit, und sie nicht verändert. Wir müssen einen Boten schicken. Übermorgen geht ein Zug. Aber das dauert zu lange. Warum nicht per Flugzeug? Warum nicht heute Nacht? Wie stellst du das vielleicht vor, Joel? Wir bekommen kein Flugzeug. While Brandt encountered the first difficulties with his mission, the Hungarian Jews were arriving at Auschwitz-Birkenau. As a general rule, the taking of photographs was prohibited at Auschwitz. But one member of the SS did record the arrival of this Hungarian transport. No one knows why these pictures were taken, but they constitute the most valuable visual record in existence of what happened here. The Nazis wanted to see who could work as forced labor and who could not. The first part of this selection process was to separate the women and children from the men and then to choose from within each group who should die at once. When we arrived, I told Edith, nothing can be so bad like the scattered trade. I'm sure they will want us to work. And for the children, they will give better food. So they're saying right now, the children should separate, go in another um, uh, group, go line up with the children. Alice, who arrived at Auschwitz with her family on a similar transport to this, had decided to stand with the mothers and children. She could not have picked a more dangerous spot. And I went to that group with the children. And I was very tall for my age, and suddenly the, a German soldier asked me, how is the kinder? Do you have children? And I said, no, I'm just 15 in German. And then he put me to another group. That moment saved her life. Alice was taken from the group with mothers and children, all of whom were selected for immediate murder, and was placed with fit and healthy young women who were chosen as slave labor. As the transports continued to Auschwitz, Joel Brandt traveled to Aleppo in Syria and on the 11th of June 1944 met with a representative of the Jewish Agency. Also present was a major from British counterintelligence who recorded the conversation. Brandt was about to hear bad news. What would be the if you did not to Budapest? Zurückkehrst? Genosse Schert, then they would all the Jews in Ungarn umgebracht. Nach zwei Monaten wird von uns ebenso viel übrig bleiben wie vom Warschauer Ghetto. Lieber Joel, ich muss dir leider etwas Bitteres sagen. 
du kannst nicht zurück nach Budapest. Die Engländer verlangen, dass du nach Kairo weiterfährst. Heißt das, die Engländer halten mich gefangen? Ja. Wisst ihr, was ihr da tut? Das ist doch einfach nur. Wenn ich nicht zurückkehre, werden unsere Leute geschlachtet. Meine Frau, meine Mutter, meine Kinder kommen als Erste dran. Ich bin als Parlamentär gekommen. Aber ich bin nicht der Abgesandte des Feindes. Die Deutschen sind meine Feinde ebenso wie die der Alliierten. Ich bin hier der Abgesandte von einer Million zum Tode verurteilter Menschen. Von meiner Rückkehr hängt ihr Leben ab. Wer gibt euch das Recht, mich zu verhaften? Was habe ich gegen England getan? The British believed they knew why the Nazis now proposed a deal. The Germans were losing the war. The Red Army was marching on the right. And the Nazis said the trucks they wanted in exchange for Jews would be used only on the Eastern Front in the war against the Soviet Union. Heinrich Himmler of the SS, who was behind the Brandt mission, wanted to split the Allies. On May the 31st, 1944, at the Foreign Office in London, the Brandt proposals were considered by a committee of the War Cabinet. Their conclusion was that the idea of exchanging trucks for Jews was blackmail and should be rejected. But during the discussion, there was another, less idealistic reason suggested to refuse the Nazis' offer, which was that to accept it might lead to an offer to unload an even greater number of Jews onto our hands. Shortly after the British decision, the Americans and Soviets also agreed that there should be no negotiations with the Nazis. The Germans kept repeating that the Jews are almighty, that the Jews rule the world. They kept saying America and England do whatever Jews ask. But we could see that that wasn't true. Meanwhile, the Allies did not communicate their rejection of the Brandt mission to the Nazis here in Budapest. So Franz wife, Hansi, together with Rudolf Kastner, another Jewish activist, was able to plead repeatedly with Adolf Eichmann for a gesture that would show the Nazis were prepared to negotiate with the Allies. Both Rudolf Kastner and Hansi Brandt later testified as to how the meetings went. Ich muss diesen jüdischen Dreck aus der Provinz ausräumen. Da hilft kein Argument und da hilft auch kein Wein. Sie haben wahrscheinlich keine Kinder. Und deshalb haben Sie auch kein Mitleid mit ihnen. Sie nehmen sich einiges heraus, Frau Brandt. Ich rate Ihnen, wenn Sie weiterhin so mit mir reden wollen, sich lieber bei mir nicht mehr bitten zu lassen. Auf Wiedersehen. Wiedersehen, Herr Oberstuppenfeer. Herr Oberstuppenfeer. Eichmann was not prepared to spare one person's life as a result of humanitarian pleas. But he and his SS colleagues were prepared to listen to another argument. And they announced that one train full of Jews could leave Budapest for a safe destination as a so-called gesture of good faith. The price per seat on the train, 1,000 US dollars. On the 30th of June 1944, a train containing 1,684 Hungarian Jews pulled out of a Budapest station. A special committee on which Rudolf Kastner sat had decided the final passenger list. 
the Krasna list was compiled on purpose, like a Noah, Noah's Ark. Everybody and everything should be represented. If this will be the only part of Jews of Europe who remain alive, there should be a representative portion. But this was a strange Noah's Ark. Massively overrepresented on the train were Kastner's own relatives and people from his hometown of Korostal. And places were also given to several hundred rich Hungarian Jews who subsidized anyone on the train who couldn't pay. If you have to save your life, you try it in every way. Even in a criminal way, if it comes to that. But you have to save it. Your life is the first. You are nearest to yourself, whatever you <laughs> try to save. When we were in the, in the train, we were afraid. We never knew what will be our future. Eichmann had promised that the train would travel to neutral Switzerland, but it didn't. At Linz in Austria, the train stopped and Jews on board were told to get out and take a shower. I was standing naked before the doctor and looking very proud into his eyes and uh, thought he should see how a Jewish woman is going, a proud Jewish woman is going to die because most of us knew that in Auschwitz and from the taps there didn't come any water but the gas and uh, from the taps came fine warm water. Afterwards we dressed up and returned to our train. It was a very relieving experience after we were ready to die there. The train traveled on to Bergen-Belsen camp in Germany where those on board stayed for up to six months before the Nazis finally allowed almost all of them to travel to neutral Switzerland. But while 1,600 Hungarian Jews reached safety by the Kastner train, over 400,000 were sent here to Auschwitz. The spring and early summer of 1944 was to be the most notorious period in the history of the camp. The four crematoria with gas chambers were struggling to cope with the numbers the Nazis wanted to kill. Two of them lay here in the western part of the Birkenau complex with the gas chambers above ground. Two more were positioned close to the railway line that took new arrivals into the heart of Birkenau. These had the gas chambers in the basement. The Nazis had hugely increased the number of Jewish prisoners in the Zonderkommando they made work in the crematorium in order to deal with the massive numbers they wished to murder. So much so that a crematorium and gas chamber like this was operated by around 100 Jews and just four Germans. The torment endured by the Zonderkommando forced on pain of their own immediate death to assist in the killing process, is one of the most shocking parts of the history of Auschwitz. When people watched in that gas chamber, you could hear some kind of a voice calling God. It looked like those voices coming from kind of a catacombs, which I still got them, those kind of voices, I still got them in my ears. These wire columns contained the Zyklon B gas pellets which were lowered in from above by the Nazis. And while it was always the Nazis themselves who committed this act of murder, it was the prisoners of the Zonderkommando who had to perform the horrendous task of collecting the bodies, taking them out and up a small lift to burn, either in the ovens of the crematorium or increasingly in the open air. When the, the big, you know, transports from uh, uh, Hungary came in, then we were daily, you know, and they wanted to finish them fast. That's why they had the pits to, to go through. This photograph, which a Zonda commando risked his life to take, shows bodies lying by the open cremation pits in 1944. 
TVT y de Bepeminde Bars, everyday, everyday, everyday. Yo got used to it. We know it, if we want to do that, we have the bullet in our head. Was like a robot. On occasion, when killing small numbers of prisoners, the gas chambers were not used, and the Zonda Commando were forced to stand just inches away from the murders. We, we had to take them, they bring one by one, we take them by the ears, and be, behind him was a, an SS, shoot him in the back, the guy would, would come down with a lot of blood, was some of us there with the water putting out. After a while, you don't know, nothing, nothing, nothing bothers you. That's why your conscience, you know, gets inside of you and stays there until today. You know, somebody else is inside of me that tells me from time to time you get awake. What happened? Why we did such a thing? By now, the Allies knew about this place and its role as an extermination camp. Gradually, from early 1944 onwards, the level of knowledge about what was happening here had been increasing among the Allies, thanks to the escape of a handful of Auschwitz prisoners and the work of the Polish resistance. This culminated in a document which drew together the available intelligence and which came to be known as the Auschwitz Protocols. It included sketches showing the position of the major crematoria and gas chambers at Birkenau. As a result, from June 1944, Jewish organizations asked that the railway lines to Auschwitz and the gas chambers of the camp be bombed. Requests which reached the American government only a few weeks after the landings on the D-Day beaches. Assistant Secretary of State John McCloy rejected the request, saying the bombing was impracticable and would lead to diversion of considerable air support that was essential elsewhere. A clue as to the strength of McCloy's opposition to the bombing requests comes from this inter-office memo, where his own assistant, Colonel Gerhardt, writes, I know you told me to kill this. In Britain, requests to bomb Auschwitz were once again referred to the Americans, and so the idea died. But the Americans went on in August 1944 to bomb the IG Farben factory being built in Monowitz, just four miles from Birkenau. Uh, we heard the airplanes coming and we, we wanted them to, to put bombs on the camp. At least we could run and hundreds and hundreds of planes coming and we are looking from up and no bombs. So this we couldn't understand. So absolutely God forgot us and the people of the world forgot that, didn't care about what's going on, and they knew what's going on there. During a reconnaissance flight on the 25th of August, the Americans took this picture of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Whether or not, of course, it would have ever been possible to destroy with a precision attack the crematoria and gas chambers, clearly visible here, and whether that would have made the Nazis stop committing murder at Auschwitz, is one of the great unanswered questions of history. What is certain is that back in Budapest, the protests about the deportations made by several foreign governments, including the British and Americans, did have an effect. The pressure reached a peak in early July when the Hungarians intercepted cables demanding that those involved be punished. The Hungarian Prime Minister, Demes Stoljai, and Edmund Wesenmayer, Hitler's representative in Hungary, met to discuss the intercept. We know what was said from a detailed report Wesenmayer sent the next day to Berlin. Namentlich genannt werden, 
die als Hauptverantwortlich für die Deportationen angesehen werden. Hm. Da ist mein Name dabei. Und Ihrer natürlich auch. Mich persönlich lassen diese Drogen kalt. But such protests and threats from the international community did influence the Hungarian head of state, Admiral Horthy. With the war clearly going against the Nazis, he decided that the time had come to distance himself from his erstwhile ally. Horthy informed the Germans on the 7th of July that the deportations of the Jews must cease. The Hungarian authorities would no longer cooperate. After the official halt of the Hungarian transports, the Nazis at Auschwitz focused greater attention on inmates who had been imprisoned here at Birkenau for some time. The Gypsies. They lived in family groups, in some of the worst conditions in the camp. <laughs> the atmosphere was terrible because many of the small children and people in the blocks were ill. And everyone was mixed up together. Children were screaming, Mom, I'm hungry, give me something to eat or something to drink. But they weren't allowed to drink the water due to typhus. Franz Rosenbach survived only because he was eventually transferred elsewhere as slave labor. But his mother died at Auschwitz, along with 21,000 of the 23,000 gypsies sent there. You see, there were moments, moments which one really prefers not to think about. Such moments. The things that were done to us left you wondering why. We were beaten, kicked, degraded, but you didn't know why. You had no idea why. Simply because we were different. Under Nazi rule, the gypsies suffered proportionately more than any other group apart from the Jews. The Nazis considered them antisocial, despised their way of life, and thought them racially dangerous. On the evening of the 2nd of August, 1944, the Nazis moved to liquidate the gypsy camp. It was to be one of the most appalling single nights in the history of Auschwitz. The gypsy camp was very close to our barrack, and we could hear it. And the night was unbelievable full of screaming and crying and smoke and horrendous sounds. They took the gypsies and the gypsies were crying. They knew where they are taking them. Everybody defended themselves, defended themselves to the last. They bit, they scratched. The Germans had driven in in trucks. They threw the children in them, and if one of them jumped out, they would hit him on the leg or the arm with a wooden club, break it and throw him back in so that he couldn't jump out again, couldn't get out because his limb was just hanging there. And when I saw this, I started yelling. And people grabbed me, Poles, as they were afraid that the Germans would come and throw a hand grenade in or something. They rolled me in a blanket to keep me quiet and sat with me. The gypsies were taken to the crematoria, many here to crematorium five, and killed within its network of gas chambers. By the autumn of 1944, after the gypsies had been murdered here, and the massive transports of Jews from Hungary and then the Lodz ghetto in Poland had ceased. 
The number of people killed at Auschwitz dropped to fewer than 1,000 a day from a peak of 10,000 in May. The Sonderkommando who worked in these gas chambers now began to fear for their own lives. They were changing us. You know, we, we knew that the, our days were always numbered and we didn't know when the end would be. Here in Crematorium 4 at around 1.30 p.m. on Saturday the 7th of October 1944, the Zonder fought back. They set fire to the crematorium and armed with pickaxes and rocks, they attacked their SS guards. Meanwhile, the Zonder Commando in Crematorium 2 also rose up. After a few minutes of hand-to-hand -hand fighting with the SS, some Zonder Commando managed to escape into the nearby woods, but all of them were later captured and shot. And the SS even sought revenge against those Zonder Commando who had not taken part in the revolt. They didn't know what to do with us, so they had a kind of discussion, and then they told us to lie face down on the ground, holding our hands behind our backs and every third person was shot. Some of my friends in the Zonda Commando lost their lives and the rest of us had to go back to work. There was never much hope for us. I'm telling it like it is. They didn't kill us because there were 4,000 cadavers, you know, that we have to go into the ovens and we are the only ones that they could do it and uh, that's why they save us. But after that they, they took most of us, they left only 92 of us, all the others they took them and they killed them all around. The same month as the Zonda Commando revolt, there was a coup in Hungary. On the 15th of October 1944, Horty's non-compliant regime was overthrown by the Nazi-backed Arrow Cross Militia. Eichmann immediately called Rudolf Kastner in for a meeting. Kastner later wrote a report about what was discussed. Schatz, ich bin wieder da. Jetzt passen Sie mal auf. Diese neue Regierung arbeitet jetzt nach unseren Befehlen. Und jetzt werden die Budapester Jugend abtransportiert. Und zwar diesmal zu Fuß. The Jews of Budapest, who had up to now largely escaped deportation, were now Eichmann's target. They were not to be sent to Auschwitz, but to Austria where they would be used as slave labor. And because of the shortage of trains, they were to walk there. So during November, tens of thousands of Jews from Budapest were forced out of the city and made to trek west. Many thousands died en route. But Eichmann incurred the displeasure of senior figures of the SS Concerned, in the light of how badly the war was going for them, that so much potential forced labor was being squandered. And so Himmler summoned Eichmann to a special meeting in December 1944, on his private train. In the last months of the war, Himmler has cynically decided to try to distance himself from the murder of the Jews. Another SS officer, Lieutenant Colonel Becher, who also worked in Hungary, was present as well. After the war, Becher testified as to what was said. Wenn Sie bisher Juden ausrotteten, so haben Sie, wenn ich es befehle, wie in diesem Fall, Jetzt Judenpfleger zu sein. Ich erinnere Sie daran, dass nicht der Gruppenführer Müller oder Sie, sondern ich das Reichssicherheitshauptamt gegründet habe. Und das ich befehle. Wenn Sie es nicht können, dann müssen Sie es sagen. Jawohl, Reichsführer. Frau Schnaumannführer, Reichsführer. Himmler knew the German army was struggling to hold back the Allies. And by January 1945, the SS here at Auschwitz were also well aware that the end was near.
reference to this place as a site of mass murder was to be eliminated. We woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of explosion. They were blowing up the gas chamber and the crematorium. Outside, the SS were waiting for us and ordered the... We woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of explosion. They were blowing up the gas chambers to march. Anybody who could not march fast enough was shot on the spot. We arrived in Auschwitz 1, which is about an hour walk at 1 a.m. The Nazis again disappeared as if the earth swallowed them up. Eva Moses' corps and 1,200 other prisoners thought too weak to evacuate from the area were now left for a few days to fend for themselves at Auschwitz's main camp. Most of the guards had gone, but another SS unit had been ordered to come to the camp and shoot them. No prisoners were supposed to be left alive to testify to just what had happened here. Meanwhile, more than 50,000 other inmates of Auschwitz, thought fit enough to become slave laborers, were marched in sub-zero temperatures to railway junctions, where they were to be put on trains and sent west. If anyone even dared to bend down to get muddy snow off their shoes, they were shot. That was the end. We weren't allowed to bend over. We could only walk quickly, quickly, quickly. On both sides of the roads there were ditches, big ditches. And the ditches were full of bodies. Also on the march amidst the chaos of this retreat, were prisoners who had never thought they could possibly leave the camp alive. The Zonda Commando. We survived that because the Russians were coming from Krakow and down and the, the uh, Germans got panicky. And every place we went, <clears throat> the Germans one by one were asking us if you work in the Zonda Commando. And we were shot. Once they reached the railhead, the Auschwitz prisoners were crammed into open wagons to continue the journey west, in temperatures that could reach as low as minus 20 degrees. I was very, one guy was up, and he was German, he told us he was German. Who knows, maybe a convict, who knows. And he wanted to sit down, he could stand up no more, this guy. So, and he told me, uh, I got some cigarettes. Would you let me sit down? When I have cigarettes, you know that. <laughs> when I have some cigarettes, he gave me two, three cigarettes. When I got up and he said, so the cigarettes in five, ten minutes were gone. I told, we told him, get up. Get up. Stand up. He won't stand up. So what I did was, me and a couple more friends, we sit on him. In about 30 minutes, one hour, he was suffocated, that guy, and we threw it, threw it out of the wagon. I was happy. How did I feel? They killed all my family, about 30, 40 people of my family, and I killed one German? That was nothing. It was a murder, wasn't it? You did murder a fellow prisoner. I, well, I was happy at the time, I told you, because it was German. I won't do that to, I won't do that to one of, of ours, but anyway, I wanted to be seated too over there because I got tired too. Why he should leave? Because he gave me two, three cigarettes. That's why he didn't want to get up, so we sit on him. 
And he passed away. Easy. So can I give you my last Befehl? Geben? The Germans, who were actually complicit in the murders at Auschwitz, knew they were even more at risk from retribution as the war neared its end. My liebe Hand, thank you for this. Members of the SS, like Rudolf Hess, the former commandant of Auschwitz, now tried to escape capture. And the story of Hess and his colleagues' attempt to evade justice and the Allied attempt to prosecute them is one of the most troubling in this entire history. At Auschwitz, by mid-January 1945, the Nazis knew it would only be a matter of days before the Red Army arrived. What had been the biggest concentration and death camp in the whole of the Nazi Empire would shortly be no more. The SS tried to do what they could to conceal the details of what had happened here. Files were removed or burnt the gas chambers destroyed. Everyone who had worked at Auschwitz knew that the time was fast approaching when the Allies would call them to account. I was a cog in the machine. And directly after the war, everybody who'd been at Auschwitz, no matter in what position, in the office, or as a guard, or as somebody who threw the Zyklon B into the hatches, Everybody had the feeling that it would be best not to draw too much attention to it. This is the story of how the SS at Auschwitz, together with the few inmates who survived, fared in the last days of the war in its aftermath. And it's a story that is as unexpected as it is shocking. Soviet forces liberated Auschwitz on the 27th of January 1945. Only a few thousand inmates awaited them. The vast majority of the prisoners had been marched away by the Nazis just days before, westwards, into the Reich. Those that remained, most thought too sick to march, were supposed to have been shot by the SS, but in the confusion they'd been left alive. I realized they were prisoners and not workers, so I called out, You are free! Come out! They began rushing towards us in a big crowd. They were weeping, embracing us and kissing us. Among the prisoners in Auschwitz's main camp were several hundred children, many of them twins, who had been the subject of Nazi medical experiments, including ten-year-old Eva Moses Korn. We ran up to them and they gave us hugs, cookies and chocolate. Being so alone, a hug meant more than, than anybody could imagine because that replaced the human warmth that we were starving for. We were not only starved for food, but we were starved for human kindness. And the Soviet army did provide some of that. Despite the final hurried efforts of the SS, 
Evidence of the aftermath of mass extermination lay all around. It was clear that a terrible crime had been committed. It was all... I felt a grievance on behalf of mankind that these fascists had made such a mockery of us. It roused me and all the soldiers to go and quickly destroy them and send them to hell. Just 84 days after liberating Auschwitz, the Red Army was in Berlin. And on the 30th of April 1945, the man who had presided over the horror of Auschwitz, Adolf Hitler, committed suicide in the Führerbunker beneath the Reich Chancellery. 1945. The former commandant of Auschwitz, Lieutenant Colonel Rudolf Huss of the SS, traveled to a meeting that he believed would determine his own fate. It was held here at the Murvik Naval Academy at Flensburg in North Germany, a part of the country still in Nazi hands. Huss was about to hear the contingency plans his own boss, Heinrich Himmler, had made for his key staff. Huss later recorded in his memoirs what Himmler said. This was the farewell message from the man I had looked up to so much, in whom I had had such firm faith, and whose orders, whose every word, had been gospel to me. Huss was clearly disappointed. He'd been expecting to be told to take part in some dramatic last act of resistance. Now, following orders, he dressed up in the uniform of a petty officer, a board smart of the German Navy, and went to hide among the sailors on the holiday island of Sint. As for his boss, Himmler, he was captured by the Allies just days later. Gestapo Chief Himmler was taken when captured. Arch criminal, he could expect no mercy, and had in his mouth a capsule which he chewed. They found on him another capsule filled with potassium cyanide. The Allies knew that many of the worst crimes of the Nazis had been committed by Himmler's SS, almost all of whom had their blood group tattooed under their arm. The Allies were able to identify former SS soldiers by means of this tattoo, but they did not identify all those within the SS who had worked at Auschwitz like Oskar Kroening. By the end of the war, he was attached to an SS fighting unit and was eventually arrested at the Danish-German border. I knew, of course, that my connection with the concentration camp of Auschwitz would provoke a negative response. So I tried not to point my interrogators to the fact that I had been at Auschwitz. We obviously knew that the things that had happened there did not necessarily comply with human rights. Actions which Oskar Kroening refers to as not necessarily complying with human rights were, as the British discovered when they liberated the camp of Bergen-Belsen in April 1945, some of the worst crimes in history. It was to Belsen that more than 10,000 inmates of Auschwitz had been sent ahead of the Soviet advance. Here they had been denied water and food and left to die. The things in this camp are beyond describing. When you actually see them for yourselves, you know what you're fighting for here. Pictured in the paper, can't describe it at all. The things they have committed, well, nobody has picked over here at all. Many of the people directly responsible for the horrors of the Nazi camps had escaped immediate capture and were still hiding somewhere in Germany. The former commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hurst, was one of them. 
He'd been initially detained, but then released by the British. His disguise had worked. They thought he was a sailor. Now he was employed as a farm labourer at Gotthuben near Flensburg, answering to the name of Franz Lang. But after a bad start, the British were back on his trail. By the time they torched the camp of Bergen-Belsen, survivors had begun to tell of their experiences at another camp further to the east, Auschwitz, and of the man who ran it, Rudolf Hurst. Living north of Belsen, the British intelligence corps discovered Hurst's family. They arrested and imprisoned Hurst's wife, Hedwig. For five days, she was repeatedly asked where her husband was, but always replied that he was dead. Then, on the morning of the sixth day, the soldiers of the intelligence corps attempted to trick her into telling more. Captain William Cross, a commanding officer of 92 Field Security Section, later revealed how the interrogation went. Frau Hoos, wir fragen Sie ein letztes Mal, wo ist Ihr Mann? Wo ist er? Er ist tot. Sie gehören den Zug, der draußen ist? Dieser Zug fährt nach Russland, Sibirien. Und Ihr Sohn, der in der Zelle neben an ist, fährt mit. Sie haben zwei Minuten Zeit, auf Wiedersehen zu sagen. Oder Sie schreiben auf. Adresse von Ihrem Mann und welche Name er benutzt. Und dann könnten Sie mit Ihrem Sohn nach Hause. Zehn Minuten. Thinking she was saving her son, Frau Hurst now revealed the truth. Soldiers of British 92 Field Security Section moved up to the farm she'd identified at 11 o'clock that night. They knew the crimes Hurst had committed and were not inclined to restrain themselves. According to one of the British soldiers who witnessed Hurst's capture, the blows and screams were endless. The medical officer accompanying them shouted to Captain Cross to call his men off unless he wanted to take back a corpse. After his arrest, Hurst was interrogated first locally and eventually at Nuremberg as part of the war crime trials. He struck me as a normal person. That's the horrible thing about it. If he'd been a monster, you know, if he'd come in there and said, I did, 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 did all these people are terrible, I was happy. In it. He was a cool, objective, matter of fact, this is my war duty, I did my war duty. It was like uh, I had to go out and cut down so many trees. And so I went out and took my saw and cut the trees down. He just uh, acted like a normal, uh, unimportant individual and uh, simply answered the questions and, uh, as far as I could tell, told what happened. 
And without emotion. Without emotion. And without sense of guilt. Without sense of guilt. Not in the slightest apologetic. Not in the remotest degree was he apologetic. In a sense, he was, I think, showed a certain pride in his accomplishment. Much of the former Nazi empire was now under the control of Stalin's Soviet Union. And as the search for Nazi perpetrators continued, thousands of refugees were trying to return home. Among them, many of the former inmates of Auschwitz, including Helena Tsitronova. For her, the Soviet soldiers had become a new source of terror. No matter where we hid, they found us and raped some of my friends. They did horrible things to them. It was so terrible. The word terrible is not even enough to describe it. They raped all the time. Helena avoided being raped herself only because her elder sister Rosinka pretended she was her mother and protected her. The rapes continued just feet away from them. I heard shouting and screaming and then they became quiet. They had no more strength left. There were cases when they were raped to death. They strangled them. They were like wild animals. We thought that though the Germans hadn't killed us, the Russians now would. Other former inmates of Auschwitz were also to suffer at the hands of the Russians. Ironically, Russians themselves. 10,000 Red Army prisoners of war had been sent to Auschwitz in October 1941 to build the camp here at Birkenau. The handful who survived this horror were, after their liberation, about to be persecuted again. They invented that in Auschwitz, this camp of death. They were training spies. So somebody got this idea in his head. What if they turned me into a spy? Pavel Stenkin was sent into internal exile in the closed city of Pyrm in the Urals. He was a victim of Stalin's policy that all Red Army soldiers who'd been captured should be treated as suspected traitors. When I arrived in Pyrm to work, I was called in every second night. Admit this, agree to that, we know everything. The only thing we don't know is why you were sent here. But we will find out with or without your help. Come on, admit that you're a spy. And I would say, I'm not a spy. I'm an honest Soviet man. And the interrogator smiled ironically. Soviet man. And he smiled again. Just confess, and it'll all be over. They were tormenting and tormenting me. And then they decided to get rid of me. They sent me to prison. And the details of my sentence. Do you think I heard anything or I read anything about it? I heard nothing and read nothing. The judges were in a rush. They had theatre tickets, so they were in a hurry to leave the court. Pavel Stenkin was sent to a labour camp within the Soviet Gulag system. 
captured by the Germans in 1941. He was finally released only after Stalin's death in 1953. I was always feeling hungry. It was not until I was released from prison in 1953 that I started to eat my fill. While the former inmates of Auschwitz struggled to rebuild their lives, some of the Germans who had worked at the camp arrived in Britain, along with other members of the German armed forces. If you're talking about England, we were very soon no longer prisoners of war, but German workers. The fence around our camp was removed, and theatre groups were formed in the camps, and, well, we were working, we had sufficient food, in fact, good food. We were able to earn extra money by helping the farmers, we got cigarettes, and had a relatively good, comfortable life in the camps. Oskar Gröning, whose connection with Auschwitz had still not been discovered, joined a choir made up of other German prisoners of war and went on tour. For one and a half months, I travelled through the Midlands and Scotland with this choir. And the hospitality, especially in the Christian parishes, was enormous. Although we were supposed to sleep in the POW camps, we often didn't, because people put us up in their houses. Everybody wanted to have a singer stay with them. So we had a good night's sleep and got a good breakfast. And the next morning we were taken back to our gathering point and off we went to the next place. It was great. While Oscar Kroning experienced life in Britain, his former boss endured a less comfortable captivity in the Polish town of Krakow. Rudolf Hurst passed the time before his trial recording his experience as Commandant of Auschwitz and his service in the SS. It's a remarkable document of great historical importance, offering us an insight into his mentality. He reveals how he watched women and children being taken to the early improvised gas chambers in cottages at Birkenau. One woman approached me as she walked past and pointed to her four children, who were manfully helping the smallest ones over the rough ground, and whispered, How can you bring yourself to kill such beautiful darling children? Have you no heart at all? Hurst wrote that he would ride his horse to clear his mind after such incidents, but that he had no regrets. The reasons behind the extermination program seem to me to be right. All the time Hurst was killing women and children at Auschwitz, he was also living with his own family just yards from the main camp. When I saw my children happily playing, the thought would often come to me, how long will our happiness last? In the summer they splashed in the river Zola. Their greatest joy was when Daddy bathed with them. He had, however, so little time for all these childish pleasures. I always felt that I had to be on duty the whole time. Again and again my wife reproached me and said, You must think not only of the service always, but of your family too.
Rudolf Hurst, the man who had been in charge of the site of the greatest mass murder in the history of the world, never in his memoirs expressed any real remorse for his crimes. Instead, looking back, there was just one thing above all he wished he'd done differently. Today, I deeply regret that I did not devote more time to my family. After a trial lasting three weeks, Hurst was sentenced to death, to be hanged on a specially constructed gallows on the site of his crimes at Auschwitz. During the execution, when they were leading him to the gallows, Hurst looked calm. When you go to your death, you're normally not calm. I know that because more than once we had experienced such moments ourselves, when death had been close by, when he had been master of life and death. I thought as he climbed to the gallows, up the steps, knowing him to be a Nazi, a hardened party member, that he would say something like make a statement to the glory of the Nazi ideology that he was dying for. But no, he didn't say a word. And during the execution I thought, one life for so many millions of people, is that not too little? Hurst was executed on the 16th of April, 1947. But for many of the former prisoners of Auschwitz, this was only part of the justice they sought. As they came home, many here to Slovakia, they expected to be able to return to the lives they had led before the war. But they faced a problem. In this part of Europe, there was now little respect for pre-war property rights. Something Ligo Schobreda, a former prisoner at Auschwitz, discovered when she returned to her hometown, Strobkov. I finally found myself in front of my house. I knocked on the big gate, and the man opened it, and he said, what do you want? Well, I said that I'd come back home. And when he heard this, he said to me, why don't you go back where you've come from? And he slammed the door. I was shocked. I walked down the main street and I realized that all the houses which had previously belonged to my relatives are now occupied by others. Libo Shabreda had spent nearly three years at Auschwitz, forced to work in the area of the camp where the belongings stolen from new arrivals were sorted. An SS photographer took this picture of her, ordering that she smile for the camera. In her time at Auschwitz, Libo Shabreda endured much suffering, but she was sustained by a dream that she might be able one day to return home. A dream that now lay in pieces. I regretted that I'd come back. Everybody was keeping their distance. It was as if I was poisonous. They were probably afraid they'd have to return the confiscated property. I left the next day and never went back. To return home was my worst experience. Other than the gravestones in the cemeteries, there was now little evidence that there had ever been thriving Jewish communities here. After the war, 
Few survivors of the Nazi camps recovered either all their money or all their property. It was a huge injustice. One compounded by the fact that leading members of the SS were given assistance to leave Europe and escape. Bene, eccola qui. Dr. Josef Mengele had conducted a series of medical experiments at Auschwitz, Dunque, many of them on children. Thank you. With the help of a corrupt Italian immigration official, he managed to obtain passage to Argentina. He was not alone. Adolf Eichmann, who had helped organize the extermination of the Jews, also managed to escape to South America. But in the face of the atrocities committed by these and other Nazis, there were those who sought to take justice into their own hands. Some of them were members of the Jewish Brigade, a unit of the British Army created in 1944. They fought against the Germans in Italy, and as they did, they learned more and more about the nature of the crimes the Nazis had committed. And soldiers like Moshe Tavor resolved to do something about it. We got angrier and angrier. Many of us felt it wasn't enough that we just participated in the war. A few of us gathered together. And we decided we had to try to take revenge on the people who had done this. We had no illusions we could get all of them, but maybe we could get a few of them, at least. Using whatever sources they could, they tried to trace any Nazi who they believed had been active in the destruction of the Jews. Then they paid him a visit and took him away, saying they wanted to conduct an interrogation. We drove to a place we had selected before, like a forest or some place that was uninhabited. And there we put him on trial and we read him all the charges. They were based on everything we knew from the underground. Sometimes he had a chance to say a few words to defend himself and then we would finish him off. Usually one of us would strangle him. Did you ever strangle someone? Yes. Not that I was happy to do it, but I did it. I was completely aware of what I did. I didn't have to drink beforehand to lift my morale. I was always enthusiastic enough. I knew that my uncles and my grandparents and other relatives, tens of them, were annihilated. But you killed a person without a proper trial. How do you feel about that? How can you possibly explain that? Look, in my life until then I'd already done quite a few things which were not exactly straight. But to say that I feel guilty for what I did to them, on the contrary, completely the opposite. I feel guilty for what we didn't do to them. יש לי ישראל מצפון על מה שלא עשינו להם. But some of the people walking these streets had pasts they wanted to hide. Oskar Kroning had worked at Auschwitz for nearly two years. Now he was a committed family man and working in a glass factory in the personnel department. And it wasn't advisable to bring up the subject of Auschwitz in his presence. I remember when I was staying with my father and my stepmother's parents. At dinner, the grandmother made a stupid remark about Auschwitz and implied, you're a potential or even a real murderer. 
and yet you're allowed to sit with us at the table. You're here only on sufferance. I exploded and banged my fist on the table and said, now listen well, this word and this connection are never ever mentioned again in my presence or I'll move out. But the hunt was intensifying for some of the most notorious members of the SS implicated in the murder of the Jews, like SS Lieutenant Colonel Adolf Eichmann, who had visited Auschwitz several times to check on the progress of the murders. After the war, it seemed as if he had disappeared. Then these photos were secretly taken in Argentina in 1960 of a man calling himself Ricardo Clement. Ricardo Clement was none other than Adolf Eichmann. He soon became the target of an Israeli snatch squad, one of them, Moshe Tabor. I closed the bonnet and speaker jumped on it. At the side of the road was a ditch and they both rolled into it. I took hold of Eichmann's feet and speaker got hold of him and then Rafi came. We dragged him into the car and we stuffed up his mouth and then we prepared glasses for him so that he couldn't see anything. Now, after 15 years in hiding and one year after his sensational abduction from Argentina, Adolf Eichmann is indicted on 15 counts of crimes against the Jewish people and crimes against humanity. The three judges who will decide his fate enter. If it was up to me, I wouldn't have gone to all that trouble. I would have strangled him in the ditch and be done with it. After a trial lasting four months, Adolf Eichmann was sentenced to death. I wrote an official letter volunteering to be the executioner. Moshe Tavor's boss politely declined his offer, saying he'd done enough already. The trial and execution of Adolf Eichmann was certainly highly publicized, but it obscured a lesser known truth. A total of around 8,000 members of the SS had worked at Auschwitz at one time or another. An estimated 7,000 of them had survived the war. The question was, how many of them would be held to account? At a trial in Frankfurt starting in December 1963, 22 people were accused of crimes at Auschwitz. 17 were convicted, with six receiving the maximum penalty of life imprisonment. Prosecutors were tracing as many members of the SS who had connections with the camp as they could. Eventually they even traced Oskar Kroenig, but decided not to prosecute him. You were part of the largest killing factory in history. You were working there. You personally contributed to the killing of around one million people. Don't you think you should have stood trial? No, I don't think so. You imply with your question that just being a member of a large group of people who lived in a garrison where the destruction of the Jews took place is enough to make you a criminal. Oskar Kroning did much more than simply live in a garrison where the destruction of the Jews took place. Like every one of the SS at Auschwitz, he actively participated in the running of the camp. Oskar Gröning counted the foreign currency stolen from the Jews and transported it to Berlin. And he guarded the belongings of the Jews in the immediate aftermath of their arrival. But others did have a much more intimate connection with the killing process. And many of them were not even Nazis. Because a crematorium like this was normally operated by no more than four members of the SS and a hundred prisoners of the Sonderkommando. They were forced to do this. 
if they didn't do this, then they would be immediately taken to the gas chamber. So in order to have a, a, a chance for a little bit more life, they did the function. The solar commandos were not made up of volunteers. They were, they were themselves victims, and they were in turn uh, put into the gas chamber when their time was up. It was always the Nazis themselves who committed the actual act of murder, throwing the pellets of Zyklon B in through the hatches of the gas chambers. But the prisoners of the Zonda Commando were forced to do many of the other tasks needed to make this killing factory work, including removing and burning the bodies. This meant that after the war, the majority of the SS at Auschwitz could maintain that they themselves had never worked in the crematoria and gas chambers. Others who uh, operated, uh, who had tasks in the concentration camp system, uh, they kept the system going, that's true, but uh, probably their offenses were not sufficiently uh, uh, severe that uh, any nation wanted to prosecute them. Of the 7,000 members of the SS who worked at Auschwitz and who survived the war, fewer than 800 were ever put on trial. Nearly 90% of those involved were never prosecuted. The Ministry of Trade and Industry in Hanover the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Hanover appointed me an honorary judge. And for 12 years, alongside my regular job, I acted as an honorary judge in industrial tribunals. Isn't it unfair that those who suffered continue to have a hard time, whereas somebody like you, who was involved in the annihilation machinery, now has a good life? It's always like that in this world. Should I wear a hair shirt for the rest of my life and live off roots and charity, like in the Opera Tannhäuser, because I belonged to that organization? Unless you think that's an option, then all that's left is for each person to have the freedom to make the best of the situation he's in. For many former prisoners of Nazi death camps, life since the war has been rather more troubled. In places like Izbica in Poland, much of the property that was once lived in by Jews is still occupied by others. In the 1990s, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, one survivor of a Nazi death camp, Thomas Blatt, returned to visit the house he and his parents had lived in and had a surprising encounter with the man now living there. He let me in and I've seen a chair my art chair from a long time ago, so I said, oh, do I recommend this chair? My father used to sit on it. Oh, no, no, I bought it. So I took the chair, turned it over, uh, and there was our name on the other side. Anyway, uh, when he looked around, he said, Mr. Blood, why the whole comedy with the chair, with everything? I know why you are here. You, are, you have enough money here. You've passed the uh, uh, hide some money. I was so angry, and I look around, and I said, okay, nothing is touched, goodbye. He said, Mr. Mudd, wait a minute, you could uh, take it out and he will divide even the money. He's him 50% and 50% me. Uh, so I just left. A few years later, Thomas Blatt returned to his pizza, and this was the sight that greeted him. The house his family had lived in was now uninhabitable. So I went to the neighbors and asked the neighbor what's happened here. So she said, oh, Mr. Blood, when you left, we were unable to sleep because day and night he was looking for the treasure you're supposed to leave. He took the floor apart, the walls apart, everything. And later he find himself in a situation that he can fix it. Too much money. So he left it and take a look, it's a ruin. 
This ruined house symbolizes how long is the shadow cast by the Nazis' persecution and murder of the Jews. And how real still today is the prejudice of anti-Semitism. the reality of what took place here. And it was to confront them that Oskar Groning finally broke his silence about his own personal history. I see it as my task, now at my age, to face up to these things that I experienced and to oppose the Holocaust deniers who claim that Auschwitz never happened. And that's why I'm here today. Because I want to tell those deniers I have seen the crematoria. I have seen the burning pits. And I want you to believe me that these atrocities happened. I was there. One million three hundred thousand people were sent to Auschwitz during the four and a half years of its existence. One million one hundred thousand of them died here. Hundreds of Jehovah's Witnesses, homosexuals and other minorities were murdered. 15,000 Soviet prisoners of war. 21,000 gypsies. 70,000 Polish political prisoners. And one million Jews. At least 200,000 of them children. In this photograph, I recognize my aunt. Her name is Jolan Wolstein. And her four little children, Irving, eight years old. Dory, ten years old. Judith, six years old. And Noemi, the little baby, two years old. It's such an incredible, shattering feeling to recognize somebody you love, to see how they looked minutes before they entered the crematorium. Evidence of what the Nazis did lies all around here, waiting to be rediscovered by future generations. A reminder of what human beings are capable of creating. More on the legacy of the Holocaust, David Aronovich presents a discussion on the issues raised in the series with a panel of historians and experts, including the producer and writer of this programme, Lawrence Weiss. After Auschwitz, over on BBC Four, now. podcast on a series of questions, but I got so many questions on the same topic that I think I'm just going to do a single response here, and we'll do an Ask Me Anything podcast next time. The question I've now received in many forms goes something like this. Why is it that you never criticize Israel? Why is it that you never criticize Judaism? Why is it that you always take the side of the Israelis over that of the Palestinians? Now, this is an incredibly boring and depressing question for a variety of reasons. The first is that I have criticized Israel and Judaism. What seems to upset many people is I've kept some sense of proportion. There's something like 15 million Jews on earth at this moment. There are a hundred times as many Muslims. I've debated rabbis who, when I assume that they believe in a God who can hear our prayers, they stop me mid-sentence and say, why would you think I believe in a God who can hear prayers? So there are rabbis, conservative rabbis, 
who believe in a God so elastic as to exclude every concrete claim about him, and therefore nearly every concrete demand upon human behavior. And there are millions of Jews, literally millions among the few million who exist, for whom Judaism is very important, and yet they are atheists. They don't believe in God at all. This is actually a position you can hold within Judaism, but it's a total non sequitur in Islam or Christianity. So when we're talking about the consequences of irrational beliefs based on scripture, the Jews are the least of the least offenders. But I have said many critical things about Judaism. Let me remind you that parts of the Hebrew Bible, books like Leviticus and Exodus and Deuteronomy, are the most repellent, the most sickeningly unethical documents to be found in any religion. They're worse than the Quran. They're worse than any part of the New Testament. But the truth is most Jews recognize this and don't take these texts seriously. It's simply a fact that most Jews and most Israelis are not guided by scripture. And that's a very good thing. Of course, there are some who are. There are religious extremists among Jews. Now, I consider these people to be truly dangerous, and their religious beliefs are as divisive and as unwarranted as the beliefs of devout Muslims. But there are far fewer such people. For those of you who worry that I never say anything critical about Israel, my position on Israel is somewhat paradoxical. There are questions about which I'm genuinely undecided. And there's something in my position, I think, to offend everyone. So, acknowledging how reckless it is to say anything on this topic, I'm nevertheless going to think out loud about it for a few minutes. I don't think Israel should exist as a Jewish state. I think it is obscene, irrational, and unjustifiable to have a state organized around a religion. So I don't celebrate the idea that there's a Jewish homeland in the Middle East. And I certainly don't support any Jewish claims to real estate based on the Bible. Though I just said that I don't think Israel should exist as a Jewish state, the justification for such a state is rather easy to find. We need to look no further than the fact that the rest of the world has shown itself eager to murder the Jews at almost every opportunity. So if there were going to be a state organized around protecting the members of a single religion, it certainly should be a Jewish state. Now, friends of Israel might consider this a rather tepid defense, but it's the strongest one I've got. I think the idea of a religious state is ultimately untenable. Needless to say, defending its territory as a Jewish state, the Israeli government and Israelis themselves have had to do terrible things. They have, as they are now, fought wars against the Palestinians that have caused massive losses of innocent life. More civilians have been killed in Gaza in the last few weeks than militants. Now, that's not a surprise, given that Gaza is one of the most densely populated places on Earth. Occupying it, fighting wars in it, is guaranteed to get women and children and other non-combatants killed. And there's probably a little question over the course of fighting multiple wars that the Israelis have done things that amount to war crimes. They have been brutalized by this process, that is, made brutal by it. But that is largely due to the character of their enemies. Whatever terrible things the Israelis have done, it is also true to say that they have used more restraint in their fighting against the Palestinians than we, the Americans and the Europeans, have used in any of our wars. They have endured more worldwide public scrutiny than any society has ever had to while defending itself against aggressors. The Israelis simply are held to a different standard. And the condemnation leveled at them by the rest of the world is completely out of proportion to what they've actually done. It is clear that Israel is losing the PR war and has been for years now. One of the most galling things for outside observers about the current war in Gaza is the disproportionate loss of life on the Palestinian side. This doesn't make a lot of moral sense. Israel built bomb shelters to protect its citizens. The Palestinians built tunnels through which they could carry out terror attacks and kidnap Israelis. Should Israel be blamed for successfully protecting its population in a defensive war? I don't think so. But there is no way to look at the images coming out of Gaza, especially of infants and toddlers riddled by shrapnel, and think that this is anything other than a monstrous evil. Insofar as the Israelis are the agents of this evil, it seems impossible to support them. And there's no question that the Palestinians have suffered terribly for decades under the occupation. This is where most critics of Israel appear to be stuck. They see these images, and they blame Israel for killing and maiming babies. They see the occupation, and they blame Israel for making Gaza a prison camp. Now, I would argue that this is a kind of moral illusion, born of a failure to look at the actual causes of this conflict, as well as a failure to understand the intentions of the people on either side of it. 
The truth is, is that there is an obvious, undeniable, and hugely consequential moral difference between Israel and her enemies. The Israelis are surrounded by people who have explicitly genocidal intentions towards them. The Charter of Hamas is explicitly genocidal. It looks forward to a time based on Quranic prophecy when the earth itself will cry out for Jewish blood, where the trees and the stones will say, Oh Muslim, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. This is a political document. We are talking about a government that was voted into power by a majority of Palestinians. The discourse in the Muslim world about Jews is utterly shocking. Not only is there widespread Holocaust denial, there's Holocaust denial that then asserts, we will do it for real if given the chance. The only thing more obnoxious than denying the Holocaust is to say that it should have happened. It didn't happen, but if we get the chance, we will accomplish it. There are children's shows in the Palestinian territories and elsewhere that teach five-year-olds about the glories of martyrdom and about the necessity of killing Jews. And this gets to the heart of the moral difference between Israel and her enemies. And this is something I discussed in the end of faith. To see this moral difference, you have to ask what each side would do if they had the power to do it. What would the Jews do to the Palestinians if they could do anything they wanted? Well, we know the answer to that question, because they can do more or less anything they want. The Israeli army could kill everyone in Gaza tomorrow. So what does that mean? Well, it means that when they drop a bomb on a beach and kill four Palestinian children, as happened last week, this is almost certainly an accident. They're not targeting children. They can target as many children as they want. Every time a Palestinian child dies, Israel edges ever closer to becoming an international pariah. So the Israelis take great pains not to kill children and other non-combatants. Now, is it possible that some Israeli soldiers go berserk under pressure and wind up shooting into crowds of rock-throwing children? Of course, you will always find some soldiers acting this way in the middle of a war. But we know that this isn't the general intent of Israel. We know that Israelis do not want to kill non-combatants because they could kill as many as they want, and they're not doing it. What do we know of the Palestinians? What would the Palestinians do to the Jews in Israel if the power imbalance were reversed? Well, they have told us what they would do. For some reason, Israel's critics just don't want to believe the worst about a group like Hamas, even when it declares the worst of itself. We've already had a Holocaust and several other genocides in the 20th century. People are capable of committing genocide. When they tell us they intend to commit genocide, we should listen. There is every reason to believe that the Palestinians would kill all the Jews in Israel if they could. Would every Palestinian support genocide? Of course not. But vast numbers of them, and of Muslims throughout the world, would. Needless to say, Palestinians in general, and not just Hamas, have a history of targeting innocent non-combatants in the most shocking ways possible. They've blown themselves up on buses and in restaurants. They've massacred teenagers. They've murdered Olympic athletes. They now shoot rockets indiscriminately into civilian areas. And again, the charter of their government in Gaza explicitly tells us that they want to annihilate the Jews, not just in Israel, but everywhere. The truth is that everything you need to know about the moral imbalance between Israel and her enemies can be understood on the topic of human shields. Who uses human shields? Well, Hamas certainly does. They shoot their rockets from residential neighborhoods, from beside schools and hospitals and mosques. Muslims and other recent conflicts in Iraq and elsewhere have used human shields. They have laid their rifles on the shoulders of their own children and shot from behind their bodies. Consider the moral difference between using human shields and being deterred by them. That is the difference we're talking about. The Israelis and other Western powers are deterred, however imperfectly, by the Muslim use of human shields in these conflicts, as we should be. It is morally abhorrent to kill non-combatants if you can avoid it. It's certainly abhorrent to shoot through the bodies of children to get at your adversary. But take a moment to reflect on how contemptible this behavior is, and understand how cynical it is. The Muslims are acting on the assumption, the knowledge in fact, that the infidels with whom they fight, the very people whom their religion does nothing but vilify, will be deterred by their use of Muslim human shields. They consider the Jews to be the spawn of apes and pigs, and yet they rely on the fact that they don't want to kill Muslim non-combatants. 
Now imagine reversing the roles here. Imagine how fatuous, indeed how comical it would be, for the Israelis to attempt to use human shields to deter the Palestinians. Some claim that they have already done this. There are reports that Israeli soldiers have occasionally put Palestinian civilians in front of them as they've advanced into dangerous areas. That's not the use of human shields we're talking about. It's egregious behavior. No doubt it constitutes a war crime. But imagine the Israelis holding up their own women and children as human shields. Of course, that would be ridiculous. The Palestinians are trying to kill everyone. Killing women and children is part of the plan. Reversing the roles here produces a grotesque Monty Python skit. If you're going to talk about the conflict in the Middle East, you have to acknowledge this difference. I don't think there's any ethical disparity to be found anywhere that is more shocking or consequential than this. And the truth is, this isn't even the worst that jihadists do. Hamas is practically a moderate organization compared to other jihadist groups. There are Muslims who have blown themselves up in crowds of children, again, Muslim children, just to get at the American soldiers who are handing out candy to them. They have committed suicide bombings only to send another bomber to the hospital to await the casualties, where they then blow up all the injured, along with the doctors and the nurses trying to save their lives. Every day that you read about an Israeli rocket gone astray, or Israeli soldiers beating up an innocent teenager, you could have read about ISIS in Iraq crucifying people on the side of the road, Christians and Muslims. Where is the outrage in the Muslim world and on the left? over these crimes? Where are the demonstrations 10,000, 100,000 deep in the capitals of Europe against ISIS? If Israel kills a dozen Palestinians by accident, the entire Muslim world is inflamed. God forbid you burn a Quran or write a novel vaguely critical of the faith. And yet Muslims can destroy their own societies and seek to destroy the West, and you don't hear a peep. So it seems to me you really have to side with Israel here. You have one side which it really could accomplish its aims, would simply live peacefully with its neighbors, and you have another side which is seeking to implement a 7th century theocracy in the Holy Land. There's no peace to be found between these incompatible ideas. That doesn't mean you can't condemn specific actions on the part of the Israelis. And of course acknowledging the moral disparity between Israel and her enemies doesn't give us any solution to the problem of Israel's existence in the Middle East. Again, granted, there are some percentage of Jews who are animated by their own religious hysteria and their own prophecies. Some are awaiting the Messiah on contested land. Yes, these people are willing to sacrifice the blood of their own children for the glory of God. But for the most part, they are not representative of the current state of Judaism or of the actions of the Israeli government. And it is how Israel deals with these people, their own religious lunatics, that will determine whether they can truly hold the moral high ground. And Israel can do a lot more than it has to disempower them. It can cease to subsidize the delusions of the ultra-Orthodox, and it can stop building settlements on contested land. The incompatible religious attachments to this land has made it impossible for Muslims and Jews to negotiate like rational human beings, and has made it impossible for them to live in peace. But the onus is still more on the side of the Muslims here. Even on their worst day, the Israelis act with greater care and compassion and self-criticism than Muslim combatants have anywhere ever. And again, you have to ask yourself, what do these groups want? What would they accomplish if they could accomplish anything? What would the Israelis do if they could do what they want? They would live in peace with their neighbors, if they had neighbors who would live in peace with them. They would simply continue to build out their high-tech sector and thrive. What do groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and even Hamas want? They want to impose their religious views on the rest of humanity. They want to stifle every freedom that decent and educated and secular people care about. This is not a trivial difference. And yet, judging from the level of condemnation that Israel now receives, you would think the difference ran the other way. This kind of confusion puts us all in danger. This is the great story of our time. For the rest of our lives and the lives of our children, we're going to be confronted by people who don't want to live peacefully in a secular, pluralistic world because they are desperate to get to paradise. And they're willing to destroy the very possibility of human happiness along the way. The truth is, we are all living in Israel. It's just that some of us haven't realized it yet. Okay, here you can actually see some of the sketching process. 
I always work on a tone canvas with Rohenbach and Turpentine and I can start with the light areas and just build as you have seen in the video. Uh, uh, one of the things I love as you can see here is the brushwork and uh, how I build it. Basically it has a sculpture, uh, Rembrandtish way. If you study classical paintings you can see that I kind of try to do the same thing as they did. So I hope you got something out of this video. Uh, it was a long video. It's a flow with an outsuit thing. And um, as you know, I painted this Holocaust survivor in 2014. And uh, it was one of my great days on my work. So, if you want to support my channel, check out my Patreon and sign up for a dollar five, and I see you in the next video.